In November 1997, the Nists of Trenton, New Jersey, were preparing for their annual cruise, a tradition they had enjoyed since their wedding six years earlier. Julie, 29, and her husband Tim, 40, decided to change things up this year. Their main goal for their Christmas voyage was to strengthen their bond, so they left their one-year-old daughter Katie with grandparents and traveled to San Juan, Puerto Rico. On November 1st, as they boarded their cruise ship, George Skiadopoulos, a crew member, was struck by Julie's vibrant and attractive presence. A colleague teased him, saying he was out of his league. George bet he could romantically engage with Julie. George, a 22-year-old junior engineer fresh out of college, carried himself with enough poise to pique Julie's interest. He misrepresented himself as the captain, exaggerating his age to 28 and making up achievements to impress her. Julie and George quickly became close, meeting on deck every day and engaging in captivating conversations. Julie, enthralled by the cruise's romantic atmosphere and George's captivating stories, was unaware of his true identity. Tim, who was used to his wife's sociable nature, observed their interactions but felt no jealousy. One evening, during a lively party on the ship, George invited Julie on a tour of the ship. She initially hesitated, but eventually agreed. In the deserted engine room, a spark ignited between them, resulting in a kiss. However, their relationship did not go beyond kissing. Julie confided in a family friend, Tony, about her feelings during the cruise back home, expecting her attraction to fade because she and George would most likely never meet again. Unexpectedly, George, the captain, sent Julie a message, and their daily phone conversations began with George insinuating that Tim was unworthy of her. Tim occasionally overheard them conversing but trusted Julie enough not to investigate further. Julie, torn between her stable family life and the thrilling new emotions George elicited in her, became distant from friends and even cold to her daughter. Tim was concerned about the changes in her and hoped to rekindle their relationship. Tim organized a surprise 30th birthday party for Julie on January 3, 1998. It was a lavish event attended by numerous friends. Julie's request for another cruise on a specific ship and date was an attempt to reunite with Georgia. Tim reluctantly agreed, and they embarked on February 13th. On that voyage during a dark night, George won a bet with his crewmates. Julie's intimate encounter with George on the cruise had her head over heels. Back home, she excitedly confided in Tony, a close family friend and Katie's godfather. Tony struggled with the burden of keeping her secret, eventually admitting it to Julie, despite the risk of exposure. Julie decided to meet George in secret, for whom she had a strong desire. She made up a story about a family vacation and invited her mother and daughter along. Julie had to confess her secret affair to her mother, despite her disapproval, but she remained undeterred. Initially, they traveled to Florida, but on March 26, 1988, Julie left her mother and daughter behind to continue her romantic adventure with George in Puerto Rico. When Julie returned, her conversations with George became almost public. They talked constantly on the phone and sent risky love letters via email. Julie even recorded videos showcasing her life for George, all while living and spending money with her husband, Tim. She also resumed partying and drinking. Tim couldn't help but notice the changes in their family dynamics and suggested they consult a marriage counselor. Julie announced her desire for a divorce during their first session after seven years of marriage, which Tim opposed because their shared business interests were generating significant income. Julie knew she needed money for her plan to relocate to Greece with her daughter and begin a new life with her lover, who was scheduled to serve a mandatory 20-month military service there. Julie tried to help him flee and get a U.S. visa, but she didn't have enough money for her new boyfriend. Julie started a fitness regimen, but she had trouble sleeping and had to take strong sleeping pills. During her emotional turmoil, she began taking antidepressants. When George learned about this, he was furious and forbade her from using them. Julie lost about 10 kilos with the intention of returning to modeling to earn money, but George, unlike Tim, was extremely jealous and opposed the idea forcing Julie to abandon her plans. Almost everyone, including Cheryl, who once helped Julie break into the modeling industry, disapproved of her relationship with the Greek man. 
They had followed Julie and Tim's lives since they met at an exclusive yacht club party. In July 1989, Tim, her 11-year-old senior, was a successful businessman with his own company and a new yacht. He founded his landscape design firm in the early 1980s, which grew alongside the U.S. real estate market, boom. Initially, their relationship thrived, but Julie's jealousy became apparent when Tim waited for her at a bar with another woman. When Julie arrived, she assaulted Tim, leaving a bruise on his face and attacking the woman. It turned out she was Tim's longtime business partner's secretary. The conflict was resolved at that point. Tim was taken aback one day when he arrived at his office and found Julie sitting at his secretary's desk, smiling charmingly. She announced that the former employee would no longer be working there, effectively taking over her boyfriend's job and leaving him little choice but to accept her as his new assistant. This enabled her to work from home, giving her more financial flexibility. Julie had always wanted to be a model. One day, she saw a beauty contest advertisement in the newspaper and decided to enter, confident that she would win and supported by her loving partner, Tim. They compiled Julie's best photos and sent them to the magazine that organized the contest. However, the publishers used a scam to obtain free photos for their men's section at the back of the magazine. Julie eagerly awaited the publisher's response to the contest, but it never arrived. Determined, she went to the magazine office and confronted the editor about her prize. He accepted her photographs and promised to include them in the next issue. Julie told this story to everyone preparing for the competition. The event was held at an elite hotel and featured 12 finalists, including Julie. Despite her efforts, only one judge supported her. However, this experience helped her become friends with the magazine editor Cheryl, which led to Julie becoming the magazine's face and appearing on billboards throughout the city. Julie began receiving modeling offers as her fame grew, and she soon became a local celebrity. Until the autumn of 1990, she continued to work for Tim and won some smaller beauty contests, but struggled on the bigger stage. Julie and Tim, both 23 at the time, decided to marry on November 16, 1991. The couple lived an active life without any restrictions. Julie's modeling career was thriving by 1997, increasing her earnings. She began appearing on television, but soon began abusing alcohol. Their marriage had its ups and downs, but they were generally compatible and loving. Tim wanted children, and they were financially secure enough. Julie refused to put her modeling career at risk in order to provide for a child. Julie became pregnant in February 1995. Her friends claimed she continued to drink and smoke during her pregnancy. On November 26, 1996, the Nist family welcomed a daughter, Katie Scarlett. Becoming a mother had a profound impact on Julie. She embraced her new position. During this time, Katie's mother, Julia, actively assisted with her upbringing, though they frequently disagreed on parenting strategies. Julie quickly developed postpartum depression, which was caused in part by the significant changes in her figure that occurred after pregnancy. She retreated into herself, not attempting to revert to her previous state. Around this time, her relationship with Tim started to deteriorate. In April 1997, they sought family therapy. Julie believed the therapist sided with Tim, but the specialist genuinely attempted to address her issues and complexes, revealing positive aspects of her past. The therapist eventually stated that Tim was not paying enough attention to his wife, which was putting their marriage at risk. Julie, who was lonely, began spending more time with her friends and frequently returned home intoxicated. Tim decided to take Julie on a cruise during this difficult time, following the advice of the family therapist in the hopes of rekindling the warmth and passion in their relationship. However, his hopes were dashed as Julie's newfound passion for another man wreaked havoc on their family life and her own well-being as a result of her secret affair. Julie's mental condition worsened. Julie refused to let Tim into her room one day preventing him from accessing important business documents. The situation became so serious that he had to call the cops, and despite Julie's active resistance, Tim was able to get what he needed. Julie became paranoid, 
believing Tim had hired a private detective to follow her. The household atmosphere became tense, and it was clear that divorce was unavoidable. In midsummer, George and Julie met in the United States and secretly got engaged. Julie made no secret of her desire to relocate to Greece, which she planned to do the following year. Around this time, Tim discovered international phone bills ranging from $6,000 to $7,000 per month. He eventually realized his wife was having an affair with the cruise ship engineer and was communicating with him behind his back. Tim was furious and decided to divorce Julie, eager to cut all ties with her. Julie attempted to limit Tim's access to their daughter in response, hoping for full custody so that he could freely move to another country. But Tim refused as the couple attempted to resolve their differences. Julie's new lover, George, announced that he had quit his job and would be visiting her in New Jersey. Julie's constant arguments and conflicts with Tim caused her hair to fall out, but she blamed it on being separated from George. She was also envious of George's interactions with other women and required constant contact with him. When George arrived in New Jersey, their relationship descended into chaos. He was constantly inquiring about money and persuading her to spend more, forcing Julie to ask Tim for money further limiting her interaction with her daughter, which irritated Tim. George frequently lied about his financial situation, and it was surprising how unremarkable he appeared, making Julie's obsession with him even odder. Friends and family strongly advised Julie to end the relationship, unable to understand how she fell for a balding, unemployed, hopeless man with bad teeth who was also manipulative and extremely jealous. Regardless, Julie was smitten, she even intended to use her divorce settlement to cover George's hair transplant and dental work. When Tim learned about all of this, he was furious that Julie had involved their daughter in the situation. He threatened that if she attempted to flee, he would take Katie and Julie would never see her daughter again. This threat seemed to dampen Julie's enthusiasm. She even told her friends that her relationship with George was over, but it wasn't for long. Within a few weeks, she and George traveled to Greece to put their relationship to the test. They met his parents, and Julie thoroughly enjoyed the weekend, despite having to conceal her marital status, daughter's existence, and modeling career due to George's parents' religious beliefs. Julie dreamed of completing her divorce and starting a new life with George. On December 6th, she received the divorce decree and was ready to leave the house she shared with Tim. She abandoned KDA and checked it into a hotel where she consumed copious amounts of drugs. Julie traveled to Greece on December 8th to marry George A and begin a new life together. George quickly persuaded her to open a joint bank account, citing his limited knowledge of the Greek language. Julie, blinded by love, deposited $80,000 in the account, giving George an additional $188,000 in cash for additional expenses, all of her money. She then vanished, leaving no trace behind. On January 8th, George called Julie's friend to inform him that she had disappeared. He said they were supposed to meet outside McDonald's for a meal, but Julie never showed up, leaving him waiting for hours. With no cell phones, he was unable to contact her and reported her missing to the police shortly after. Julie called the same friend and told him about her feelings for Katie and issues with her fiance. The friend assumed Julie was going to leave George and return soon, but she never did and George's call raised serious concerns. He claimed Julie had vanished without her passport, allegedly left in her car, and was then apprehended by police. However, he couldn't find any witnesses to confirm that the police had taken the passport. It all sounded suspicious, so the friend turned to Tim, the only person who could help. Tim realized immediately that his ex-wife was in serious trouble. She had last contacted relatives in the United States, since January 7th, there had been no word from her, adding to the fears. The police began combing the neighborhood and interviewing potential witnesses, but Julie had no contacts in the new location, so they questioned her relatives in New Jersey and investigated her background. Julie Scully, the daughter of Julia and John Scully, was born on January 3rd, 1968. She developed a close relationship with her father, and was willing to do anything for his approval. Father and daughter spent a lot of time together, frequently going fishing, 
However, on November 10, 1969, Julie's younger brother, John Patrick Scully, was born, capturing all of the parental affection while leaving Julie feeling neglected. Julie's mother was from a Native American reservation in New Mexico, which is one of the country's largest tribes. Life was difficult there, with no electricity or running water, high unemployment, and widespread alcohol and drug abuse. Julie's parents sent her to a boarding school at the age of 12, hoping that an English education would help her live a better life. Julia moved to the city as an adult, attempting to fit in with mainstream American life while working at a psychiatric facility. She became involved in the drug trade. During this time, she encountered a police officer named John. Their romance blossomed quickly in 1964, and they married on July 2, 1965, two days before their anniversary. John later worked as a patrol officer in one of North Philadelphia's most dangerous neighborhoods. Julia became pregnant and gave birth to a daughter. John lovingly cared for his daughter, leaving Julia feeling isolated from family life. She kept her drug addiction a secret, but her erratic and unpredictable behavior was occasionally revealed. Her situation worsened as she experimented with more dangerous drugs, leaving her exhausted and unable to quit without experiencing severe withdrawal symptoms. Julia soon became pregnant again, and a younger son joined the family, which was already depleted. Julia Scully found it difficult to care for him. She overdosed on sleeping pills in 1973 while suffering from depression. John discovered her in time and called for medical assistance, saving her life. This incident exposed her problem within the family, complicating matters even further. She was once a beautiful Native American woman, but now she looked like a shadow of herself. She attempted suicide again, but was saved. The elder daughter, who was nine years old at the time, was acutely aware of the turmoil in her parents' relationship. On Julie's birthday, her father abruptly left, leaving behind his wife and the guests with whom he was having an affair in order to escape Julia's addiction, which repulsed him. He stayed solely for the benefit of their children. His mistress arrived to pick him up, and Julia and their daughter noticed them as they followed John outside. John's flagrant disregard for the privacy of his affair deeply harmed both his daughter and his wife. Julie blamed herself for her family's problems, unable to comprehend the full scope of the situation. Julie, who had always been an excellent student, began experiencing academic difficulties. She gained popularity among her peers and fell into a bad crowd. Her school attendance and performance declined. Her father saw this and decided to transfer her to a new school in Kensington. At 12, Julie's attractiveness drew a lot of attention from boys. The Scully family lived in a troubled neighborhood, which raised her parents' concerns about her future and the possibility of her succumbing to substance abuse like her mother. Julie's friends were supposed to sleep over one evening, but she disappeared from her room along with them. When her mother discovered their absence, she became panicked and called the police, who located the children in downtown Philadelphia. Julie's relationship with her mother deteriorated, resulting in frequent conflicts and scandals. Despite their close relationship as police officers, her rebellious spirit manifested itself towards her father as well. He always knew where and with whom his daughter was spending her time. Seeing his wife's failure to raise their children, he took custody of them and sent Julia to rehab for drug addiction. Despite Yuli's efforts to please her father, the family environment calmed down during her absence. Her rebellious spirit grew as she matured, and she continued to spend time with her friends, resulting in missed classes and poor grades. Her father, enraged upon learning this, was shocked, especially since Julie was only 14. The close and warm relationship they once had appeared to have vanished. Julie expressed a desire to drop out of school, possibly as a cry for attention, which she had begun seeking on the streets. Her beauty made her the center of attention at every gathering. Julie earned her high school diploma in 1982. Her parents wanted her to get a specialized education, so her father, a police officer, helped her get into an engineering college. He asked the college director for special admission conditions, citing Julie's Native American heritage. His efforts paid off, and Julie was accepted to college. 
She was already living a sexual lifestyle in the fall of 1983. Despite their similar upbringings, Julie's brother took a different path in her 18th year. He enlisted in the Navy at the age of 16. Julie made the decision to leave college around the same time in order to achieve financial independence. She soon met Neil Ziegler, six years her senior. Their relationship grew quickly, and they secretly married. Julie's father, who was initially unaware of her marriage, eventually supported it, believing it was better for her than staying with her dependent mother. Nonetheless, the marriage ended in divorce. Julie returned to live with her mother in 1988, having found a new job but reluctant to contribute to living expenses. Her striking appearance drew attention everywhere and many mistook her for a model. Julie gradually began to use her beauty to connect with wealthy men. Despite her outward confidence, she was vulnerable and desperately sought love, but only found fleeting relationships. During one such social gathering, she met her future husband, Tim Nist. Julie's mother went to therapy for years after moving out and eventually overcame her addiction. When Julie and Tim had a daughter, the grandmother eagerly took on childcare responsibilities, staying involved even when Julie fled to Greece with a new lover. After Julie's disappearance was revealed, her mother described George as truly pitiful. He was unattractive and unpleasant to look at, and he appeared to have no control over his actions. The missing woman's mother described how she fell victim to George's aggression during an argument with Julie. George shouted and insulted the woman before grabbing her by the throat and pinning her against a wall, refusing to let her go until he heard threats of police involvement. Julie attempted to end their relationship and called the police following the attack, which resulted in George's expulsion from the country. Despite this, she soon joined him in Greece. She actively defended her lover, even accepting blame for the assault. Julie's mother suspected George was involved in her daughter's disappearance. Following Julie's disappearance, George continued to participate actively in the search. Julie's close relatives attempted to contact the American embassy in Athens, but were unable to do so due to a language barrier, as the Greek police stations handling the investigation did not have English-speaking staff. The FBI from the United States joined the investigation. At this point, it was revealed that George had been carrying Julie's passport the entire time. He initially claimed to have found it, but after learning of the FBI's involvement, he changed his story to one of theft. His behavior became more suspicious. He attempted to withdraw funds from their joint account, but was unable to do so. On January 23, 1999, the couple was supposed to marry. During this time, news of the missing American woman was broadcast on television and radio. George angrily called Julie's friend, who had approached the media about the case. He claimed innocence and even made a public statement in the press, actively giving interviews in an attempt to defend himself. However, 16 days after Julie's disappearance, George was brought in for questioning as the primary suspect. George explained that after moving to Greece, Julie quickly became disillusioned with both the country and him. She grew to miss her homeland and daughter and wanted to return. George tried to help her, but the situation deteriorated, leaving him deeply concerned in her final days. She cried constantly, and George's mother eventually learned about Julie's former husband and daughter in America. She began to despise Julie and openly expressed her dislike for George, urging him to abandon the woman with a troubled past. The lovers' conflicts became more frequent and severe, prompting their eviction from a hotel. Julie wanted to call her family, but her lover prevented her from doing so, and even physically abused her. The police discovered that George's mother had schizophrenia and was frequently hospitalized as a result of her condition. George inherited some of these issues. He had high self-esteem and was always arrogant. His ability to manipulate others was noticed by the missing woman's family and friends. At the slightest disagreement, he aggressively attacked his partner. Aside from Julie's mother, who had been victimized by his violence, Julie herself suffered serious hand injuries but claimed they were accidental and continued to live with her tyrant. After four hours of questioning by the police, 
George was unable to maintain the story he had told the media and admitted to killing his lover. He claimed that it was an accident. Apparently, the lover deeply regretted what had occurred. He even cried during the interrogation. However, his confessions were perplexing and riddled with contradictions. Initially, on January 8, 1999, the couple embarked on their long-awaited trip to Athens. They were driving down a deserted two-lane highway, enjoying the peace and quiet. A calm conversation turned into a serious conflict. Finally, George decided to pull over on a stretch of road with no one else around. In a fit of rage, he jumped out of the car and attacked his loved one, choking her as tightly as he could. He wanted her to remain silent and stop screaming. George told the police that he seemed to be watching everything from the outside and had lost control of himself. He couldn't stop himself until Julie stopped breathing. The lover claimed that the horrific moments lasted only a few seconds, but investigators were aware that strangulation takes at least three minutes. George was shocked afterwards. He devised the plan of burning his beloved's body, scattering her ashes in the sea from a cliff, and jumping after her to reunite with her. George explained that he attempted suicide by shooting himself with a pneumatic gun, jumping under a truck, and taking an overdose of medication. However, all of his attempts were unsuccessful. However, he was now at the police station for questioning, implying that all of his thoughts were a fantasy. In reality, he treated his beloved's body differently. Following the murder, George simply threw it in his car's trunk and drove to the nearest gas station. He bought gas and returned to the crime scene. George dragged the body away from the road near two small lakes, doused it with gasoline, and set it on fire. But the rain prevented the body from completely burning. At one point, he considered throwing it into the lake, but instead stuffed the charred corpse back into the trunk and drove to his grandmother's house. He found a large travel bag and decided to pack Julie's body in it, but it had stiffened and he couldn't bend it anymore. Furthermore, the head would not fit in the bag so George decided to simply cut it off. He described how he took her head by the hair and lifted it to his face. He remembered seeing terror in her eyes, but she was still beautiful, so he kissed her on the lips before packing the body into the bag. Then he burned the bag and threw it in a swamp, leaving the head behind. Later, George drove to Kavala and threw Julie Scully's head into the sea. Nineteen days after Julie disappeared, her ex-lover and would-be husband assisted detectives in locating the murder site and the remains. Tim and the victim's family were informed by police that George had admitted to the crime. The victim's ex-husband traveled to Greece to bring Julie's body back home. <laughs> Meanwhile, the criminal revealed what he had done to the woman in a live broadcast. When the murderer's mother found out about his crime, she had a stroke, and his grandmother was shocked. The Greek authorities described it as one of the most horrific murders they had witnessed at the time. Tim's father stated that the lover should have died alongside his beloved. Despite this, numerous articles have emerged blaming the victim for what occurred. The victim's family believed her lover had initially used Julie for money. When he learned about her wealthy husband, he persuaded her to divorce and win a large settlement in court, which she was supposed to put into his business. However, prior to her death, Julie realized his true intentions and refused to fund his projects, resulting in her becoming a victim. The trial for George Skiadopoulos began on November 27, 1999. In the Greek justice system, trials are conducted concurrently by three judges rather than a jury, which significantly speeds up the process. Furthermore, there were no defense witnesses present during the hearings. George made horrific confessions that lasted approximately five hours. His lawyers attempted to argue insanity, claiming that the criminal's mother suffered from schizophrenia and that he may have inherited mental illnesses. Meanwhile, the accused requested the death penalty, despite the fact that capital punishment was prohibited in Greece. On December 6th, the court unanimously sentenced George Skiadopoulos to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for all charges. However, the Greek legal system was not flawless. In 2002, George filed an appeal, claiming he was insane at the time of the murder. As a result, his sentence was reduced to 23 years with the option for further appeal. 
By 2007, the criminal had been released and was living with his new family in Kavala, United States. Julie's ex-husband, Tim Nist, became a source of strength for all of her family and friends. Despite her betrayal, he proved to be a dignified man by accepting responsibility and organizing Julie's funeral. Following the funeral, Tim received a diary of memories about his ex-wife written by Julie's friends for their daughter, Katie. The entries attempted to portray her life in a positive and kind light. When her daughter grows up, she should know that her mother adored her and was a wonderful woman. Love is a complex emotion that can be both beautiful and constructive, but it can also cloud judgment and lead to dangerous behavior. In most cases, people can recognize the reality and protect themselves. Unfortunately, Julie's circumstances differed. Her story serves as a reminder that everyone's safety and well-being should always be a top priority, even when it comes to love. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Add to the channel for more. Add to the channel for more. Add to the channel for more. Fateful morning. Wake up, is anyone alive in this house? Judy cheerfully entered her sister Linda Slayton's house. The morning of September 4th was normal, but something felt off. Judy paid frequent visits to her nephews, and today was no exception. A cup of hot coffee and a friendly conversation with her sister usually started their day. Where are you, little slackers? Judy smiled, peering into her nephew's room where they were sleeping and rubbing their eyes. She was surprised to see Linda still sleeping as she usually awoke before the boys left for school. When Judy left the house, she noticed that the window in her sister's room was wide open and one of the curtains was missing. It was strange. Why aren't you in school yet? Is your mom sick? Why is she still sleeping? Judy asked as she walked restlessly toward her sister's bedroom. Linda Slayton, I wanna see you. Judy knocked on the door, but no one answered. The next moment she saw something that made her heart sink. Her sister's body lay on the bed with her head hanging to the floor. The young woman was half undressed with a wire hanger wrapped around her neck. There was no sign of a struggle in the room and the closet was open. Otherwise, everything seemed normal. Linda's belongings were lying in their proper places. Judy screamed when she saw her sister's body and the janitor working outside called the police. The police arrived and asked the children to leave the house, which had now been declared a crime scene. Jeff managed to walk past his mother's room without looking at her body. Tim, on the other hand, looked into the room and discovered his mother had died. The boys were relocated to their grandparents' home for the duration of the investigation. That fateful morning marked the beginning of a mysterious and dark story that would alter their lives forever. Linda Slayton was born on a spring day, March 8, 1950. The girl wished for a large and happy family, but her fate did not go as planned. Linda was 19 years old when she married Frank Slayton. She was already a mother at that age. The couple welcomed their first son, Jeffrey, three years before the wedding, and a younger son, Timothy, a year later. Linda was only able to persuade Frank, their children's father, to join them after another year. Unfortunately, this marriage did not live up to her expectations. Linda frequently considered divorce, but fear and addiction kept her from taking that step. However, in 1974, after nine long years of marriage, she gathered the last vestiges of strength and determination, leaving behind the hell that was their family. Linda took her sons and left Frank Slatton. It was the first step towards a new life, and Linda hoped to provide her sons with the security and happiness they had been denied for so long. She was unaware of the trials that lay ahead, including the fateful day for her family. Linda and her two children moved to 303 North Brunel Parkway in Lakeland, Florida, after their divorce, which was one of Polk County's most populous cities in 1981. It was a thriving business district with new residential developments popping up around every corner. These were primarily duplexes where large families settled. Lakeland's abundance of lawns and greenery was very appealing to residents. The Slatton family owned one of the many duplex homes. 
Despite this, they did not remain in it for long. Linda and her sons moved to Florida from Hartzella, Alabama, two weeks before the horrific crime. What could have caused such a horrific tragedy? Perhaps Linda brought not only her children, but also dark memories from her past. Linda Slatton started a new life as a single mother following her divorce. She tried her hardest to provide for her children while juggling work and home responsibilities. Linda didn't have a car, so her sons walked to school or were driven by neighbors. Despite the difficulties, Linda never gave up and tried to provide her children with everything they required. In attitude to school activities, the boys participated in the soccer section, but without a car, it was not always easy to get there. So Coach Joe came to their rescue. He regularly drove the brothers from their home to the stadium and back. Linda was actively preparing for her mother's move one week before the tragic events occurred on September 4th. She was confident that a woman living with them would be able to assist Linda with daily household chores while also creating a comfortable and family-friendly environment. On the evening of September 3rd, Jeff returned home from his workout. He had an empty stomach and there was no food in the house, so he decided to go to his grandmother's house. When he returned around 9.30 p.m., his brother and mother were not home. The boy turned on the television to distract himself, but his anxious thoughts persisted. The argument he had with his mother the day before did not make him feel better. He tried to forget about it, but when he returned home and didn't see his relatives, he felt a strange longing. Usually, at this time, their house was filled with excitement. Linda's mother was cooking dinner in the kitchen, and the aroma of delicious food filled the house. Her younger brother, Tim, was merrily hanging around, occasionally running up to Jeff, hoping for a conversation. But, sensing his brother's displeasure, he ran back to his mother. These moments occurred several times before everyone gathered around the table for dinner around 11.30 p.m. The noise and laughter of family members in the hallway interrupted Jeff's thoughts. His heart began to beat more calmly. His mother and brother returned home, and Jeff resumed watching the movie that was about to end at dinner. Linda planned to spend the evening with her neighbors and play cards, but first she decided to do some housework. When his younger brother Tim went to bed, Jeff stayed to help his mother wash the dishes. He decided to stop by her room and apologize for their earlier fight. Jeff recalls saying, I love you, Mom. I'll see you tomorrow. If only he had known that those were the last words he could say to his mother. September 4, 1981, was a tragic day in the lives of two brothers, Tim, 12, and Jeff, 15. On that terrible day, they discovered their mother, Linda Slotten, dead in bed. Linda was only 31 when this happened. Who could have committed such heinous cruelty to the mother of two defenseless children? Was Linda the victim of a random attack, or did they know who it was? After Jeff and Tim left for their grandmother's house, Lakeland Police Department Sergeant Edgar Pickett arrived on the scene. He was the first detective to begin looking into this terrible tragedy, as soon. As he arrived, police officers, reporters, and ambulances rushed to the house, which was cordoned off. Yellow tape reading, crime scene, no trespassing, was wrapped around the house. Sergeant Pickett was the first to discover the key piece of evidence in the case. He discovered a palm print on a window with no curtain that did not belong to Linda, who had been murdered. This footprint could have been an important DNA sample, but at the time, DNA testing was not widely available to determine the exact cause of Linda's death. Her body was taken for an autopsy, which revealed bruises on her shoulders, arms, and neck. The fact that she was half-naked suggested a possible rape. After a thorough autopsy, it was discovered that Linda had been severely beaten, abused, and strangled with a hanger from her closet. This horrific scenario sparked the investigation, but there were still many unanswered questions about Linda Slatton's murder. The police decided to investigate the Slatton family's genealogical tree. The first suspect was Linda's ex-husband, Frank Slatton. According to available information, he was a violent and aggressive man who frequently abused his wife and children and showed no concern for the family. Frank was immediately suspected by the police, as would be expected. He was detained for questioning, but it was quickly revealed that he was in Alabama on the night of the murder. 
Nonetheless, the police did not dismiss him as a suspect. The second suspect was Linda's oldest son, Jeff. The day before the murder, he and his mother had a heated argument. According to witnesses, Linda and her son's relationship had recently become strained. Jeff, the family's eldest child, had been through it all, first with an abusive father and then with his mother, who was raising his brothers on her own. Their frequent disagreements were in plain view, but Jeff always tried to mend fences and make peace with his mother, just as he did the night before Linda's death. The police administered two polygraph tests to Jeff, both of which yielded negative results, eliminating him from the suspect list. Linda's boyfriend, whose name has not been released, came in third place on the suspect list. This white man was Linda's close friend and frequently socialized with her children. However, polygraph testing revealed nothing suspicious, forcing the police to clear him. Following Linda's funeral, the family gradually began to put their lives back together. The boys returned to school, attempting to forget about the horrific incident at 303 North Brunel Parkway. Tim continued to attend soccer practice, and he always felt supported by his teammates and coaches. Coach Joe kept his promise and continued to give Tim rides home after practice. A month after the tragedy, Tim hung a photo of the team and coach over his bed. The case of Linda's murder remained unsolved as weeks turned into months and then years. The Slatten brothers had to accept the harsh reality of their new life. Their mother had been murdered, leaving only their grandparents, Clarence and Margaret Harris, to support them during this difficult time. It had been 17 years since Linda Slayton's horrific murder. The years passed, and the boys who had lost their mother had grown into mature men who loved and cared for their own families. Both brothers started families, with Jeff having two children. However, he never forgot about last night. I didn't hear anything at all. Even the neighbors claimed they didn't hear anything suspicious that night. It weighs heavily on me. He frequently repeated in conversation with his loved ones, sometimes sitting in front of the television waiting for dinner while his wife fussed in the kitchen and his children ran around him. Jeff would catch a glimpse into the past. At such times, he was transported back to his childhood home and the last evening with his mother, recalling the unsettling feelings that had gripped him. That last evening appeared to foreshadow a horror that would alter his life forever. Jeff was brought back to reality every time he heard the voices of his children and wife during a rescue. Despite their successful lives, the brothers had never abandoned the investigation and worked tirelessly to keep the case alive. They returned to Lakeland on a regular basis to check on the status of their mother's case. Tim said in a telephone interview, no matter how many investigators are replaced, we always remind them that we are waiting to find whoever killed our mom. The burden is on us, and I can't let it go. In 2001, detectives discovered a new lead that could lead to the resolution of this long-standing mystery. Police arrested Jimmy Ulmer, a man with similar demeanor to Linda's murderer in the same neighborhood. He was charged with the attempted murder of a young girl, who he attempted to pull through her room's window. The police began investigating his connections and alibis and discovered that he had already been sentenced to 80 years in prison for other crimes. For the cops, he was the primary suspect. However, a minor issue arose. Jimmy had died by then, and DNA testing was no longer possible. However, Jimmy's mother agreed to give a sample of her DNA. Unfortunately, the results did not match the sample discovered at Linda's murder scene and the investigation was again left unanswered. Edgar Pickett, the investigator looking into Linda Slayton's murder, resigned in 1998 and was replaced by Brad Grace, a new detective. Grace discovered an unidentified DNA sample collected at the crime scene. In 1981, he decided to send the sample to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, the state's largest laboratory, in the hopes of identifying Linda's killer through DNA analysis. By 1999, the department had the resources to conduct such tests, so Detective Grace jumped into action. He went over the list of suspects and decided to take DNA samples from each of them. In 2001, he was confident that he could identify the perpetrator using his DNA. He first contacted the Slayton brothers, 
asking them to provide DNA samples for comparison with those found at the crime scene. The results of the analysis completely eliminated the brothers as suspects. Detective Grace then contacted Linda's former husband, Frank Slayton. Frank had re-evaluated his life after Linda's death and was now leading a fulfilling life. Frank voluntarily submitted his DNA samples again, but no matches were discovered. Grace sent DNA samples from the unknown perpetrator to the FBI in 2005, where they were tested against data in the federal database. These comparisons were made on a regular basis, but proved inconclusive. Detective Grace retired 17 years after Linda Slayton's murder and was succeeded by detectives Tammy Hathcock and Russell Hurley. After three more years of research, Tammy Hathcock discovered a new DNA recognition technology developed by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. She submitted a DNA sample from the crime scene to expert Cecil Moore. Cecil Moore used a genealogical database and other documents to create a family tree that led to the person suspected of killing Linda Slayton. This was a watershed moment in the investigation, as well as one that shocked the Slayton brothers. One of the photographs in Tim's bedroom showed the killer's face. That man turned out to be Joseph Clinton Mills, better known as Coach Joe. Police began investigating Mills' background and discovered that he had been charged with grand larceny and forging a will, but had not been convicted. His fingerprints and palm prints were stored in police databases. To prove Joseph Mills' guilt, police had to compare his DNA to that discovered at the scene of Linda Slatton's murder. Detectives decided to obtain a DNA sample from Mills without his knowledge. The accuracy of this information is unknown, but this is the version included in the case. Police emptied a dumpster at Mills' house and discovered a Band-Aid with blood on it. Detectives were currently looking into the suspect's background. Joseph Mills had spent the majority of his life in Ketman, a town located just 30 minutes from the crime scene. He had a family, including children and grandchildren. Two weeks later, the lab's response came back. The DNA from Linda Slayton's murder scene matched Joseph Mills' DNA, which became a critical piece of evidence in the case, and Joseph Mills was arrested and charged with Linda Slayton's murder in December 2019. Joseph Mills was arrested and taken to the police station for questioning. He was only 20 years old when Linda Slayton was murdered. Detectives interviewed Mills over the phone in 1981, but he was not named a suspect in the murder. After years of investigation, Mills could no longer deny his involvement in the crime. His testimony stated that on the night of the murder, he went to Linda's house with her permission for sexual relations, but detectives questioned his version. They suspected Mills had been watching Linda for some time because he frequently drove her children to practice. According to the investigator's account, after the coach returned the boy home from practice, he waited until the house was empty before sneaking into Linda's room through a window and hiding in a closet. He waited until Linda was alone in the room before coming out of hiding, beating and abusing her, and strangling her with a wire hanger from her closet. At trial, Joseph Mills was convicted of first degree, murder and rape. The investigation and trial provided long-awaited justice for this heinous crime that had gone unsolved for years. The murdered woman's sons were still stunned and unable to comprehend why Joseph had murdered their mother. The court hearing was tense. Linda Slayton's children, Tim and Jeff, sat on a spectator bench and defended their mother's memory. Joseph Clinton Mills, also known as Coach Joe, was the center of attention. This man, who was once regarded as a role model, sat in an accusatory cage. His expression was cold and indifferent, as if nothing had occurred. Tim Slayton, the oldest of the brothers, looked at the man he had once admired and saw the face of evil. Tim's eyes burned with indignation and he jumped to his feet, turning to Joseph. Why? I just want to understand why, Joe. Why did you kill our mom? Why did you take her away from us? We were so happy. Mills only mumbled back, I'm a good man. He never apologized or expressed regret to the Slayton family. Probably even the killer struggled to explain his actions. Tim was taken aback because he had looked up to Coach Joe as a role model when he was younger. Now he's left with only questions and painful memories. Joseph Mills was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. 
as if a heavy stone had fallen from the Slayton brothers' shoulders. Their mother was finally avenged, and while the brothers console themselves with the thought that the killer will spend the rest of his life in prison, they are still enraged that Joseph Mills was free for nearly 40 years while they lost their mother. Linda Slayton's story, her tragic death, and years of investigation have left an indelible impression on her sons Tim and Jeff Slayton, two brothers who not only witnessed the tragedy, but also became first-hand participants in the investigation, sharing their thoughts and feelings. He kept asking us how the case was going, recalls Tim, the older brother. He didn't ask specific questions. He just wanted to know if there was any news on the case, if there was any new evidence, and I just told him that nothing had changed. Tim is still shocked that his mother's killer was a man he considered a friend and respected. The picture of him standing behind Joseph Mills has always reminded him that life goes on, even without his mother. Jeff, the younger brother, is constantly thinking about how his life would have turned out if his mother had been alive. This tragedy has created an unbearable void in his heart that nothing can fill. Despite the hardships and suffering, the Slotten brothers strive to live a fulfilling life for their mother, Linda Slotten. They visit her grave on a regular basis, placing fresh flowers and praying that she knows they will never forget her and will continue to fight for justice. Linda Slayton's story is one of bravery, incredible endurance, and the fact that even after the most heinous losses, the love and memory of loved ones live on in the hearts of those who remain. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Tension rose in the Mendoza criminal courts on December 1, 2020, as people waited for the verdict. On the dark side of the room, a 32-year-old woman, in a black dress with white beads around her neck, sat expressionless, her eyes burning with equanimity and restraint. She prepared to hear the verdict that would seal her fate and leave an imprint on history. Despite the fact that everyone in the room had known this woman for many years, they were now faced with a difficult mystery to solve. Outside the courtroom doors, the judge's approaching footsteps could be heard echoing in the silence and felt in every corner of the room like a heartbeat. It was clear that what was at stake today was not only the woman in the dark's fate, but also the long-hidden truth. A whole story lay behind this woman, with events as enigmatic as she was. The details of this true crime remained hidden, and the trial proved to be a significant challenge for all parties involved. Namato, a small town nestled in the mountains and valleys of Argentina's Mendoza province was a place where nature revealed its most beautiful colors. In the autumn, the streets were lined with golden leaves, and the mountain peaks were painted orange and red. Mamata residents knew each other well, sharing their joys and sorrows, offering support in difficult times, and celebrating significant occasions together. Orlando Angel Aquino and Karen Leyland Oviedo began a romance in this remote location surrounded by mountains and valleys, which would shape Manado and Argentina as a whole. As the streets of the city were surrounded by the colors of autumn gold, they became frozen in anticipation of something long awaited. The fates of the two young people in this story intersected. Rolando Angel Aquino, a man with a magnetic personality who can captivate others, couldn't help but notice Karen Leyland Oviedo's exciting days. She was a woman with fire in her eyes a love of life, and an energy that immediately captivated one's heart. The young couple had similar interests and dreams, and their determination and entrepreneurial spirit motivated them both. This meeting was an accident that provided them with the opportunity for true happiness. In 2016, they began living together and opened their own business, a warehouse in their home. Karen had a keen eye for detail, and she lovingly crafted a sign for customer service on one of the windows, as well as lists of items for sale. This little corner became something they could be proud of, and the people of Manado looked on with interest and respect. Everyone wanted to know who these young people were and how they had accomplished so much. Many people knew Karen since childhood, but Rolando remained a mystery. No one knew anything about his background except that he was from Bolivia. Rolando not only ran the business with Karen, but he also worked at the Greenland Fair where wholesale fruit sales were conducted. Looking at this couple, it appeared that they had found their own personal paradise on Earth. However, 
Even the strongest and most sincere relationships can be tested, and Rolanda was taken aback when he discovered Karen in the car with another man. His reaction was a flash of rage. At that point, he nearly destroyed the car's interior. The picture of happiness fell apart in a matter of minutes. However, Rolando agreed to give them another chance, choosing to forgive and move forward with his beloved. Others saw them as an ideal couple, capable of overcoming any difficulties together. Rolando Angel Aquino is an enigmatic figure from Bolivia, born in 1987. His exact arrival date in Argentina, as with many other aspects of his life, is unknown. As the eldest of seven children, Rolando learned at a young age the importance of family bonds and hard work in creating an ideal family filled with joy and laughter. In his youth, he met Carolina Chavez, with whom he had a son. Despite the difficulties, the couple maintained good relations. Later in life, he met a soldier named Soledad, who gave him another son, Elias, but their relationship did not work out. Nonetheless, Rolando remained a devoted father who cared for his children and maintained positive relationships with their mothers. Rolando was physically fit from a young age, maintaining his health through sports and participation on the local soccer team. Colleagues and loved ones described him as a kind and hardworking individual. Rolando got along well with his neighbors, but when it came to socializing, he was always shy. Karen was born on March 30, 1990, and grew up in Minato. She grew up in the same house where she and Rolando eventually established their warehouse. She was well known in the community as an outgoing and open-minded woman. Karen, like Rolando, envisioned a happy and successful family with a caring and loving man. It took her some time to find the right partner. Karen had already attempted to create a happy relationship before meeting Rolando, which resulted in the birth of two beautiful daughters. Karen married one of her former partners, Raul or Jada, in 2013, after one of them became a father. However, as time passed, that marriage was on the verge of dissolution, with financial difficulties contributing to the conflict. Raul decided to abandon his family in search of new opportunities, fleeing the city and traveling abroad to avoid any attempts to find him. In the summer of 2019, nine-year-old Elias arrived at Rolando and Karen's house with a lot of ideas for the near future. However, on the morning of July 12, 2019, when Rolando arrived to greet his son before leaving for work, he noticed that the boy was not feeling well. Elias's condition quickly deteriorated, and despite medical staff's best efforts, he died shortly after being admitted to the hospital. His death was attributed to severe poisoning, leaving his parents completely baffled. Karen was devastated by the death of her stepson, Elias, and she cared for Rolando during his mourning. Rolando's pain gradually subsided thanks to Karen's warmth and support. Rolando decided to take a big step forward and proposed to Karen 16 months after Elias died. They married, and Rolando was confident that she would always be by his side. However, their happiness was fleeting. Karen returned home on February 6, 2022, from a beauty salon visit and a gym workout, only to discover Rolando was suffering from serious health issues. The following day, February 7, she discovered an ambulance outside their home, and Rolando, 35, was in critical condition. Despite medical efforts, he died on February 9 from severe poisoning. His sudden death raised suspicions, especially since he was a healthy, active man who participated in sports on a regular basis. Karen had been administering medication to Rolando in order to remove dark spots from his skin. Rolando's system contained a significant excess of calcium oxalate crystals, which is a sign of ethylene glycol poisoning, the primary component of car antifreeze. Authorities prioritized the investigation into Rolando's strange and unexpected death. Neighbors reported that Karen had repeatedly given her husband an unknown medication and expressed concern about Rolando's son. During Karen's interrogation, officers from the Technology Crimes Unit conducted forensic examinations and thoroughly questioned her, uncovering numerous contradictions. Karen claimed that the medication was for a skin blemish and that she had administered it via IV, but she was unable to provide the vial of the solution, which she claimed the housekeeper had discarded. Further interviews with Claudia Cortez, the housekeeper contradicted Karen's claims. Claudia reported overhearing the couple discussing Rolando's dissatisfaction with the medication he was receiving. Karen was detained during the investigation, and her cell phone was confiscated. 
Rolando's family, friends, and teammates were shocked by his death. And rumors of deliberate poisoning began to circulate. Karen's phone's search history contained information about deadly poisons and how to clear search history, as well as records of her ordering ethylene glycol online. This heightened suspicion, and the prosecutor's office charged Karen with intentionally poisoning Rolando with a poisonous substance diluted with orange juice. Rwanda's health deteriorated significantly after consuming this beverage, and he died as a result. A series of strange and tragic events in the Aquino family prompted the authorities to take drastic measures. Karen was charged with aggravated murder in mid-February, after sufficient evidence was presented. Meanwhile, suspicions arose about the cause of nine-year-old Elias's death, prompting a new investigation. The prosecutor's office decided to conduct a thorough investigation of the boy's medical history. The mother claimed that Elias was perfectly healthy and active before falling into a coma at his father's house and never waking up. The boy's death certificate stated that the cause was a malfunction of his internal system and cerebral thrombosis. However, investigators remain skeptical that Elias, at the age of nine, could have died from such causes, particularly given his overall health. The prosecutor's office requested information on possible ethylene glycol purchases and received confirmation that Karen bought the poison on July 2, 2019, shortly before the boy arrived at the Aquino home. Elias's relatives confirmed that Karen insisted on cremating his body. However, the birth mother rejected the idea and chose to bury her son. On March 4, prosecutor Claudia Rios filed new aggravated murder charges against Karen for the poisoning of Elias based on the evidence gathered. On March 14, a judge ordered pretrial detention for the woman who attempted to appeal, but the judge denied it, ruling that she should remain in custody until the trial began. That trial began 10 months later and was a critical step toward resolving this complex and dark story. The long-awaited trial began in Mendoza's criminal court, capturing public and media attention. Karen Leyland Oviedo's nationwide trial began on November 28, 2022. 2022. Two indictments were pending. The first, led by prosecutor Fernando Gusto, concerned the murder of Elias, and the second, involving Claudia Rio, dealt with the murder of Rwanda. When the trial began, Rolando, the eldest son, Javier Aquino, who was only 15 years old, appeared as a plaintiff, accompanied by counsel. Prosecutor Gusto claimed that Karen killed Elias and then his father by administering ethylene glycol mixed with orange juice. This resulted in severe poisoning and the deaths of both son and father. Karen's defense team attempted to refute the charges against her. They argued that Rwanda was violent and abusive to their client and that there was no credible evidence to back up the claim. The defense also claimed that Karen had no motive for the murder. Why would she kill a lion? Obviously, little Elias couldn't resist the threat. Karen's attorney stated that the house, cars, and business belonged solely to her. He also claimed that her client did not make any purchases using her phone. And why would she have looked up poison information on the internet if she had already poisoned a liar with ethylene glycol, as the prosecutor claims? The lawyer emphasized that, while the actions that resulted in the father and son's deaths were heinous, it does not give the right to indict a person until they have been fully proven guilty. The defense attempted to cast doubt on the jury by claiming that the charges against Karen were false. Karen claimed that her partner could have made the antifreeze purchase by hacking into her account. She also claimed to have an alibi for when her husband was poisoned. Karen was not at home on February 6 when he began experiencing health issues. The defendant, known to the media as the Dwayne Allen Poisoner, was given the opportunity to speak after the first phase of the trial concluded. Judge Diego Liberty gave her the opportunity to speak, and Karen argued passionately that she was being accused of a heinous crime she did not commit. It was extremely painful for her to realize this, especially as the mother of two young daughters. The court hearing continued, and it was the turn of the witnesses to reveal new details about the case. The prosecution decided to ask Karen several questions with Prosecutor Gusto focusing on key points. Karen later suggested that her son Rolando be cremated. Karen emphatically responded to this question, stating that she had never made such a suggestion and that the decision was not up to her. The prosecution called relatives of the deceased to testify and reveal more details about what had happened. Elias's mother, Soledad, told the court that after her son died, 
Rolando relayed Corinne's words to her, in which she suggested that Elias's body be cremated so that both families could keep the boy's ashes. However, Soledad rejected the idea. She also shared her memories of meeting Rolando at the cemetery and learning about Karen's jealousy. According to her, Karen even slept in a separate bed, and Rolando and Karen's relationship was so tainted that they slept apart. Carolina, the mother of Rolando's first child, also testified. She confirmed that, according to her ex-husband, the couple slept separately, but Carolina had no contact with Karen prior to the incident. However, Karen called her on February 8 to inform her that Rolando was ill and in the hospital. Karen informed Carolina that her husband had probably taken medication and was feeling ill. She also asked Carolina for assistance in unlocking her husband's cell phone, claiming she suspected he was seeing another woman. Carolina was taken aback when she learned of Rolando's condition because they had only seen each other a few days before and he appeared to be in excellent health. She revealed that when she arrived at the hospital, Karen was already there, having gone to see the doctors. Carolina was not allowed inside, so she was left waiting. Later, as she was leaving the hospital, Karen informed her that no one else was present and everyone had left. Carolina became suspicious and demanded an explanation from the doctors, who informed her that the patient had lost consciousness and was not responding to treatment. Carolina then approached the hospital secretary and complained. After speaking with Karen, Carolina discovered that Rolando had taken medication for skin blemishes, which caused an allergic reaction. He claimed that the medication bottle was no longer there because the housekeeper threw it away. All of these details contributed to the mystery surrounding this complex case. The trial continued, and doctors and experts appeared before the jury to present forensic evidence and the results of the psychological examination. This evidence revealed previously unknown details. Dr. Ivana Marinelli, a pediatrician at the hospital, described how she cared for Elias in July 2019 when he was admitted. She described how Elias was brought to the medical facility with severe breathing problems and urgently needed intubation. He also had a CT scan, which revealed a deep cerebral thrombosis. Elias underwent intensive care. The doctor confirmed that Elias's symptoms were consistent with ethylene glycol poisoning. This included impaired consciousness, restlessness, and a subsequent coma with a blood clotting disorder. Despite the best efforts of medical personnel, the boy's condition deteriorated and after 5 p.m. On July 12, cardiac and respiratory arrest occurred. Doctors attempted to resuscitate Elias for 50 minutes with the participation. His father's efforts were futile. He was pronounced dead at 60 meters. The jury was also given the results of Karen's psychological examination, which had been requested by the prosecution. The expert's findings emphasized Karen's lies and concealment of the truth. She was portrayed as someone trying to project a decent image. But in reality, her conclusions were cold and cruel. The experts also stated that a psychological examination was performed immediately following her husband's death, but revealed no emotional effects from her spouse's death. This cast doubt on Karen's sincerity and portrayed her as a cold-blooded, self-centered woman. The examiners discovered latent hostility and impulsive behavioral reactions. Karen was finally prosecuted, and Gusto expressed doubt that she was a victim of gender-based violence, as she claimed in her testimony. This information described the defendant's true psychological profile. The long weeks of tense waiting and continuous court hearings came to an end. The trial drew a large crowd into the courtroom, their gazes fixed tensely on the jury and the judge, waiting for the decision that would bring justice to this complex and tragic story. In moving for a judgment of conviction against Karen, the prosecutor assured the jury that all of the evidence gathered strongly indicated that she was the one who planned and carried out both murders. She purchased ethylene glycol and discarded the packaging, claiming it was regular juice. Karen watched her loved ones die without offering assistance in their time of need. Cloudy Maria, the prosecutor handling Karen's case for Lundo's murder, presented the court with an ethylene glycol purchase receipt paid from Karen's bank account. The prosecution and plaintiff insisted on a unanimous verdict because it was the only way to ensure justice in the case. They insisted that Karen Leyland Oviedo be convicted of murder with evidence of extreme cruelty. The defense, on the other hand, claimed that there was insufficient evidence to establish her client's guilt. The defense attorney argued that a person can be good or bad, 
but it is not always related to committing a crime, and that the deaths of Rolando and his son were a tragic and sad event for their clients. Despite the defense's arguments, Karen Leyland Oviedo has added herself to the list of Argentine criminals who poisoned their victims. After a long, intense wait for the verdict, the jury made their decision. They issued a unanimous decision. Karen Leyland Oviedo was convicted of killing a liar and committing the crime with extreme cruelty. She was also convicted of Orlando's aggravated death through an insidious procedure. Karen, dressed in black and wearing white beads around her neck, listened to the verdict calmly. The jury returned a guilty verdict and she was sentenced to life in prison. Karen Leyland Oviedo, the woman in the dark, attempted to avoid punishment for the heinous murders that shocked society and left many unanswered questions. The plans to cremate the victims' bodies may have been her final attempt to avoid the punishment she deserved. Despite her efforts, the court and jury did not give in and returned the justice verdict. So why did Karen Leyland Oviedo kill her loved ones? That remains a mystery. She had all she needed to be happy. Perhaps the motivation lies deep within her own soul. Karen refused to admit her guilt out of jealousy, self-interest, and pride, so the motives for this heinous crime are unknown. Karen Leyland Oviedo will now spend years behind bars, wondering what dark forces ruined her and those around her. This story reminds us that even the most intimate relationships can conceal terrible secrets and mysteries, and that true love and loyalty must always come first. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Sierra's case. She died after crossing the ocean. Ten years ago, the high-profile case of Sarai Sierra, an American girl photographer, shook the world and brought the intelligence services of two countries on different continents to their feet. The U.S. citizen vanished without a trace during her photo tour in Istanbul, as if out of thin air. As if out of thin air. This story received extensive media coverage, and the situation and circumstances were so unusual that it sparked numerous rumors and conspiracy theories. Despite active, large-scale, and timely searches, the girl could not be found alive. Her body was discovered in the city's historic center, near Sarabernus walls. But how did it happen that on a bright day in a popular tourist destination, someone's life was taken so casually and no one noticed? To understand this case, it is necessary to reconstruct the entire chain of events that led to the tragedy. And now we'll try it together. Sarai Sierra, Early Years Sarai Sierra was born in New York on November 9, 1979, and is the second child in a large family. She grew up alongside her older brother, David, and younger sister, Christina. Their parents, Dennis and Bethany Sim Jimenez, were of Puerto Rican descent, but moved to the United States in 1973, settling in Manhattan, where their children were born. Shortly after moving, the couple joined the local Protestant community and converted to evangelical Christianity. They raised their children strictly according to the religious canons of their adopted faith. The family attended church on a regular basis, socialized with other members of the community, and sent their children to Sunday school. Sarai grew up to be an active, creative individual who stood out for her strong-willed but complex personality. Sarai was regarded as a rebel and a hooligan in contrast to her younger sister, Christina, who was quiet, obedient, and very modest. At the same time, she respected her parents and acknowledged their undisputed authority in the Jimenez home. There were strict rules that all members of the family followed. This applied to its inhabitants' daily routines, many everyday moments, and behavioral norms. For example, the daughters were not allowed to socialize with boys, go on dates, or leave the house after 9, 0 p.m., all of their friendly interactions were monitored, and parents always knew where and with whom their children were. Sarai's entire life revolved around home, school, and church, and her social circle consisted solely of people from those places. The active, energetic, socially-oriented girl was bored and cramped within the confines of her environment, but her parents were confident that they were doing the right thing for their children. Sarai intended to attend a pedagogical university and work as a teacher in the arts or culture during her school years. However, as she neared the end of her studies, she became interested in psychology and began to consider how her future profession could be related to this field. During one of the religious community's meetings, 
A slender, dark-haired beauty caught the eye of a young man named Steven Sierra. He was the first to approach her and made an excuse to speak with her. Sarai was only 18 at the time, and her new acquaintance was seven years older than her. Despite their age differences, the young people began dating with their parents' approval. Dennis and Bethany were immediately impressed by Stephen, believing that he was a decent, polite, and honest young man who would make an excellent match for their daughter. Sarai was most likely not deeply in love with the guy, but she agreed to marry him primarily to get out of her parents' house and gain some freedom from such tight control. It should be noted that Sarai had a good relationship with her parents. She desired the freedom to live her own life and plan her own future. Less than a year after meeting in February 1999, the couple married. The bride was 19 years old at the time, while the groom was 26. The couple soon moved to Michigan, where Stephen's parents lived. Sarai saw this move as a significant event because she had spent almost her entire conscious life in New York. The change of scenery benefited her and she appeared to be revitalized in her new surroundings. Sarai enjoyed shopping for her new home, making it cozy, meeting new people, and exploring new places. She started working as a receptionist at a local dental office and thought about going to college. Sarai, on the other hand, became pregnant quickly and gave birth to two children, one boy and one girl. Entry into university had to be postponed because the young woman was completely absorbed and enjoyed motherhood. A few years later, the Sierra family, which included two children, decided to relocate again, this time to sunny California, settling in the picturesque neighborhood of Silver Lake in Los Angeles. Stephen was offered a job here, but the couple quickly realized that the money he was earning was insufficient to cover their expenses. So, after consulting, they decided to return to New York and live in a modest rented apartment close to the Jimenez family's home. At the time, the couple was having serious financial problems. Sarai remained at home with the children, and her husband had to rely on sporadic income, which caused them to accumulate debt. The situation improved when the children started school, and the young mother got a job at an advertising agency. Stephen had also found a steady job as a bus driver on one of the city routes. Sarai reconsidered her long-held plans to pursue higher education around the age of 30. After their children had grown and their lives had stabilized, Sarai had lost interest in the pedagogical faculty by that point, and she enrolled in one of the local universities to study psychology. However, Sarai quickly became disinterested in her studies, finding the long hours of lectures tedious. She decided to look into other fields and find an occupation that she truly enjoyed, one that allowed her to express her creativity. Sarai had always been a creative person with a talent for drawing and an eye for beauty, so she became interested in photography and soon joined a well-known New York photography community to hone her skills in this area. She was recognized for her talent, demonstrating the ability to capture the right angles and create harmonious compositions, resulting in breathtakingly beautiful photographs. Even professionals lauded her work for its originality and vision. Sarai created a profile on one of the popular social networks in early 2012, as advised by her colleagues, and began sharing her work Success quickly followed, with thousands of other users subscribing to her profile and enthusiastically commenting on each of her works. She quickly rose to prominence, and her subscriber base grew at an exponential rate. Her newfound fame overwhelmed her. Sarai believed she could achieve more and wanted to continue growing and improving in this field. So she proposed organizing a group photo tour to explore beautiful and unusual locations around the world. Sarai Sierra began with small trips within her home country, specializing in photographing architectural ensembles and historical sites. Her photographs were widely acclaimed, so she decided to broaden her horizons. Sarai wanted to go to Istanbul, one of the world's most ancient and beautiful cities, to photograph its landmarks and historical sites. It should be noted that her parents were not thrilled with the idea, as she had never left the country before, let alone been away from home for so long. But Sarai was determined to go. She also planned to bring her best friend, Magdalena, along for the trip. Sarai's family was in crisis, and her marriage was failing. Perhaps part of her motivation for planning a photo tour on the other side of the world was a desire to get away, change her surroundings, and reflect on what was going on in her family from afar. Sarai had been living within strict boundaries for far too long, and she yearned for more. She wanted to follow her heart's desire. 
During that time, her husband's social media account began to contain unusual posts and statuses. He philosophized on the importance of marriage, love, and mutual respect between husband and wife. He also hinted that he would stay faithful even if their marriage was shaky. Stephen cryptically suggested in one of the posts that his spouse had been unfaithful, but he deleted the post a few hours later, leaving concerned followers with unanswered questions. Stephen seemed unhappy and unloved, and he expressed this on his social media page. Sarai was going through similar turmoil, but she kept her emotions to herself, trying not to complain and focusing on her creative pursuits. The long-awaited trip. Sarai learned shortly before the planned tour that her best friend would be unable to accompany her due to work obligations. The young woman was disappointed, but she did not change her plans because she had anticipated it for too long. Sarai's family was worried about her flying alone to a foreign country across the ocean, but she assured them that everything would be fine and promised to call, write, and send photos every day. Sarai also planned to visit Germany and Austria, where she already had several commercial photography assignments scheduled. Her entire trip was literally planned by the hour, and she was not going to deviate from it. On January 7, 2013, a young American woman took a flight from New York to Istanbul. She was carrying a small amount of cash, a smartphone, a tablet, a low-cost solar camera, and several lenses designed for professional photography. Sarai called her family to let them know she had arrived safely and was on her way to check into the hotel she had reserved ahead of time. It should be noted that she had a limited budget, so she had to stay in a remote location that the locals deemed unsafe. Sarai Sierra went straight to the nearest metro station to reach the historic city center after leaving her belongings in the room and changing her clothes on the road. She wandered Istanbul's streets until nightfall, photographing its beauty and savoring each shot. During the evenings, she would call her parents and husband via video call to share her impressions and plans for the following day. She would also process new shots and share them on her social media accounts. Sarai was accompanied in Istanbul by a young man named Talin, who would later become her new friend. They met through social media in the middle of 2012, and Talin persuaded the American to fly to Turkey. For a few months, they communicated frequently and grew close during this time. Sarai placed complete trust in her new acquaintance. They saw each other almost every day and visited a variety of attractions. The guy was an Istanbul native who knew the city like the back of his hand and arranged for Sarai to go on exciting excursions to the most interesting and sometimes unusual places. After a week in Turkey, the photographer planned a trip to a couple of European countries, where she, as previously stated, arranged several commercial photo shoots. Sarai saved money on hotel accommodations by agreeing to be hosted by her long-term subscribers. These moments had been pre-negotiated and agreed upon. So, at Vienna's airport, she was greeted by a young man in whose home she spent a few days. Sarai was a few years younger than her Austrian acquaintance. He enjoyed photography and admired her work, so he was eager to communicate with such a talented photographer. The trip went according to plan. Sarai went to all of the places she had planned and met everyone she had scheduled to meet. On the third day, she flew to Berlin where she was met at the airport by her subscribers who took her on a tour of the city. After finishing her business in Germany, the photographer returned to Istanbul where she planned to spend two more days before returning home. Talin greeted her upon arrival, and they spent the day driving around the city before heading to a popular local bar together. After midnight, the Turk escorted Sarai to her hotel, where they said their goodbyes, a strange disappearance in a foreign country. Sarai called her parents and husband on the last day of her photo tour, January 21, 2013, to inform them of the time and flight she would be taking to New York. She had never been away from home for so long, so everyone was relieved when her trip came to an end. Sarai, on the other hand, decided to take one final walk around the city and capture some more stunning photos for her account before leaving. Sarai's father arrived at the airport on time to pick up his daughter because her husband was working and couldn't make it. He arrived early to avoid getting stuck in traffic and being late. They announced the arrival of the plane. All of the passengers disembarked except Sarai. Her phone was also unavailable, and all attempts to contact her were unsuccessful. Dennis waited a little longer before approaching airline representatives, concerned about his daughter's absence. However, Dennis was shocked to learn that a passenger with such a name had not boarded the aircraft. 
Dennis immediately called Stephen and informed him of what had occurred, emphasizing the importance of organizing a search right away. Sarai's husband first contacted the hotel where his wife was staying in Istanbul, but was told that her belongings were still in the room and that she had not checked out despite the fact that she should have done so yesterday and did not return to the hotel for the second day. This information caused a real panic among the family members because they didn't know where Sarai was or how to proceed. Stephen, who had access to his wife's accounts, decided to check them for any clues. He discovered his wife's correspondence with Talon, which seemed very suspicious to him. Nonetheless, he decided to contact the Turk directly to find out what he knew, but Talon claimed to have seen the missing woman the day before the planned departure and flight. She did not call him, despite her promise. Sarai's family immediately reported the incident to the American embassy in Turkey, and a day later, a large-scale search operation was organized on the spot, with a special unit even established. Sarai's husband and parents flew to Istanbul almost immediately, deciding that they needed to be personally involved in the search. After all, it hadn't been long since her disappearance, and there was a good chance she'd still be alive. Investigating police officers, the first step was to determine the American social circle and speak with those who saw her shortly before she disappeared to testify, which included employees of the hotel where she stayed and her friend Talon. The hotel manager stated that he last saw Miss Sarai the night before her departure. She was leaving with a small bag and a camera in her hand. She was supposed to check out later, but she never showed up. And the next morning they received a call from her concerned husband who informed them that Sarai's belongings and documents remained at the hotel. The receptionist also described Sarai's outfit that day. The situation with Talon was far more interesting and ambiguous. First, the guy's real name was Tarkan, and it was unclear why he introduced himself to his new acquaintance under an assumed name. Second, they had been in close contact for several months prior to their meeting, and Sarai had traveled to Istanbul at his invitation. All of this suggested that they had a romantic relationship, but Tarkin categorically denied it, claiming that they were just friends. The next step in the investigation was to recreate Sarai's route as accurately as possible. Her cell phone data and street CTV footage were examined for this purpose. It was discovered that the young woman took the subway to the Sultan Ahmet district, visited the promontory between the Bosporus Bosphorus Strait and the Golden Horn Bay, and visited Eminonu Market but became lost in a large crowd of tourists. The trail was then retraced to the subway, where she was about to descend to the Saraburnu walls, but she quickly vanished from the camera's view. A frightening discovery, the searchers decided to go to the Saraburnu wall ruins to comb the area and conduct interviews. Perhaps someone remembered seeing a lone woman holding a camera. After several hours, the search was deemed successful, if you can call it that. A young woman's lifeless body was discovered near the ruins of the ancient Constantinople walls. It was covered with an old dirty blanket making it less noticeable. Investigators assumed Sierra had been brought here in this blanket. Forensics believed the body had been there for 10 to 12 days before it was discovered. There were no clothes on the lower half of the body, which immediately prompted a version of violence that was later confirmed by specialists. Sierra died as a result of a blow to the head with a blunt, heavy object but she also had several hematomas and a couple of broken ribs, according to the autopsy. Tathologists discovered particles of epithelium and blood under Sarai's fingernails, indicating that she defended herself and scratched the perpetrator. The crime appeared strange and even ridiculous because the victim's bag, smartphone, and camera were stolen. However, she was wearing gold earrings, a wedding ring, and an expensive watch, which immediately caught my attention. On camera footage from the area, all that could be seen was a young woman who appeared to be Sarai filming something on her phone, followed by a man who approached her and either hit or pushed her, and either hit or pushed her before they both vanished from view. The attacker was not immediately identified. Versions and conspiracy theories. Almost immediately, the information was leaked to the media, nearly causing an international scandal. The main point is that people have been asked to help in the search for the missing American woman and to report any information they may have. However, the investigation remained silent, and when the body was discovered, the situation became even more complicated. Many people wondered why a young married woman flew across the ocean alone. What was she doing in Istanbul in Europe? And how did she pay for her trip? It all looked suspicious. Investigators initially believed Sarai had gone to see her lover, Talon, a K. Tarkan, 
and then flew to another man in Austria. However, neither of her friends admitted to having an intimate relationship with the victim. Later, it was discovered that the man who sheltered Sarai in Vienna had a criminal record, leading to speculation that he might use the American as a drug courier, but a thorough investigation found no evidence to support this theory. There were also rumors that Sarai could work for us intelligence services and collect information in other countries, which explains the money for intercontinental flights. This version appeared untenable, so it was not seriously considered. Turkish Special Services and the FBI worked together to investigate this high-profile case, but they initially found no serious leads. Only a few weeks later, the police discovered the alleged perpetrator, a previously convicted and unemployed man named Tal Salih, collecting waste paper on city streets. But it was impossible to communicate with him because, almost immediately after the crime, he borrowed money from relatives and fled the country, most likely to Haiti province, where he illegally crossed the border into Syria. After obtaining a warrant, police searched the suspect's home, extracting a sample of his DNA and comparing it to skin particles and seminal fluid found on the murdered woman. That cleared up any remaining doubts. Tal Sali was the perpetrator of the crime. Furthermore, the victim's phone was last turned on in the neighborhood where he lived. When it was discovered that the criminal had fled to Syria, the special services had given up hope of locating him. But fate soon surprised them. This man was detained while attempting to cross the border illegally again, this time to return to Turkey. He joined the rebels in Syria and obtained firearms, but after being injured in the conflict, he decided it was safer to stay at home. However, he returned with his weapon, which was the initial reason for his arrest, but the local police quickly recognized who was in their hands and immediately reported him to security services. When Tal Salih was brought in for questioning, his story was literally depressing, with graphic details. He saw a young woman on a hiking trail along Sari Bernu's walls and spent a few minutes admiring her and watching her take pictures. Sarai tried to ask him something with gestures as he approached, but the language barrier prevented him from understanding what she wanted. However, he noticed a brand new iPhone in her hands and a high-end and a high-end camera around her neck. As Sarai walked on, he followed her, determined to rob her. It was getting dark outside, and there were no other people near the wall that I could see. Sarai turned around and, it appeared to him, took a photograph of him. That action served as a trigger for Tail Sali, who grabbed a boulder and lunged at Sarai, striking her hard in the head. After that, they literally rolled together down to the ruins of the wall, resulting in bruises and broken ribs on Sarai's body. Tal Sali then decided to commit intimate-related violence while the victim was unconscious. The perpetrator then delivered another severe blow to Sarai's head to finish her off. Tal Salai took the victim's bag, camera, and phone before walking away. On his way, he came across the same blanket that had been discarded and decided to use it to cover the victim's body again. It was finally dark outside, and there was a chance of meeting someone at the wall. Normal. When the perpetrator returned, he dragged the body to the side, making sure it was not visible from the hiking path. He then covered it with a blanket and departed. Surprisingly, while the search for the American woman was ongoing, the perpetrator returned to the crime scene to ensure Sarai was dead, and her body was where he had left it. When Tal Salih heard that his victim had been found, he realized that the police would soon be on his trail, so he fled the country, borrowing money from his sister, who always felt sorry for him. By the way, he was never able to realize the stolen goods. The camera was broken in the process of falling, and the smartphone had a password that the criminal unsuccessfully attempted to unlock while at home, resulting in the signal and all of the other stolen items he threw away when he fled. The defendant did not deny his guilt, and according to his accounts, he had no regrets about what he had done, nor did he experience pangs of conscience, which was key evidence. DNA forensic evidence was presented, confirming that his skin was found under the murdered woman's fingernails as well as his seminal fluid on her body. In addition, Sarai's cell phone was last turned on near his home. In addition, the case file now includes a video surveillance camera recording of the attack. After all of the evidence was presented, it was determined that a psychiatric examination was required due to the belief that Tal Sale was insane. This idea was supported by his actions, behavior, and the calmness with which he described the atrocities he had committed 
but experts concluded that he was seen and fully aware of his actions when he attacked his victim in the summer of 2014. The judge eventually delivered the final verdict. Tal Sali was found guilty of all charges against him and sentenced to life imprisonment. Sarai's relatives thought this was a fair decision. After all of the necessary expert examinations, the body of the murdered American woman was transported to her homeland in New York, with a Turkish airline covering all associated costs. Sarai was buried in accordance with all religious rituals and traditions. The deceased's family members created an internet site dedicated to her memory, where they published previously unpublished works. The photographs were a huge success, with people from all over the world eager to purchase them. The proceeds from the sale of pictures were saved by the family for Orphan Children's College Education. Sarai, Stephen categorically denied that there was a crisis in his and his wife's family life that prompted the young woman to embark on that fateful journey. Stephen quickly became close to a girl from the Christian community who helped him through a difficult time and frequently visited his home to assist him with his children and household chores. Two weeks before his wife's first funeral anniversary, Stephen walked down the aisle with his new chosen one. When the perpetrator was finally sentenced, Stephen was already married and about to become a father again. Sarai Sierra's story inspired a number of television programs, talk shows, and detective documentaries. It has also served as the foundation for several feature projects. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Family members and loved ones come together to celebrate the holidays together. Uh, certainly this happens. It's, it's very tragic. The Christmas. To be the Christmas. Christmas. From the decorations on each storefront along its historic Main Street to its endless list of holiday events and programs. There's over 1,500 activities from the start November 22nd all the way to January 10th. The city of Grapevine takes Christmas to a whole new level. To be the Christmas capital of Texas, you can't buy it out of a catalog and have the same thing the next city has or the next state or county. Every December 25th, individuals from all corners of the globe come together to celebrate the Christmas. Anticipation fills the air as people eagerly await the sumptuous feasts, the exchange of heartfelt gifts, and the delightful tradition of watching Christmas movies. In the midst of this festive season, Lee's Grapevina, Texas, a charming suburban town spanning 16 square miles and boasting a population of approximately 50,000 residents, it's an understatement to say that the residents of Grapevine hold a deep affection for Christmas. Their devotion to the holiday even earned the town the prestigious title of Christmas Capital of Texas. The Christmas Day of 2011 in Grapevine unfolded as a tranquil and peaceful day. Families gathered, sharing cherished moments, and all appeared to be in its usual state of harmony. However, at precisely 11.34 a.m., an unexpected turn of events would disrupt this idyllic serenity. Grapevine 911, where is your emergency? Hello, Grapevine 911. You need help? Are you sick? What was that? Do you need an ambulance or police? Hello? One moment. I'm just getting heavy breathing on the phone and I need to stop me, so please hang on. The caller was breathing heavily, and it was unclear what they were saying or what the situation was. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Approximately 20 seconds elapsed in eerie silence after the caller's mysterious heavy breathing, and then the line abruptly went dead. The caller remained unresponsive. Originating from a local apartment's landline, 
This puzzling incident prompted an immediate dispatch of both police and firefighters, tasked with unraveling the enigma that unfolded on that unsettling Christmas morning. In a mere three minutes, the police arrived at the two-story unit nestled within the Lincoln Vineyard Apartments, situated in the 2500 block on Hall Johnson Road. The apartment from which the call had emanated occupied a position towards the rear of the complex, affording a view of Colleyville Heritage High School's sprawling fields. Given that many residents had departed to enjoy the holiday with their loved ones, numerous apartments stood vacant. Upon reaching the apartment in question, the front door revealed itself to be securely locked from the inside. A series of knocks reverberated through the hushed corridor, yet the only response was an eerie silence, devoid of any signs of life. Law enforcement officers, fueled by growing apprehension, peered through the windows, and what they encountered was a macabre tableau. Within the living room, seven lifeless bodies lay strewn about, some on the sofa and others on the floor. Their demises bore the grim signature of gunshot wounds with telltale defensive injuries, suggesting they had desperately sought refuge from the relentless bullets. It appeared that these unfortunate souls had just concluded the act of unwrapping their Christmas gifts when the horrifying massacre unfolded. Adding to the macabre scene, both of the adult males clutched firearms in their right hands. Strangely, no neighbors reported hearing the unmistakable sound of gunshots, though it was understandable given the sparse occupancy of the apartments at that time. As the police meticulously combed through the complex and embarked on crime scene examinations, a particular detail emerged as striking. An SUV was conspicuously parked outside the apartment. Subsequent checks revealed that the vehicle was registered to a man residing two miles away in the suburban enclave of Colleyville. The gravity of the situation spread rapidly throughout the community, but before any information could be released, the victims needed to be officially identified and their next of kin notified. The authorities believed they knew the victims' identities, but sought unequivocal confirmation, a process that would take longer than desired due to the unavailability of the state driver's license fingerprint database on that fateful Christmas day. It's the uh, probably the worst investigation that we've had to you know investigate in uh, you know many years. Uh, this is something that's very tragic, and uh, you know regardless of what day of the year it happens on, it, it's it's something that's very uh, unfortunate. But uh, it's certainly amplified uh, given the fact that it is Christmas today. Uh, I've been with this police department for 12 years, and uh, this is probably the most tragic thing that we've you know I've certainly been involved with. Uh, and I think, you know, I can speak safely for the rest of the police department. I don't think any uh, members of the police department has encountered something like this on Christmas Day. Grapevine police say someone inside the family's apartment called 911 around 1130 Sunday morning, but the line stayed silent. Officers soon arrived and broke down the door. It appears that the victims are all in one central location, living area, kitchen area. The four women and three men, ranging from their late teens to early 60s, had been shot with a pistol. The bodies were removed from the house and taken away for autopsies to be carried out. After this, the names of the victims were eventually released, revealing that they were all part of the same family. Sergeant Robert Eberling, in a press briefing, divulged crucial details of the investigation. It was revealed that two firearms had been involved in this tragic event. A Glock 23, a 40 caliber pistol equipped with a 10 round clip, and a Smith & Wesson 9-15 model, a 9mm pistol featuring a 15 round magazine. The latter weapon was registered to the owner of the SUV found parked outside the scene and had been acquired back in 1996 further deepening the intrigue surrounding this devastating incident. Uh, it's still early in this investigation, obviously, though this did play out some almost 24 hours ago. No, there is no known motive, at least as one that police are telling us about. There is also no outward sign of the horrible tragedy that unplayed right through this sliding glass and door uh, frame here of this apartment complex. Here is what we do know at this point. No one heard any of the gunshots that were fired inside of this home. Someone from inside of the home called 911 around 1130 yesterday morning, but that 
That person did not speak into the phone. An operator then sent police, Grapevine, Texas police, here to this scene to go and investigate, and they found the scene that we've been talking about. Their bodies were found in what was otherwise the evidence of a normal Christmas morning. There were Christmas presents that had been unwrapped, and there was paper strewn about the room, but obviously, no doubt, a very right. sad situation in this town on Christmas morning, which calls itself the Christmas capital of Texas. As far as what neighbors are saying, I mean, I can show you a bit here, Richard. This is a uh, sort of tight-knit, uh, very packed-together apartment complex. Mm. We have spoken to several neighbors who are waking up this day after Christmas morning. They're all asking us what happened. They're speaking about a tragedy, something like this. Uh, they would not otherwise expect. On the other side of this apartment complex, there is a brown fence, and beyond that is a high school here, Colleyville Heritage High School, which is noted to be one of the best high schools in the entire North Texas mm. region. People move here because this is a safe community, uh, and they're saying, obviously, they have to question that given what happened yesterday. On the 26th of December, the owner of a local spa became concerned when one of her employees, who had worked for her for four years, failed to show up for work. She tried calling her employee but got no answer. For someone who's always early to work and who never misses a day, we expected the worst, she said. Residents were terrified. This was the worst gun violence that the community had ever seen, and the police needed to address their fears, Sergeant Eberling said. We are pretty confident that the shooter is among the deceased victims inside the apartment. We are not actively looking for a shooter that we believe is at large. As they began to piece together what they knew, the truth about who these people were and what had happened would eventually come out. Colleyville, Texas, a wealthy suburb of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, just a few miles away from Grapevine, was home to the Yazdan Pana family. The parents, 56-year-old Aziz and 55-year-old Nisreen, had both been born in Iran. They married in 1987 and moved to the United States, where they later welcomed two children, Nona and her younger brother, Ali. Nisreen had worked in a salon doing manicures and often talked about her family with people. Family was everything to Nisreen. She was close to her sister, Zori, and together they were described as two of the nicest people you could meet. Zori was married to a man called Muhammad Hussein, also known as Hussein, who was well known among the Iranian American community. He owned a large ranch in Dallas, and the family was incredibly close. The Yazdanpana family lived in a 3,000 square foot property in Colleyville, and on the surface, things appeared to be fine. Neighbors would see the family having yard sales, and Aziz appeared to be very active in his children's lives. He volunteered as a debate coach at Knox High School. One neighbor said, from everything we saw, he was actively engaged with his children. He was described as outgoing and would say hello to people if he passed them in the streets. But neighbors did note that he seemed to be very protective of his children. Nona and Ali were both doing well in school, so their parents had plenty to be proud of. Nona graduated from Colleyville Heritage High School and was a student at a local community college. She had big dreams of moving to the West Coast and attending school in California, with hopes of one day becoming a lawyer. One of Nona's friends said that she had implied that all was not well within her family and that things were becoming tougher for them, but she didn't provide further information. Her friend said that she was aware that Aziz was, in her words, really strict with his children and would take Nona's phone and refuse to give it back. She added that Nisreen was far more understanding than Aziz was. Nisreen's brother, Ali, said he had been supporting the family financially, as Aziz had not been employed for a number of years, having previously worked in the mortgage and real estate business. His financial problems had been ongoing for years. In 1996, he was placed on probation for three years after pleading guilty to one count of subscribing to a false income tax return. He was issued a fine of $1,000 and ordered to pay $3,119 in restitution to the Department of Justice. Just three years later, Aziz and Nisreen jointly filed for bankruptcy. The case was discharged a few months later, but their financial problems continued to worsen. In August 2010, Nisreen filed for bankruptcy, hoping it would help them keep their family home. However, the house was foreclosed on. Aziz initially attended meetings with Nisreen during the proceedings, but this would soon change. During the proceedings, she separated from her husband, 
and moved with their two children to an apartment in Grapevine, two miles away. Nisreen's brother had paid for the apartment as they were living without electricity or water due to the foreclosure. Nisreen was the only one bringing in money. Nona opened up to one of her friends and said she felt like her family was falling apart. The bankruptcy Nisreen had filed for was later dismissed because she had not made the planned payments. According to her lawyer, George Barnes, she had told him, please don't talk to my husband at all. Aziz had listed his employment as self-employed, even though he was out of work and not earning any money. Aziz allegedly sold the family's furniture and rugs to pay for sex workers. The separation and financial difficulties had been incredibly hard on Nisreen. She had a state cosmetology license, but disease had forbidden her from working after Aziz became unemployed and the family's finances took a hit. She had worked two jobs at different spas to try and keep the money coming in after they separated. A family friend said that Nisreen had done everything she could to remain on good terms with Aziz. She, along with the help of her sister, had decided to buy only the basic necessities for her apartment. She was described as a quiet, super kind lady, a peacemaker who didn't want anything to happen to her kids or her family. She was a really wonderful mom and always protective of her kids. After Nisreen moved out, Aziz stayed in the family home and neighbors would often see him working in the yard. One neighbor said he wasn't even aware that Aziz's wife and children had left the home. Although separated, they appeared to be on good terms, and Aziz also had a key to the new apartment and would occasionally visit his children. As the year began to come to a close, it was soon time for what the people of Grapevine loved most, Christmas. On Christmas Eve, the extended family had all gathered at Muhammad's ranch to enjoy a large Christmas party and spend some much needed time together. One of those in attendance was 22-year-old Sarah Zeri, Muhammad's daughter, who attended the University of Texas at Arlington as a pre-med student and was also a member of the Tri Delta sorority. Dozens of people were there and the celebrations carried on late into the night. Aziz had not been invited. The following day on Christmas, Nisreen and her children were at the apartment in Grapevine. That morning, Aziz set off to the apartment in his sport utility vehicle, dressed as Santa Claus. He parked outside, and shortly after he arrived, Nisreen's sister, brother-in-law, and niece came to the apartment too. Just before 11 a.m., Sarah sent a text message to her friend which said, So we're here. We just got here. And my uncle is here too, dressed as Santa. Awesome. She was, of course, referring to Aziz. Just 15 minutes later, she sent another message. Now he wants to be all fatherly and win father of the year. Within a few minutes after opening their gifts, Aziz revealed he had brought two guns with him. He opened fire and in terrifyingly quick succession, killed six members of his family, Ali, Nona, Zori, Sarah, Muhammad, and Nisreen. All had multiple gunshot wounds and had been shot several times. At 11.34, less than 20 minutes after Sarah had sent that text message, the 911 call was made. Great plan 911, where is your emergency? Do you need help? Are you sick? What was that? Do you need an ambulance or police? Hello? Although the dispatcher couldn't initially discern the contents of the call, the police opted to process it through specialized software to enhance the audio and extract more information about what had transpired. After this analysis, it became clear that someone had urgently said, help, help, followed by the caller stating, I'm shooting people. This led them to the conclusion that Aziz had placed the call to emergency services. Grapevine 911, where is your emergency? Hello, Grapevine 911. You need help? Are you sick? What was that? 
Yet more revealing information, very hard to stomach this morning as we listen to Grapevine Police give us the latest update. They are now telling us that this gunman dressed as Santa Claus was definitely an invited guest, welcome at this Christmas celebration, that no one knew he had arrived with two handguns he intended to use, and when he did, police say, he caught his victims totally by surprise. We await more information, but what we already do know is that this family involved Involved, definitely had some financial problems. We know that mom and Depp had separated back in March and that dad was still living in the Colleyville home that the bank had foreclosed on last year. Seven family members shot and killed on Christmas Day. Just to know that like the entire family was murdered is pretty awful. It's certainly the worst signal shooting that we've had with this many victims. Neighbors broke away from their holiday gatherings and watched as police searched the apartment for clues. They say the family kept to themselves and are stunned by the timing. It's just crazy, you know, unexpected, especially on Christmas Day, and family members most of all. With so many unanswered questions, investigators are trying to determine why the gunman massacred his own family on what should have been a day of joy. Mayor Tate Williams expressed profound shock and sorrow in the wake of this horrific tragedy, labeling it a profound and heart-wrenching event. He underlined the added anguish that had occurred on Christmas, a day that should have been filled with joy and celebration. Sergeant Eberling, who had been dedicatedly working on the case, echoed these sentiments, characterizing the incident as the most horrifying homicide Grapevine had ever witnessed and highlighting that it marked the town's first murders since 2010. The community found it almost inconceivable that such a violent and inexplicable event had transpired right on their doorstep. Funeral arrangements were swiftly organized with friends, family, and loved ones traveling from across the nation and beyond to pay their respects in Texas. In a somber and private ceremony, the six victims were laid to rest, leaving behind a heart-rending void in the lives of those who cherished them. Meanwhile, the police diligently continued their investigative efforts, turning their attention to the foreclosed home in Colleyville in search of potential clues. The hope was that Aziz's computer might yield information shedding light on a possible motive, but their inquiries hit a stumbling block when they discovered that the property's electricity had been disconnected, rendering the computer inaccessible. The perplexity surrounding the motivations behind such a violent attack persisted. As investigators conversed with friends and family members, a portrait emerged of a man profoundly discontented with his wife's apparent success without him. Amidst unemployment and the looming eviction from the house he called home, his situation appeared dire, with the bank scheduled to reclaim the property as early as the following March. The prospect of homelessness, coupled with his wife's flourishing life, could have conceivably fueled his actions. However, with Aziz no longer alive to account for his deeds, the exact workings of his mind would forever remain a mystery. Lieutenant Todd Deering reflected, You can speculate about his bankruptcy. You can speculate about his family relationships. You can speculate about a bunch of different things, but we just don't know right now. Everybody who may have known what the motive was or what set everything off is now deceased. Sergeant Eberling added, we really don't have a clear idea of why he did this. Sometimes there's not a really good explanation for irrational behavior. One of the family's friends voiced her belief that the murder stemmed from Aziz's resentment towards his wife's newfound independence and success. The shootings that transpired in Grapevine on that fateful Christmas day not only left the community in shock and the police department in disbelief due to their senselessness, and brutality but also inflicted irreparably pain on a shattered family. Nona, Ali, and Sarah, with their lives just beginning, had limitless opportunities and potential ahead of them. Zori and Mohammed, who meant so much to their local community and their family, left an irreplaceable void in the lives of those who loved them. For Nizreen, who was on the cusp of thriving and embracing a fresh start on her own, her life was tragically taken by the very person who had vowed to love and protect her, amplifying the devastation caused by this inexplicable act of violence. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more.
Ryan Smith was born in 1975 in San Diego, California, USA. He has always loved traveling and learning about other cultures. Ryan left his country at age 27 because he wanted to learn about the different kinds of people through their customs, languages, and traditions. This young man wanted to learn more about how people lived in Eurasia, especially in the countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union. So in 2022, Ryan took his dreams and backpack to Azerbaijan, a country that used to be part of the Soviet Union. The Caspian Sea and the Caucasus Mountains surround the country, which is in a place that is kind of in the middle of Eastern Europe and Western Asia. Because of this, it was a great place for a young traveler to begin exploring the world. Ryan moved to Baku, which is the capital of Azerbaijan, and studied the language and culture there. He wrote on his website that he worked at a carpet market in a city with walls around it at that time. In this way, he learned about one of the oldest and most valuable crafts in the area. The skills needed to make carpets are passed down from one generation to the next. This is a tradition that has almost died out over the years. The young designer was amazed by how beautiful the items were and thought about how making handmade carpets could be a business. Ryan thought about his idea and came back to the United States in December 2005 to start building the project. He met Laura Joy, a young and beautiful teacher, while he was in the United States. They got engaged and then married. Laura encouraged her husband's interests in traveling and learning about other cultures. In 2011, the couple went to Georgia, which used to be part of the Soviet Union and borders Azerbaijan. In Georgia, in the city of Marnoli, two young people got married with plans to start making traditional carpets there. They were very young when they had a son in 2014 and named him Kleb. At the same time, Ryan and Laura were advertising their long-awaited project to weave their own carpets by hand. The American who worked on the project used traditional Azerbaijani techniques to make it possible for everything made with this technology to sell on the international market for more than $1,000. While Laura taught English at a nearby public school, her husband went to different villages in the area to find weavers who would be willing to work with them. Ryan was surprised to find that not many masters were still using the old ways. Some of the people who joined the plan at first refused to work with it for different reasons. Ryan's prices were not acceptable to all, and some people didn't know the original designer and weren't sure if they could meet the brand's needs. Ryan wrote on his blog, that he spent four days in Kosolari, which is where he met artists who were interested in his project. Ryan didn't just want to make money or keep an ancient culture alive. He also wanted to become a public figure of goodwill by getting women from rural areas who know how to weave in old ways to join his project. This would give them the chance to bring back an old craft that would help them support their families. Quickly, Ryan and Laura Smith became one of the most admired couples and the American visitor thought that a city with only 20,000 people living in it was the most expensive place to live. His wife, Laura, became friendly with the people in the city, taught and made a lot of friends. Ryan, on the other hand, earned respect by promoting the value of the ancient carpet weaving culture. Most people in the area thought the Smith couple were good people they could ask for help. A couple of Americans who came to visit got so used to the people, traditions, and culture that they applied for citizenship in 2012 and were soon citizens of both the U.S. and Georgia. Word on the street was that the couple was going to use their own money to build a kindergarten with a playground. Tragically, tragedy struck the couple in the most unexpected and terrifying way, just as they were sure they had finally found a home and that the future looked bright for their family. In July 2018, Ryan, 43, and Laura, 42, were going to take a few days off to go on vacation with their little dog, Kleb, and get away from their normal lives. Laura's friend, Sabina Talabova, said that Laura called her on July 4 to tell her about her plans to go to the mountains and let them know they would be gone for two days. The couple chose to go to a small, beautiful place near the Godori Mountains that no one would see. You can go for walks and have picnics in this area, which is known for its trails, beautiful waterfalls, and stunning gorges. Instead of getting away from things and finding peace of mind in this quiet corner, the Smith family had their worst nightmare come true. They wanted to find a local person 
to act as their guide so they wouldn't get lost and could travel through the mountains without being scared. The parents also wanted to make sure that little Kleb was safe and that the trip would not be too long or hard for the baby. Finally, they met Malkaz Kober, a shepherd from the area. He didn't live here, but he knew the area well because he took his sheep and goats to graze there every day. People in Malkaz's area thought he was a good guy because he was always calm. The Smith family hired Malkaz as a guide because they had heard good things about him and knew the area. It wasn't long after they left for the mountains that the couple learned about Malkaz's terrible plans and claims. It turned out that the group went out on the mountain and when they got to the clearing set up camp for dinner. In order to get fresh water in the middle of the summer, they chose a spot near one of the many springs in the area. There was a time when Ryan must have paid attention to his guide because he thought he wasn't being careful enough with the gun he always carried. There was a heated argument between the two men and no one thought Malkaz would shoot Ryan in the head with a gun. After that, he shot the man in the back again. The baby's crying and Laura's screams of fear drowned out the sounds of gunfire in the mountains, but the worst was yet to come. Even though the woman begged him not to, Malkaz put the gun to Kleb's head and fired straight at him. Laura turned into stone because she was scared and didn't know what was going on. But when she saw Malkaz's cold eyes, she knew what he really wanted. Her instinct to protect herself worked. Sarah ran as fast as she could to stay safe and keep her husband and son from getting hurt. But when she got to the edge of the waterfall cliff, she saw that she couldn't get away. The shepherd is said to have pushed the woman off a cliff and then hit her with a weapon. It is where Laura's body fell into the water. The investigation that followed said that Malkaz buried Kleb's body in a remote area and also sent the murder weapon there. The shepherd then went back to the village like nothing had happened. Sabina, Laura's friend, started to worry when she hadn't heard from her for three days after a family trip. Shiana tried calling Ryan and Laura, but never heard back. Another group of people who were with Ryan were also confused because he hadn't called anyone in a long time. On July 6th, someone called the Center for Rapid Response and Emergency Situations to say that a Georgian family with American roots might have gone missing in the mountains. The caller was Sabina, and she said that the Smith family and their four-year-old son had been in the mountains for more than two days and could not be reached by phone. Fifteen rescuers were sent to the gorge to look for a family that was thought to be missing. When rescuers got to the designated area, they found Laura's things and car. But as the searchers went further along the small group's path, they came across something terrible. At the base of the waterfall, there was a dead body. Rescuers who were lost stepped up their efforts and expanded their search area. About 800 meters from the waterfall, the body of a person was found. Because of the season's high humidity and heat, the body broke down faster. So at first, the police said the victims didn't show any signs of violence. An investigation was started because that's what the Georgian criminal code says should happen. But no one knew anything about the little girl. It was clear what would happen to the helpless baby after three more days. Investigators were able to figure out that Malkaz was the last person the family talked to. It was said that the 19-year-old shepherd knew where Kleb was while he was being questioned. On the fourth day, after the Smith family went to the mountains, Malkaz showed police where he buried Kleb and the gun. The next day, Georgian police said in a statement that Malkaz Kabari, a young shepherd, had been arrested and was being held on suspicion of killing the Smith family. The news that a married couple and their son had been killed shocked everyone in Georgia, especially the weavers in Marnuli. It was also said by the American consulate that this crime was very scary. Together with the Georgian police, an FBI team actually took part in the investigation and helped look for and process evidence. The charges against Malkaz were dropped by the Tbilisi Municipal Court on July 11th, but he was still arrested. The conductor said that two foreigners who came in a black car were the real killers of the family. It is said that these people killed the Smith family and threatened to kill him and his family if he called the police. They then left Malkaz alive so that the shepherd would be blamed for killing three people. Malkaz's lawyer said that he couldn't do anything violent to Laura because the man said he wasn't ready for that since he was still a virgin. 
people from Ryan's family, friends, and public advocacy groups gathered in front of his Marnuli home on July 12th with toys, flowers, and lit candles to show their support and remember the victims. The next day, Malkaz's lawyer confirmed that the accused person was not guilty. He went on to say that the crime was done by two foreigners and that his client Malkaz initially pleaded guilty because of psychological pressure. However, proof against Malkaz started to show up one piece at a time. The autopsy report of the victims was the strongest proof that Malkaz was guilty. Two bullet holes were found in Ryan's body, one in the head and one in the back. Kleb was shot in the head from right in front of him. DNA tests proved that the biological material found in Laura's body and on her underwear belonged to Malkaz, and it was proven that she had been abused. The killer's and Ryan's DNA were both found on the murder weapon, a technical check of the phones of the victims and the person they say killed them by the FBI also revealed that Malkaz's phone had pictures of Laura's dead body at the waterfall. The shepherd even showed them to some people he knew in the area and told them that he had found a dead body while walking through these areas by accident. The phone's search history showed that Malkaz had been to a number of sexually explicit sites a few days before the incident. Investigators came to the conclusion that the young man's interest in Laura was the reason he did what he did and that he knew what he was doing from the moment the Smith family called Malkaz to take them to the waterfall. David, Malkaz's lawyer, quit after the autopsy results came out, saying that he could not defend the shepherd for moral reasons. As soon as David was taken off the case, it was taken over by another lawyer. He insisted that the client was innocent and asked for Malkaz's previous confession to be thrown out. Mariana, the shepherd's mother, stood by her son and agreed with the lawyer that the police may have used the threat of jail time to get the guy to confess to the crime. Family members of the suspect said that the police accused Malkaz to close the case because the crime was well known. But on November 9, 2018, Malkaz was charged with killing three Smith family members. Besides those charges, he was also charged with assaulting Laura. A psychological test of the young shepherd showed that he is healthy, sane and ready to be put on trial. Before his trial, Malkaz was being held in jail until April 9, 2019, but the prosecutor said they had strong proof of his guilt and that he would be punished for such a terrible crime. A group of 12 judges met on March 25, 2019, and all of them agreed that Malkaz was guilty of killing more than two people with extreme cruelty. He planned to kill someone in order to hide another crime, which was assault on March 27, 2019. The judge in Gori District announced that the criminal would be sent to prison for life. The criminal's family members protested the life sentence, which they thought was unfair. Friends and family of the Smith family were relieved by the sentence, and the defense lawyers said they would appeal the verdict to the appellate instances because they thought there had been errors in the process. The U.S. consul in Georgia said that the verdict was fair for the Smith family and that there was no doubt that Malkaz was guilty. The people of Marnuli have loved and respected Ryan and Laura Smith ever since they moved to Georgia. Their brutal murder has been a blow to the community that the couple chose to call home. Not only did Ryan's community project bring back an old tradition, it also gave many women a way to make money and feel safe. Dozens of women who wanted to run their own businesses were sad and uncertain when their husbands died. Soon after the terrible events that killed the founders, the project was brought back to life by foreign investors who support Ryan's ideas and give local craftsmen jobs. After leaving the life they knew in the West, Ryan and Laura went to Asia to find cultural treasures. Along with being greeted by grateful people in the community, they came across a dangerous being who pretended to be a kind shepherd. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Escaped to their deaths in 2003, this high-profile story shook Brazil and received widespread coverage in the international media. Hundreds of law enforcement officers, rescuers, and volunteers, as well as those interested in the story, 
were looking for the young couple who went missing in the forests of Embuguasu province. They hoped to find them alive, but their hopes were dashed, and the young people's final days became a nightmare. However, grieving members of the families of the missing faced another ordeal when the main criminal rapist, torturer, and brutal killer was not prosecuted. Furthermore, he found himself in better living conditions than before. This is the case of Liana Friedenbach and Felipe Café. Liana Bay Friedenbach was born in Sao Paulo. In May 1987, the girl was the eldest of her parents' two children, and she grew up in a relatively well-known and wealthy family. Ari Friedenbach, the family's patriarch, was a successful lawyer and well-respected member of the community. Felipe Silva Café, born in July 1984 in Sao Paulo, grew up in a large, modest family. He has worked part-time since he was a child, trying to support himself and his relatives. The young people met as schoolchildren, and their friendship developed into mutual sympathy and the first youthful love. However, they had to conceal it in every possible way. It is worth noting that Liana's parents were religious and raised their daughter strictly. She went to church on a regular basis and attended Sunday school since she was very young. Her father and mother were adamantly opposed to her romantic relationships at such a young age. Furthermore, social inequality played a significant role in this case because, as I previously stated, the girl came from a wealthy family while her chosen one was poor. However, their parents' prohibitions did not force the young people to end their relationship. Instead, they began to conceal their affair, secretly scheduling dates in different locations where no one could see them, in order to spend at least some time together. On one final trip in the fall of 2003, the lovers decided to get away from everyone for a while, traveling to a remote deserted area to be alone. They carefully planned the trip, which was supposed to be an exciting adventure for them, and most importantly, the boys made sure they had a plausible alibi that would justify their absence and avoid suspicion. Felipe told his parents that he and his friends were going camping, and Liana told her parents that she was going sightseeing with the guys from church. She was confident that this excuse would work and that her parents would let her go with no questions asked. The Friedenbach and Café families believed the teenagers' stories and allowed their children to die without fear. Liana and Felipe were overjoyed. They could spend the entire week together without fear of being judged by their parents. The young people decided to travel to the picturesque province of Embuguasu. They packed a tent, sleeping bags, some personal belongings, and a small supply of provisions, but the couple had almost no money. They had the right to free public transportation as students, so the guys planned and calculated their route to their destination by bus ahead of time. Early on October 31st, the lovers met at the agreed-upon location making certain that no one who knew them saw them together. They took the first bus and spent the night at the bus station after arriving in another city late in the evening. Then two more vehicles took them to their destination. From there, they had to walk a few kilometers to a deserted spot hidden in the woods where they planned to camp and spend a few days alone together. The day was warm and sunny, and despite their exhaustion from the long journey, the young people were in good spirits, joking, laughing, and planning their short vacation. When they arrived at the location marked on the map, they began to set up their modest but cozy camp. Uninvited guests, when Liana and Felipe traveled to such a remote and secluded location, they failed to consider the fact that poverty reigns in those areas, fueling crime. So the presence of well-dressed young men carrying large backpacks and bags did not go unnoticed. As the couple walked through the forest to the abandoned farm where they planned to stay, they came across some local bandits fishing near a pond. They were Paulo Cesar da Silva Marquez, a.k.a. Pernambuco, and Roberto Aparecido Alves Cardoso, a.k.a. Champinha. The latter was only 16 years old, but he was already the gang's leader. He organized the criminals who were attracted to strangers, particularly a beautiful young girl. They also decided that there was something in their backpacks that they could steal. The bandits followed the guys stealthily and began to watch them from the thickets. The lovers pitched a tent, ate a snack, and then set about beautifying their parking lot. The intruders waited in ambush until they were certain that no one else would join the young men, 
and that they had no weapons with them. Pernambuco and Champina then attacked and threatened Liana and Felipe. The latter, terrified, did not even attempt to flee or fight back against the unknown assailants. After searching all of the bags and backpacks, the criminals discovered nothing that would interest them. The bandits then decided to demand a ransom for the boy and girl from their relatives. Liana, who was terrified, quickly confirmed that she came from a wealthy family and that her father would give them any amount of money they requested. The criminals were pleased with this turn of events, but because they lacked experience in such situations, they had no idea how to organize everything so that they could keep the money and be free. Finally, while the plan was being developed and the bandits were determining who they had in their hands and how much they could demand for their lives, they decided to hide the prisoners so they could not flee. Initially, they were taken to a dilapidated structure near the farm where the boys were staying, which lacked windows and doors. It was quickly decided to take the pair to the home of one of the gang members there. Felipe was tied up and severely beaten, preventing him from escaping or resisting. That same night, each gang member took turns exploiting the bound and helpless girl, eventually breaking her morally. The criminals couldn't figure out how to demand and collect the ransom, so they simply killed the captives and hid their bodies somewhere in the woods so they wouldn't be discovered. The boys were taken to a deserted area in the woods the following day after being tortured. The half-dead Felipe was led deep into the forest where a shot was heard before the bandit returned alone. Liana realized what had happened. Her beloved was no longer alive, although the kidnappers tried. They had other plans for the lovely young Liana after assuring her that they had released the young man. The scoundrels wanted to keep her as a plaything until they got bored of her, especially since no one had begun looking for the missing boys. A few days after their daughter's departure, her parents discovered that there was no excursion trip with the church guys, and Liana's friends had no idea where she had gone. The Friedenbach family suspected that their heiress had fled with her boyfriend and immediately contacted his parents to inquire about their children's whereabouts. But Cafe's family was certain that their son had gone camping with his friends, so there was nothing they could do to help find the couple. The situation was complicated by the fact that neither of the young men had communicated in several days and their phones were turned off. Ari Friedenbach used his connections and money to put all of the city's cops on their feet. They were able to reconstruct the route the young people took after tricking them into fleeing home. The police soon arrived in Embuguasu, where the boys had gotten off their last bus and their route continued through a deserted wooded area. It was also where their phones were last active. A large-scale search began involving police officers, rescuers, and concerned citizens who had learned about the incident and wanted to help. A large local businessman also joined the operation, bringing his personal helicopter to search from the air and handing out leaflets with photos of the missing young people. Their camp was discovered quickly, and it appeared frightening. Despite the absence of blood and fighting, it was obvious that something terrible had occurred here. The couple's personal belongings had been removed from their bags and carelessly scattered. The tent had been opened from top to bottom with a knife, and the guy's cell phones were scattered about. Felipe's lifeless body was quickly discovered by rescuers. The tied-up guy had been shot in the back of the head almost at point-blank range, so he had no hope of being rescued. It became clear that the chances of finding Liana alive were slim, but as they say, Hope dies last. Ari Friedenbach involved the press in the search, ensuring that the entire process was widely covered in the media and that as many people as possible were aware of it in the hopes of learning anything about Liana's whereabouts. An impressive reward was announced, but it did not help the situation. The massacre of Liana began after the criminals had killed Felipe. They returned Liana to the house where they had previously kept them both, by then, the bandits had been joined by their accomplices, Antonio Caetano da Silva and Arnaldo Pires. Pernambuco proudly informed them that Liana was his property and he could do whatever he wanted with her. He invited everyone to have their dirtiest fantasies with Liana and his offer was quickly accepted. A day later, 
After learning of the large-scale search operation, the criminals decided to change their location and accompany the victim to the home of Antonio Matias de Barros, another gang member. They went fishing that evening accompanied by Liana. The ringleader threw his jacket over her because it was cold outside and he wanted to show concern in this way. Champina's older brother, whom the juvenile delinquent had not informed about his affairs, arrived at the same location later that evening. Champina informed his brother that Liana was his lover, but he immediately recognized her as the wanted girl. He took his brother aside and informed him that his captive was being actively sought and that the police were literally following them. Champigna interpreted his brother's words as a sign and a call to action. He decided it was urgent to get rid of Liana before fleeing and concealing himself. He lied to Liana, claiming she was free and that he would take her to the road. In fact, the bandit led his victim into the forest where he brutally killed her with a knife before smashing her head with a rock to ensure her death. Liana's body was not discovered until five days after the massacre. She was literally lifeless. She had been severely mutilated. Liana was wearing the killer's jacket, which later became one of the most important pieces of evidence. The criminals were extremely cruel, cynical and ruthless, but they were also stupid and short-sighted in that they did not try to flee or hide, did not bother to destroy physical evidence, and believed that no one would ever find them. The bandit's naive self-confidence allowed the police to quickly identify and apprehend all members of the criminal gang. As previously stated, Champinha left his sweat-stained jacket on the victim's body. In addition, he brought the murder weapon into his house, washed it and hid it in the yard while attempting to wash the clothes stained with the murdered girl's blood so that he could continue to wear them. DNA analysis revealed the identities of the gang members who had committed violence against Liana. The gang members were apprehended almost simultaneously. The ringleader not only did not deny it, but he immediately began to testify, boasting that he had kidnapped, abused, and murdered the unfortunate victim. He went into great detail about what had happened to Liana in her final days. After a lengthy trial, nearly all of the adult members of the criminal gang received harsh sentences. Pernambuco was sentenced to life imprisonment for Felipe's murder. Antonio Caetano da Silva and Analdo Pires were also sentenced to life in prison, but Antonio Matias de Barros was only sentenced to six years because he did not torture the victim, but rather provided the gang with his home where it all took place. However, with the ringleader and the most brutal member of the gang, things were not as simple. He was barely 16 years old when he committed these crimes. As a result, the individual was sent to a specialized prison for minors with a relatively mild regime. Champigna attempted several escapes and behaved aggressively and inadequately, prompting a psychiatric examination. He was discovered to have several mental abnormalities that, while not inherently dangerous, combined to create a monstrous result, transforming the young man into a sophisticated sadist and murderer with no feelings of pity or remorse. Following such a diagnosis, the criminal was transferred to a Clozotype medical facility where he was required to undergo mandatory treatment and rehabilitation. Despite numerous appeals from the families of the murdered young men, he received no further punishment. As a result, Champinha's situation improved from before the crime. He now had his own private, cozy room complete with a large television, internet access, and a comfortable bed with an orthopedic mattress. He eats four balanced meals per day from a customized menu as required by the medical facility where he is being held. His monthly maintenance is estimated at around $1,200, $20,500. In recent years, the perpetrator has repeatedly petitioned for his release, claiming that he has completed a full course of treatment and no longer poses a threat to others, allowing him to return to his normal life. This is a monster story. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Cape Town is 400 miles away from the city of Port Elizabeth, which is at the western end of Algoa Bay, on the southeast coast of South Africa. 
This city is a major seaport and also has the sixth most people in South Africa. When Chris Panayotu, then 18 years old, graduated from high school in this city in November 2004, he went to work for his dad's trading company. In the city and the areas around it, his father owned a large chain of stores and restaurants. Chris had always wanted to work in his dad's business, even when he was young. He was also very interested in running retail chains and growing the retail services industry. He was very active and determined, and his goals went far beyond being an executive and skilled worker under his father's supervision. Chris wanted to open his own fish restaurant near a five-star hotel on Marina Drive and a big grocery store close to Kings Beach downtown. While Chris was helping his dad at a small diner on Market Street in the afternoon, he ran into an old high school friend. The friend invited Chris to a party on Friday night at Barney's Tavern, a popular beach spot for young people. Chris saw a pretty young girl drinking lemonade from a tall glass while sitting alone at the bar in a wicker bamboo chair and drinking beer from the establishment's specialty mug. Chris got up from his seat and went to meet her. She was 18 years old and her name was Jade Dinks. They hit it off right away and they quickly found that they had a lot in common. Chris and Jade started dating after that party. They had no idea that their meeting at Barney's Tavern on Friday night would be the start of a terrible love triangle story that ended in tragedy. The girl named Jade was always happy and friendly, and she wanted to make other people feel good. Because she wanted to make a difference, she decided to become a teacher and started college in 2005. While Jade worked on her schoolwork, Chris started his own business. He started with a grocery store and then opened Infinite, a restaurant and bar in the neighborhood. Even though both Jade and Chris had a lot going on in their lives, their relationship grew stronger, like the roots of a young tree going deeper into the ground. They each made their own happy place where love and kindness seemed to last forever and where days were full of smiles and hope for a bright future. Things started to go wrong in their relationship over time, mostly because Chris was seeing another woman. At first, Chanel Kutis was just working at the store that Chris owned and their relationship was strictly business. But as time went on, their interactions turned into a secret love affair that they tried to hide with mysterious smiles and small movements. They met in secret in hotels in the area, and Chris even let Chanel stay with him while Jade was away. Chris and Jade seemed like a happy and successful young couple to their family and friends, especially after they got engaged and then married in 2012. Jade finished college and got a job at an elementary school, and Chris's business looked like it was doing well. However, Chris's relationship with Chanel continued which made things difficult in their marriage. When Costa Panayotu, Chris's father, found out that his son was having an affair with a sales clerk, he was very upset and angry. He couldn't understand how Chris, who had been seeing Jade for eight years and knew she was smart, kind, and moral, could act so badly. Costa confronted Chris at Infinite while he was celebrating his engagement with friends, which turned into a heated argument. Costa told Chris that he would lose his inheritance if he kept seeing Chanel. Chris told his father that he was ending his relationship with Chanel, but they were still seeing each other behind his back. During this time, Jade didn't know that her fiance was cheating on her. Chris's finances got worse as he tried to balance his two different lives. He spent a lot of money on gifts for Chanel, fancy hotel rooms, and other unnecessary things. While Chris was away from Jade more and more over the next three years, it hurt his business and his family. Jade started to feel more and more alone and ignored in her marriage. She told her friends how upset she was and how she had tried but failed to get them back to getting along. In September 2014, Jade was at the point of losing her mind. She wrote a very emotional letter on September 21st about how much she wanted love, a normal marriage, and a caring partner. She also told him how annoyed she was with Chris's secrecy and the distrust and uncertainty it caused. Three big men in a rented car pulled up to the gate of Staringglad Village on April 20th, 2015, in the early morning. This is where the young Panayo two couple lived. They saw a young woman who was well-dressed and impatiently waiting by the road. Two of the men got out of the car, but the driver told them to stay inside. A black BMW pulled up next to her and they watched when she got in the car, 
It took off quickly, making the people who wanted to take her hostage angry. Like every other day, Jade left her house at 6.15 a.m., waiting for her friend and co-worker Cheryl to pick her up in her BMW for their daily trip to work. Cheryl was running a little behind, and she saw the car from the day before with tinted windows at the curb. When Jade reached for her phone to call Cheryl, she saw two people coming from the bushes next to the road. Cheryl was only 10 minutes late, but Jade wasn't there. Cheryl tried to call Jade's cell phone and knock on her door, but got no answer. Cheryl finally called the police and by 10 a.m., Jade Panayotu was officially reported missing. This led to a large-scale search that included police, a K-9 unit, and volunteers from the community. The search for Jade went on, but on the first day, nothing was found. The search started up again the next morning, and there was a reward for anyone who could help find her. Around 10 a.m., Angel, a K-9 officer, found Jade's dead body in a bushy ravine close to Quano Bushley. Even though she was fully dressed, a medical exam showed that she had been shot three times in the back and fatally in the head. Her jewelry and bank cards were missing, making it look like the people who killed her were trying to hide why they did it. Jade's family and friends were shocked and couldn't understand what had happened. Her co-workers and students were also very sad. The news of her death spread all over the city and people were sad and confused on social media. On October 22nd, Jade's family held a memorial service at a Catholic church. This was followed by a funeral that was attended by a huge number of people from Port Elizabeth. People who knew and loved Jade were deeply saddened by her death. South African police service officers were also at the city cemetery. They thought Chris Panayotu's behavior during the funeral was strange and staged. As suspicions grew, the court later found that Chris's farewell speech looked a lot like a dedication on the internet by Charles Atkins to his late wife. Even though it wasn't direct proof, this discovery made people think that Chris may have been involved in killing his wife. The authorities decided to keep a close eye on him. Several other strange events also pointed to Chris's involvement in the murder of his wife. Luthando Sioni, a security guard at Chris's nightclub, was arrested by the police the night before the funeral because they thought he might have worked with the killer. Luthando said Chris had asked him to hire killers for his wife and that Chris had already found three friends to carry out the plan. There was proof that someone tried to use Jade's bank cards on the day she was killed and surveillance footage showed two men that Luthando identified as the hired killers. As a reward for his help, the police let Luthando go on the condition that he gather more evidence, including Chris's confession to killing his wife. Because he was told to, Luthando called Chris for a private conversation that was recorded. During the conversation, Chris said something that led to his arrest. After that, three more suspects were caught and the crime's details were put back together. Hit men were sent by Chris to kill Jade Panayotu in the early hours of April 20th, 2015. But because of an unplanned change in her plans, the execution was moved to the next day. On April 21st, Jade was taken hostage and taken to a remote area and brutally killed. The thieves took her valuables and ran away. They tried to take money out of her bank cards but couldn't because the PN they were using was wrong. The trial against Chris and the two mercenaries began on October 11, 2015 and was widely watched and reported on by the media. The prosecution said that Chris killed one of the women because he was having money problems that were made worse by his double life and his desire to kill one of the women. At the trial, different types of evidence were shown, such as Chanel Coutis's testimony, call logs, ATM videos, and photos. Along with the two hired killers, Chris was found guilty by the court and given a life sentence. On December 9, 2019, Chris's father, Costa Panayotu, died in a mysterious accident. This added another sad turn to the story. This made the story even more complicated and left a lot of questions unanswered. If Chris had anything to do with his father's death, it made an already scary story even scarier. Overall, Chris Panayotu's actions showed how far some people are willing to go to put their own needs ahead of the lives and well-being of those they care about. People are angry and upset about what he did, 
which led to the brutal murder of his wife Jade. It's still not clear if Chris had anything to do with his father's death, but he is now facing the consequences of his horrible crimes, which means he will never get away. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. In the mid-1920s, the story of Dina Thompson, a British woman who was known as the Black Widow, was the subject of many crime shows and documentaries. At first glance, this woman seemed nice, but she turned out to be a pathological liar and con artist who killed at least one man who loved her deeply. Dina got away with many crimes, but in 2003, she was finally put in jail. Even though the person was facing life in prison, the court was surprisingly lenient and let them out on parole. So in 2022, one of the most dangerous criminals got away with her crimes after miraculously surviving her evil ex-husband. Experts say that the fact that Thompson's victims were always men may be a sign that the criminal experienced some kind of trauma as a child or teen. Dina, on the other hand, had a very good childhood. The girl was born in North London in 1960 and grew up with her whole family. Their family didn't have much, but they made sure their daughter had everything she needed. Their head of the family worked as a prison guard and was very into sports. Dina's father encouraged her to go to gyms as a child, where she worked hard at gymnastics. In addition, the man often took his daughter with him to all kinds of sports competitions, even ones that were held in other countries. As a child, Dina was active, happy, and friendly. She quickly became friends with her peers and, as she got older, learned how to get guys' attention quickly. The girl went to college after high school and then got a job at a bank in the area. When Dina was 22, she met Lee Wyatt, who would become her first husband. Someone set them up on a blind date, which is how they met in the first place. As soon as the two young people met, they fell in love and a rough romance began. They got along great and spent a lot of time together. After two years, they made their relationship official. After getting married, the couple moved to Yapton, a small town in the country with only 3,000 people. Soon after, they had a son, and the new parents slowly started their own business by making one-of-a-kind soft toys based on pictures they came up with together. At the same time, Dina worked as a cashier for a construction company. Neighbors said that their family was very happy and doing well. The family head was often away on business trips and wasn't at home for long periods of time. When it came to his neighbors, the man hardly ever talked to them, but his wife quickly became friendly with people in the area. Dina knew how to get along with others, and men were quick to trust her. The pretty young woman often caught their attention. Dina met a young reporter named Julian Webb at the start of the 1990s. The man offered to use her as a model for ads for clothes and home goods, and soon her pictures were in newspapers and magazines in the area. Dina was happy to pose for the picture and didn't mind being looked at. Lee Wyatt hadn't been home in months, and no one was sure where he was or what was wrong with him. It turned out that Lee had been in the small town of New Key the whole time, which is almost on the other side of the country. His plan was to hide from the mafia, so he lived there under a fake name and fake papers. The man's wife told him a series of clever lies to make him believe that their family was in grave danger and that the only way out was to run away. In addition to making unique soft toys, the couple was also known for making a leprechaun named Sean, which sold well and became somewhat famous. Around the beginning of 1991, Dina told her husband that the Disney company liked their creation so much that they were willing to pay 50 million pounds to use the character. But the happiness didn't last long. Soon, the woman told them that criminals had learned about the big deal and wanted to take most of the money while threatening to kill the whole family. Dina also found a way out. She cleverly told her husband he needed to secrete himself. Lee got some fake papers right away and ran away. The woman, however, was very smart and got Lee to write her several threatening letters and record several similar phone calls. She said that this would show that he hated his wife and stopped the mafia from after her. The husband did what his wife told him to do because he didn't think anything was wrong. He then ran away. Lee was willing to do any job because he was in a new city and didn't have a home or any friends. 
He sent all the money he made to his wife and son so they didn't have to worry about anything. Most likely this escape really did save his life, but not from imaginary thieves. His own wife was the real threat. Dina married her new love, Julian, in November of the same year, 1991. The wedding was paid for with the money Lee had sent home, even though Dina had lied to him about it. Webb was deeply in love and very happy, but soon after the wedding, neighbors noticed that the woman often went to see her lovers while her husband was at work. After some time, she told Julian that she was dying and that her job had fired her because of it. The story about the fatal diagnosis and being fired was a lie from the beginning to the end. It also turned out that a lot of money had been taken from the company where Dana worked, and she was the main suspect in the crime. After that, the woman said that her first husband, Lee Wyatt, threatened her and made her do the crime. She showed proof in the form of the letters and recordings that she had herself persuaded him to make. Wyatt went back home as soon as he found out that his wife had married someone else. A scandal was all that the case was about, and Dana said he beat her, but there was no proof of this. The detective still chose to side with the woman, though, so Lee had to quickly leave Yapton again. When Julian was in love, his situation didn't bother him at all, and he spent all of his savings on her fake illness so she could get better. While the money was still there, time went on and Julian began to wonder how the treatment was going. It turned out that the woman didn't have any medical records to back up her diagnosis. Family relationships broke down, and neighbors heard the spouses yelling at each other. Julian's sudden death happened in June 1994, just one day after his 31st birthday party. His mom called him the night before the terrible event, but Dina said her husband wasn't feeling well and couldn't answer. Julian's mom told her sister-in-law to call an ambulance, but her sister-in-law didn't listen. The experts found that the young man died of a drug overdose, but no one thought that this was a criminal act, and the man's wife insisted that her husband had chosen to end his own life. She also wanted Julian's body to be burned, but his parents were very against this. After she died, Dina tried to get a big insurance payment from her husband, but she was turned down because their marriage was ruled invalid. Dina didn't even try to cry or show sadness at the funeral. Instead, she wore an honest outfit and acted rudely. Almost right away after that, the widowed woman started having a lot of affairs and romances. She didn't hide the fact that she had lovers over. She did it in public. Dina filed for divorce from her first legal husband in 1997. A little less than a year later, she met Richard Thompson and fell in love with him right away. Dana didn't give it much thought before telling her new lover that she was very sick and didn't have long to live. The man, who was deeply in love with her, promised to make the last few months of her life into a fairy tale. He was ready to spend all of his savings on this. The wedding took place in one of Florida's best hotels, and the couple spent their honeymoon there before moving to Brighton, England on the south coast of their home country. Richard said that the way his wife cared for and supported him literally put a spell on him. She also skillfully pretended to agree with all of his ideas and goals. He had always wanted to own his own boat so that he could fish professionally. His wife not only liked the idea, but she also suggested that he start a business renting out yachts so that he could fish and teach other people how to fish. A romantic dinner was planned for Dina and her husband on New Year's Eve less than a year after they got married. After taking a bath together, she told her husband she had made him a special gift and asked for permission to tie him up. Richard agreed right away because he didn't think anything was wrong. He had ropes around his hands, a blindfold over his eyes, and a gag in his mouth when he was hit hard on the head with a bat. This was followed by another hit. Thanks to his quick thinking, Richard not only didn't pass out but also got away quickly. After that, Dina got a knife and cut her husband in the shoulder. Richard took the gun away from his wife, held her down, and called the police. She broke down in tears and told him she had been lying to him the whole time and spent all of his money. Once she got to the police station, though, she calmed down and started to say that her husband had attacked her and that she was only protecting herself. The story didn't end there. The next day, a real estate agent came to Richard's house to try to sell it. 
The landlady told him that her husband had left for America on a business trip before their meeting. Richard knew at that moment that his wife was planning to kill him, sell the house, and take the money. Because everyone thought Thompson had crossed the ocean, no one would look for him. It turned out that the woman had taken all of her husband's money out of his bank accounts and used his credit cards to rack up a lot of debt while the case was going on in court. A lot of people heard about the case and other men who used to be with Dina and were cheated on and drained of money by her lies about a fake disease that could not be cured started to call the police. The woman's first husband then talked about how he had to hide for many years, first from people who thought the mafia was after her and then from the police. It turned out that Dana had stolen from the company where she worked, even though she blamed her husband for everything. Even though there was strong evidence against the woman, she was found not guilty of attacking her husband Richard Thompson. Some people said that Richard made up the story to get attention for himself. Dina was still found guilty of many financial frauds and given a sentence of almost four years in prison. All the attention on Dina Thompson also made people think of her second husband, journalist Julian Webb, who died in a strange and sudden way. The woman herself gave very different stories about how and why he died. She said that the steroids her husband took to stay in shape were killing him. Then she said he drank a lot and then passed out in the sun, getting sunstroke. She even said that he killed himself at the inquest even though she had warned them not to. Dana told her best friend that she had poisoned her husband by putting strong drugs in a dish that he loved that was spicy. The police were able to find the owner of the diner where Julian often ate and picked up food to go. He remembered that Webb's wife had made rice and chicken curry the day before the terrible event. Then, the police thought that this seasoning might have been hiding the real taste of the drugs. Because new information came to light, a new investigation was started, and Julian's body was dug up and sent to be looked at. It turned out that the man was poisoned by a lot of strong antidepressants that were mixed into his favorite curry dish, and then made stronger by aspirin, which Dina mixed into her husband's drink. Webb was still alive when his mother called. He could have been saved, but that wasn't a plan from his wife. For the first time, the Black Widow was put on trial in 2003. During the hearing, the investigator said she was the most dangerous woman he had ever worked with, and the judge said she was a very good liar. Dina Thompson was given a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 16 years. People have made documentaries about the crimes of the Black Widow, talked about them on TV, and written about them in the news. Detectives found out about another scary event in Dina's past, even after she was in jail. The person who was one of her first lovers never showed up again and has still not been found, dead or alive. Stanislav Kostov was the young man's name. He lived in Bulgaria which is where Dana trained as a gymnast in the late 1970s. A romantic relationship started between them, and then the guy was never seen again. The investigation doesn't rule out the possibility that Dana has something to do with this case, and Kostov was one of her first victims. But there was nothing that could be shown. Thompson worked with a prison psychologist and took rehabilitation classes while she was in jail. The detective in charge of Dina's case says that she doesn't feel bad about what she did and can commit another crime even though she has been good and said the right things about re-education and admitting her mistakes. Still, Black Widow, who was 61 years old, was let out of prison in the summer of 2022. Richard Thompson said he wouldn't feel safe now that he knows about it because he doesn't know what to expect from his ex-spouse. Now Dina has to tell the police about all of her relationships and connections, stay inside after dark, and report all of her financial transactions. She also can't talk to her ex-husbands or lovers who were hurt by what she did. She has to wear a special bracelet on her leg that keeps track of everything she does. A few months after she was freed, reporters caught Thompson coming back from the store with a big bag of shopping. On her right hand's ring finger, there was a huge ring that looked a lot like an engagement ring. It is possible that the Black Widow caught another gullible person in her web. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Parents can be very pushy, 
rude and demanding in what they want. It's helpful sometimes and not so helpful other times. There are times when being so demanding can even be dangerous. Brett Ryan found himself in a just such case. He grew up in a wealthy and big Canadian family with four other sons. His parents were Bill and Susan. It might seem like having a lot of kids, especially boys, is a lot of hard work as a parent, but it wasn't for everyone. Their parents tried to show the younger Ryan the right way to do things. In addition to his well-known job at the Toronto Star Daily newspaper, his dad was interested in many things like sports, yoga, and psychology. In terms of Susan, she worked very hard and the whole family home depended on her. She spent all of her time with her husband and children and kept their huge house in a nice part of Toronto in perfect shape without any help from gardeners or craftsmen. As people walked by the family home, they would stop and look through the fence at the huge flowering garden. It's not fair to say that Brett was the family favorite because Susan loved everyone the same. However, it might have looked like Brett got in the most trouble for disobeying. He was always able to get out of trouble, even when there was a lot of proof that he was involved. He found a way to show that he wasn't fully involved, and it's amazing how that skill helped him make a lot of friends. Brett was well-liked at school, and everyone wanted to be friends with him or at least be able to handshake with him like his brothers. Brett went to college after high school. With the goal of being better than his brothers, he put an ad in the newspaper offering to paint people's homes and fences in Toronto. Things were going great at first, and the young man made his first dollar. Susan was so proud of her son that she used him as an example for other people. It's one thing to make this much money from a part-time job, though, and quite another to quit college and paint houses full-time instead of going to school. Brett stopped going to college after a while. In the beginning, Brett felt sure of himself around his older brothers. But once Christopher and Leland graduated and got jobs in their fields, Brett's authority started to slip. Christopher worked as a transit officer for the city of Toronto, and Leland became an artist and designer for the family. After school, they moved out of their parents' house. Brett stayed with his father, mother, and younger brother, who went to a school for gifted kids so he wouldn't have to spend some of his money on rent. Brett was getting more and more desperate as the years went by because he couldn't pay off his debts. He fell into depression. Brett owed more than $60,000 by 2007 when he was 26 years old. People thought Brett was smart, but he didn't know how to use his brain. He didn't show how bad he was either. He always had a smile on his face, helped everyone and took part in volunteer work. His soul was such a huge black hole that no one could believe it. At last, the terrible moment arrived when there was no way out, at least not legally. Brett did not have any work around the house or paint the house on October 28, 2007. In the fall, there were almost no orders because everyone who wanted to paint their house had already done so in the spring or summer. Winter was coming, so you shouldn't expect to make a lot of money. We couldn't wait for anything. Brett put on all the old clothes in his closet, like a hat, a long sweater that his older brother had given him, and a scarf that his mom had nidged. The scarf was way too long and Brett had never worn it before, but it came in handy in the end. It fit around his face just right, leaving a small opening for his eyes. He then walked to the bank on the edge of his neighborhood. He walked funny on his right foot while holding a thick folder. Brett waited his turn at the bank. When an employee finally called for him, he went up to her and told her in a low voice that he had a gun on him. Besides that, he told her to get all the cash from the bank register and give it to him. If she didn't, he said, he would shoot her and kill her first. He took all the cash from the register from the girl, whose hands were shaking. Brett then quietly left the building so as not to alert the security guards. As he ran down the street, he looked at the money he had stolen. A little over $1,000 wasn't much. He would have to rob about 60 banks to pay off his debts. It sounds great, but there was no other way out. The new thief didn't show up at home for a few days because he thought the police would still be able to catch him. He drove all night in his car because he had an order in a nearby town, which he told his mother. Brett would sneak up on his house every once in a while to see if there was a police car in the bushes. He wasn't being looked for because it was quiet. He was going in the right direction, which was good. After the first theft, there were two more, then three more, and finally four. Every time, Brett changed clothes because he no longer wore his old ones. 
he either bought them used or found them in the trash. He burned the used clothes after each crime. A store that sold costumes for parties is where Brett also bought a beard. The bank workers he threatened always noticed his beard, and later said that the attacker was a man with a beard. Many articles were written about the bearded robber in Toronto newspapers, but the robber never made a lot of money from Heasts. $3,000 was the most that could be stolen. Brett finally made a mistake. He was followed all the way home by the police after seeing his car on surveillance footage. At that point, they still didn't have any direct proof that he was guilty. It was chosen to just keep going after the suspect. As if Brett knew he was being watched from outside, he didn't commit any more thefts for 15 days. Before that, he usually went three or four days without committing a crime. The police felt like they were going in the wrong direction and wasting time by suspecting someone who wasn't guilty. But finally, good luck came their way. After leaving the house, Brett got into a car and drove off. He got out of the car near the bank wearing a new strange outfit. He went into the branch and stayed there for a while. When he came out, he was met by police who handcuffed him and said that the much talked about bearded robber had been caught. Brett was being looked into for seven months. It was charged against him to rob with a gun. The bearded robber always came to the bank empty handed, even though he had a gun permit. He didn't even have a knife with him in. He was told he was guilty on 19 counts and sent to prison. After that, Brett and his family filed several appeals. Only eight of the 19 counts were upheld after this was done. Brett didn't stop there though. As soon as he had the chance to ask for parole, he did so. Brett asked that the fact that he committed these crimes while he was deeply depressed from two failed relationships and having a lot of debt be taken into account in his petition. But he also said again that he didn't bring any weapons to the crimes and wasn't planning to hurt anyone. His comments were taken seriously, but he had to meet with a psychologist in order to get out of jail early. It was good for Brett that the sessions helped him. While he was in jail, he didn't talk to his family. Now that he was out, he had taken a step toward getting closer to them and fixing things with them. The commissioners saw the changes for the better. Brett was finally freed on November 24, 2010. The young man had fought so hard for freedom, but it turned out to be even more bitter and hard than before. Brett, what was his name before? A painter who has a lot on his mind. What was he doing now? Brett, the thief. Brett is the former prisoner with such a bad past. He was never hired by a business, and people who hired him to paint houses turned him down as soon as they saw the suspicious beard. Even Susan's neighbors who used to visit and compliment her garden started to spread some bad rumors about her. The Ryan family sold their house quickly and moved to Scarborough. Susan got back to working in her new garden, and Brett did get a job with a trading company, but the pay wasn't great. His parents also gave him money to help pay for his college education again. Brett kept seeing a psychologist, and every time, the expert told him the same thing. Don't cut ties with your family. Brett's advice from the psychologist really helped, but his money situation still needed a lot of work. It was September 2011 when he had his first lucky excitant. His name is Kristen Bechter. Kristen was a really great girl. She had her own apartment with windows that look it out over the sea, so the young couple could enjoy the view. And most importantly, she didn't care about Brett's past. She played sports, which kept her body in shape. They also took trips together from time to time and had even been to Australia. While Brett was seeing the girl, his parents were very happy about his relationship with her. For another thing, they were sure that their son would finally grow up and find his place in society. Kristen would push him to do so. Brett thought things were getting better, but something bad happened that he couldn't change, which slowed down the start of a new phase. Brett was shocked when his father died. Brett started going to see a psychologist more often because his depression started to come back. He also had to help his mother with money, which he didn't have much of, and spend a lot of time with her. He had to build a long-term relationship with Kristen. The young people weren't teenagers, for whom it's enough to hang out and have fun. Brett decided to take a big step because he was deeply in love with this beautiful blonde. He had some money saved up and had told his mother that he wanted to start a family with Kristen. To do this, 
He knew he had to make her an offer she couldn't refuse. She would remember this day for the rest of her life. She understood what her son meant and gave him money to buy a ring. The couple had already talked about their plans for the future. And no, Kristen didn't need an expensive gift or anything like that. She only needed Brett to make a proposal for her to know that he was serious. He spent a lot of money, though, and got his love a gold ring with a big diamond. It was clear that Kristen would say yes. Then, as young people do, they started making plans for their wedding. Brett agreed with all of Kristen's choices and nodded his head. However, he was shocked by how much it cost and how much he had to think about his job. He looked on the internet for an engineering job opening at a big tech company, put together a resume, and sent it in. He did so well in the interview that they accepted him. At that time, Brett was glad. When he told his fiance and mother about it, they were thrilled. He then asked his mother for money to buy an expensive suit for work. Once more, his mother did not say no to her son. Brett got a call from the company after the suit was already bought to say they had to turn him down because the security service knew about his criminal past. Brett felt like thunder hit him. Right away, his mood started to get worse and he finally gave up. Why go through all of these interviews and wait for answers when no one wants to hire a criminal, even if they have changed? The most important question is, why study? Brett thought that the money his mother and older brothers gave him for college should be used for his wedding to Kristen, so that's what he did. Brett was back in the situation he had just gotten away from. Not only did he not tell his counselor, but he also did not tell his family that he had quit college. He also didn't tell anyone that an engineering job had turned him down. He dressed up with a shirt, tie, and suit, and went to paint houses. On the way, he changed his clothes. He told his family that he was at work in an office. Brett also constantly shared different photos from the office or business events on his social networks. Of course, these were downloaded from the web before. When he was with his family, he often pretended that his phone was ringing and that he had to get to work right away. No one would have thought Brett was just a normal painter because he was so good at getting dust in their eyes. Brett was going to get married in September 2016 after being with Kristen for five years. Even more, he agreed to rent a fancy restaurant where each guest would have to pay $100. Brett finally took matters into his own hands, got a great job, moved into a nice apartment, and married a beautiful woman. This made the whole Ariane family very happy. But they didn't know that Brett's lies had gone too far and there was no way out without getting hurt. That time the wedding was only a month away and it would cost a lot to put on. It happened over and over again. Our hero borrowed money from his mother. When he realized she could no longer help him, he told her she had to get a better paying job. Another thing he did was plan a bachelor party for August and invite all of his brothers and friends. Brett still chose to tell his counselor everything, even though the bombshell was about to go off. Brett had been telling his family lies for a year about being an engineer at a tech company. The psychologist felt bad that the client he had been working with for a long time had gone off track again. He told Brett that he had to tell his mom the truth. Brett put it off for a long time and thought about it for a long time. His mom was so mad because she had spent so much time telling everyone what a great son she had. Brett had to tell Kristen everything too because she would keep quiet if he didn't. Her son was warned that his brothers already knew what was going on and were on her side. Brett was not able to do that. He had a hard time telling his mother the truth, and he couldn't tell Kristen the lies he told her. He did know that the wedding wouldn't happen because he lied about it being less than a month away. It would have been better for Kristen to know everything ahead of time, but he didn't say anything. Brett's plans weren't clear, and he couldn't help but worry that his mother would really tell his fiance everything, which would mean that the scandal would have to happen. Brett shook every time Kristen's phone rang, he stopped breathing for a moment when he realized it wasn't his mother calling, but a friend of his future wife, asking about her wedding plans and giving her advice. He finally found a way to permanently shut up his mother. Brett was not allowed to have guns after being found guilty of robbery. That's why the boy chose to use a crossbow as the best way to carry out his plan. Also, it's a pretty quiet way to kill someone. Brett's late father liked to shoot crossbows at targets in the garden 
and he taught Brett how to do it. He did hit the targets well, but his late father probably didn't think he would use that skill in that way. Brett got the crossbow and arrows at a sporting goods store. He then hid them in Susan's garage behind some construction waste. He planned what he thought was a clever way to make up an alibi. He put a timer on the fan and tied a spoon to it. The fan turned on when the timer went off, and the spoon moved across the keyboard, sending comments that had already been written to YouTube. It must have looked like Brett had been at home all day, watching videos and leaving comments on them. Early on August 25th, Brett put on some strange clothes that covered his face. He then left the house through the back door to avoid the security cameras and took the train to his parents' house to get rid of anyone who could hurt him and Kristen for good. Susan was shocked when her son showed up out of the blue. That day, she wasn't feeling well, but Brett started to convince her again, even though his mother was sick. He even told her not to tell his future wife anything. The mother flatly turned him down. He got angry, and Susan knew something was wrong when she saw her son's angry eyes. She told him that she had already called Christopher, and he was on his way to help them. Brett was crazy. He ran to the garage and got a crossbow, but he was so angry and pumped up with adrenaline that he couldn't even shoot. He just hit his mother over the head with the gun. When he was sure she was dead, he wrapped the rope around her neck and put plastic bags over her body. Brett put some arrows in the crossbow and hid in the bushes until his brother came. Christopher finally showed up after some time and began calling for his mother or brother. As he did this, he was shot in the back of the neck, killing him within minutes. Alexander, the youngest brother, was the next person killed. It turns out that Susan also called him. He was also shot in the neck, but the arrow either didn't go very deep or didn't hit any important arteries. Alexander didn't die right away. He started to scream and call for help. Leland was inside the house, sleeping in his room on the second floor. He had no idea that his brother was killing people in the garage and garden. Leland woke up to the sound of screams and found Brett trying to choke Alexander downstairs. When Leland and Brett got into a fight, Leland quickly got the upper hand and pushed Brett aside. He then ran to the neighbors and called the police. Brett stayed home. He could not run away. At this very moment, he realized he had messed up his whole life. There was not anything to do. I asked Kristen to forgive him in a letter that he wrote on his phone. When the police got to the scene of the crime, they saw Brett, who was badly hurt, sitting next to his brother Alexander, who was also badly hurt but still alive. Alexander would later die in the hospital. When the police officer put his hands on him, Brett told them to take him to the station and he would tell them everything. He also said that his mother's body was buried under boxes in the garage, but no one could help her at the police station or during the trial. Brett told Susan that he didn't mean to kill her. His plan was just to scare her. On the other hand, he did plan to kill Christopher and Alexander that day, but only as witnesses. If they hadn't shown up, they would still be alive. That's how he tried to explain everything almost 10 years ago. He was depressed, but that didn't change the outcome of his sentence. It was important to the judge that Brett admitted to everything and didn't cause any problems for the police but the young man still got three life sentences, one for each murder, with the chance to get out in 2041. Leland isn't talking to reporters, but everyone in Toronto knows him as the only person who made it out of that horrible scene alive. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Samantha Fraser's case shows that a monster can't be re-educated, not even by a trained and experienced psychologist. When someone shows signs of being cruel, they should be left alone right away. People like that don't change, so they don't deserve a second chance. They are capable of the worst crimes and think they can get away with them. The terrible events took place in the summer of 2018 on Phillip, a quiet island in Australia close to Melbourne. But let's read the story in the right order. Adrian Basham was born in 1973 in Australia, where he grew up. The boy grew up in a family with a police officer. While he didn't do anything wrong in the eyes of the police in his early years, many people now believe that his cruel and violent attacks are linked to his family and childhood. 
When Adrian's father, James Basham, found out that his son had killed someone badly, he did not only not condemn him, but based on his experience as a police officer, he told him how to act to try to avoid getting in trouble. Samantha Fraser was born in the suburbs of Melbourne in the summer of 1980. Her parents, Janine and Travis Fraser, were friendly and loving, and they did everything they could to help their only daughter. They worked hard to help her learn and show off her skills. Samantha worked hard in school and played sports, and she consistently won awards for her outstanding performance. The girl then went to a well-known university and graduated with a red diploma from the psychology department. She kept doing sports like acrobatics, gymnastics, and dancing while she was in school, which helped her lead the student cheerleading team. After going to college, Samantha got a job as a psychotherapist at a large medical facility. Her co-workers and patients quickly came to respect and trust her. Samantha really loved what she was doing, and this job was her calling. Sam and Adrian met for the first time in late 2005. First, they were just friends, but soon, things turned romantic between them. Friends and family of this couple didn't understand what the two young people, who were so different in every way, had in common. Samantha was friendly, open, and nice, and she could always solve a problem in a peaceful way. Adrian, on the other hand, was very rude and harsh when he talked to people. He was also very angry and hostile. In spite of this, the couple made their relationship official a year and a half after they met. They bought a house in the suburbs of Melbourne, not far from where Samantha's parents live. Not long after, the man got a job with a big company that worked to develop mineral deposits. Because his job required him to go on business trips all the time, he wasn't at home very often. There's no doubt that this is why he and Samantha stayed married for so long. Adrian became a real tyrant at home and tried to control his wife in every way. He not only expected people to obey him without question, but he also did some strange things that might have been signs of a mental disorder. For instance, he insisted crazily that the house was always in perfect order, and this included both how clean it was and where everything was. It's small things like where the books are on the shelf or where the toiletries are in the bathroom. Any change could make him angry and violent right away. Samantha was a psychologist, so she knew how to make things better between people who were fighting. She hoped that her husband would change over time and become more calm and consistent. Along with that, they had three children together, two daughters, Jemima and April, and a son, Rex. But Adrian's character didn't change even when heirs showed up. In 2014, family problems led to physical abuse in another case. She then didn't say anything, didn't call the police, and didn't tell anyone what happened. People she cared about and her co-workers had no idea that her husband had put his hand on her. She was naive enough to think that this would not happen again. After a year though, the same thing happened again. Adrian hit his wife. Samantha chose that this time it was the last straw. Samantha was also going crazy because her husband was throwing temper tantrums all the time and wanted to control her every move. She told the police in writing that her husband had beaten her, and then she took the kids and moved in with her parents. They got a divorce in the spring of 2017, and Samantha and their kids were given the family home by the court. They soon went back there. But Adrian had no plans to leave his ex-wife alone. He kept after her, making her life miserable. The young woman was always afraid for her life and the lives of her children because she didn't feel safe. She went to court and got an order that her ex-husband couldn't talk to them or try to get involved in their business in any way. But that didn't stop Basham. He stayed nearby and did everything he could to bother Samantha. At least one of Adrian's friends said that he promised to take away from his ex-wife everything she cares about, from the house to the kids. He also openly threatened to hurt her physically. The man told his friend again not long before the tragedy that Samantha would soon pay for everything. He also seemed dangerous, but the friend didn't take what he said seriously until he heard that the woman had died. Because Samantha was always scared and tense, she put bars on her windows, put an alarm system in her house, and put surveillance cameras outside her house. The woman told him that she was scared that her ex-husband would break into her house and hurt her or the kids. Samantha started to think that her ex-husband had calmed down a bit, 
about a year after they got divorced. He disappeared from her view less often, which made her feel safer. Samantha even started an affair and made plans for a better, happier life. For Fraser's 38th birthday on July 22, 2018, she spent the day with close friends and a man she loves named Wayne. People who spent the holiday with her remember that she looked happy and in good spirits for herself and her family. A few days before the wedding, the man had proposed to the woman. After the wedding, they were going to take a long vacation and travel to forget about their problems. Samantha had already taken her kids to school the next morning and was on her way to work when she got a call from a friend telling her that Adrian was nearby. Samantha was worried about this, but she chose not to freak out and instead decided to be more careful. Her ex-husband was due to appear in court in a couple of weeks on charges of domestic violence. She was afraid that he would hurt her in some way because of the lawsuit. The woman told her best friend about her worries over the phone, but her friend reassured her. Samantha was never seen alive again after that talk. Samantha wasn't there to pick up her kids from school that day, so the teacher, who knew that things were tough in Samantha's family, called the police. The police went to their house right away to check on everything. At first, it looked like the mistress hadn't come back yet. But when the police of... The police chose to check the garage next to the house, which showed a very bad picture. The homeowner, who was 38 years old, was found dead hanging from the garage door chain. In general, the picture might have made it look like the young woman had killed herself, but Samantha looked like she had been hit by a truck. Samantha had not a single living thing on her and the hair on her head was wet and falling over her face. She wasn't wearing the clothes she had on when she left the house in the morning, and she didn't have any shoes on. It was clear that someone else had been in the garage, and they had tried to make it look like Samantha had died on her own. It did a lot of wrong things, though. Say, a broken-down stepladder was lying next to the body, but the rope was so long that the woman's feet were touching the ground. Samantha had deep bruises under her eyes and on her temple, she had scrapes and hematomas all over her body from falling down and hitting things. The forensic medical examination later showed that the deceased had a serious head injury, which means that she was either already unconscious or dead when she was hanged. Experts in forensics found blood and epithelial particles under the victim's fingernails. This means that she desperately fought back and scratched her abuser. A lot of blood and small splatters of blood had been washed up on the floor, walls, and body of the car in the garage. In later tests, blood was also found on the rope that the body was hanging from in several places. Adrian Basham rode his motorcycle to his dad James's house in the evening of the same day. He looked stressed, and there were new scratches on his face. When his father asked him about it, he dodged the question, and when asked about the cuts, he said that he got them from riding his motorcycle without a helmet and scratching himself with tree branches. Then he got a big pack of wet wipes and began wiping down his car, saying that he wanted to get rid of the gnats that had stuck to it during the ride. As a former police officer, his dad knew right away that something wasn't right, and his professional instincts were right. When police came to James's door the next day with questions about his son and said he was the main suspect in the murder of his ex-wife, James knew what was going on. In the beginning, Basham Sr. said that he had not seen his son. To buy some time, he then told the heir what he should say and do in order to, if not get out of jail, at least get less time. Adrian did what his father told him to do and listened quietly as the charges were read to him. He then went to the station with the help of the lawyers his father had already hired. At first, Adrian flatly refused to help with the investigation. He didn't say he wasn't guilty, he just didn't say anything and ignored all the questions. Still, the evidence that was gathered was enough. The investigators saw that the man had fresh scratches on his face and thought that Samantha had scratched him to protect herself. Blood and epithelial particles were found under her nails. There were also sweat marks on the rope that his ex-wife's body was hanging from. When Adrian's motorcycle was looked at, washed up blood from the dead person was found on it. A bloody woman's blouse was also found in a trash can outside his dad's house. It looks like he tried to get rid of that proof but didn't have time. Samantha put up cameras outside her house not long before the terrible event, and they caught a man leaving the crime scene quickly on the day of the murder. 
There was no doubt that it was Adrian, even though his face was hidden by a hood pulled over his baseball cap. Piece by piece, the events of the victim's last day were put back together, and the picture that was made was shockingly violent. Basham broke the lock on the garage door while no one was home and went inside. He waited for his ex-wife to come home for several hours. She didn't know it, but Samantha drove into Adrian's garage and he attacked her before she could get out. The scratches on the attacker's face show how hard Fraser tried to fight back, but the two sides were not equal. He beat the woman until she passed out. To hide his tracks, he took off her bloody blouse and put on a black t-shirt he found in the house. He then poured water over her head to clean the blood out of her blonde hair. He then hung his ex-wife from the garage door with a rope around her neck. He put a stepladder on the floor next to the body just to be sure, but he didn't figure out how long the rope was. Adrian cleaned up the blood spots, but he didn't get the small splatters that were all over the place. This blows my mind. A young mother of three who was loved by all was found dead in her own garage. Killer tried to make it look like the person died of their own free will, but there were many signs that it wasn't true. Samantha's body was also in a state that showed she had accepted martyrdom. The worst part was that the victim had been living with this man for a long time, put up with his emotional and physical abuse, and raised his children while hoping that he would change. Adrian changed his plan when he realized that neither denying nor staying quiet would help because all the evidence pointed to him. Basham said that he was at his ex-wife's house that day, but he only wanted to talk to her and persuade her to drop her domestic violence lawsuit. People say that the conversation went badly and that fists were used, but he said he left afterward and Frazier was awake and aware at the time. Lawyers for the defendant insisted that their client was only guilty of battery and that Samantha turned her life over after that. But Samantha's family says she would never do that and did not leave her kids. She also had big plans for her life and was going to get married again soon. The murder case didn't start until the end of 2022. Older children of the divorced parents went to the sessions and spoke out against their father and asked for a fair punishment. The youngest son didn't show up to court. He chose not to subject himself to unnecessary stress. Besides that, the boy was scared and panicked about his father. And the defense tried to show that the defendant did what he did because he was feeling bad, but this didn't work because Adrian planned the crime, waited several hours for his victim, and tried to get rid of evidence. The court didn't give its final decision on this case until February 2023. Adrian was found guilty of beating someone to death on purpose and given a life sentence without the chance of parole for at least 30 years. The children of Travis and Samantha Fraser were given to Jeanine and Travis Fraser as guardians. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. When we think about what makes a place great to live, we often think about how safe it is how nice the neighborhood is, and how friendly the people who live there are. One country meets all of the requirements. Iceland is an island nation off the east coast of Greenland that has been voted one of the best places to live in the world over and over again. Just over 340,000 people live there, making it one of the world's smallest cities. But its stunning natural beauty makes up for it in a big way. People come from all over the world to see the natural springs and rolling hills. People from all over the world come to this small country to see its many attractions, such as its beautiful architecture and the Aurora Borealis. Because Iceland has harsh winters, there isn't always a lot of sunlight, but that just adds to the mystery of the place, which is so different from what most of us know and understand. One of the most appealing things about Iceland is the friendliness, openness, and kindness of its people. Due to the tough terrain and harsh winters, people rely on each other, value community, and take care of their neighbors. There are strong social attitudes against crime. They have no army, and their police officers do not carry guns. People often leave their doors unlocked and get lifts with strangers. The peace and quiet of Iceland would be broken one Friday night in 2017 by a brutal murder that seemed to have no reason. The country would be left in shock. We are going to talk about Birna Briansdottir. 
Birna Brian's daughter lived in the southeast of Reykjavik. While her parents were no longer together, they remained on friendly terms, and she was the center of their world. She was bright and spirited, with her fiery personality reflected in her striking auburn hair. She was incredibly witty with a sharp sense of humor, which made her popular among her friends. She was carefree and whimsical, but always responsible, with this maturity reflected in her relationship with her family and her mature attitude toward work. Music was a big passion, and Berna wasn't picky. She would listen to anything from rap to pop and from rock to folk. It was this openness and free spirit that made so many people love her. Brina had a close group of friends and liked going out at night in Reykjavik. She worked in the fashion section of a busy department store. To relax, she would get drinks at the local bar after work and then go out to really let her hair down. For sure, this is what Berna did that night, January 13th, 2017. After closing the shop, she got drinks, played a few rounds of cards, and then went to the center of the capital to laugh, drink, and dance all night. They went to Horror, a place where new bands would play, and Berna was soon dancing on the stage. While her friends were ready to leave by 2 a.m., Berna wasn't. She wanted to keep having fun. She left the club just before 5 a.m. and walked out into the nine-degree weather. She then went to get falafel and then walked back to her house. A woman walking alone in Reykjavik was not rare. People trusted each other and looked out for each other. Due to her intoxication, she dropped coins and stumbled into a stranger on the side of the road. As she carried on walking, she turned a corner and walked down a narrow lane towards the sea. Then she vanished. Because she was known for being on time when she didn't show up for work, people were worried right away. Maria, a school friend who worked with Berna, was upset right away that she wasn't there. Hmm. It got worse when she tried to call her cell phone. It wouldn't work and Berna never turned off her phone. People thought she had just gone back to her dad's house to sleep off her hangover. Her friends who had been out with her that night also thought this, but she wasn't there. Scylla, Berna's mother, was called because she was also worried about where her daughter was. She knew Berna and knew that this wasn't like her at all, without waiting. Her family called the police right away to say she wasn't there. Realizing the power of social media, Scylla posted to her Facebook page, Dear friends, it's not like her that we can't reach her. Please share and let's find her, Scylla. Iceland is a small community, and before long, Scylla's desperate pleas on Facebook were being shared, and news of Berna's disappearance began to circulate. The stress and worry of having a child go missing are unimaginable. Her parents couldn't sleep, and they persistently made calls to all the emergency services, desperately seeking any new information on Berna's whereabouts. The following day, the police were able to trace her last known mobile interaction before it went dead or was turned off. Just before 6 a.m., her phone pinged off a mobile tower in a port town, Hafnarfjörder, six miles outside of the capital. Right away, Scylla got in her car and drove there, calling out to her daughter and looking around the area. A group of family and friends worked with her to get Berna back home alive. Soon, 36 hours had passed since Birna had disappeared into the night in Reykjavik. Her friends and family were sure that something bad had happened to her. She was a trustworthy young woman, and this was not like her at all. Not much was known to the police, though. There was no proof of a murder or kidnapping, so they couldn't do much. As word of her disappearance spread, it quickly made the front page of every newspaper. Every newscaster in Iceland talked about Berna all the time. Her face was on every newspaper page. In the early hours of Sunday morning, her parents went to the police and begged them to search for her. They said she would not have gone off on her own accord much less not told anyone where she was going. She had no money troubles or relationship problems. Everyone who knew Berna adored her. A case as baffling and unusual as this required Iceland's best detectives, one of which was Grim or Grimson. He had 30 years of investigative experience. He was even part of a special team who spent more than five years building a case against those whose misconduct and corruption contributed to the financial crash of 2009. After this, he returned to his roots as a police officer, saying he missed the fast-paced work. Like his colleagues, he too wasn't initially that concerned about Berna. 
there were many other factors that he had to consider. People do go missing in Iceland. Anything from mental health problems to simply staying at a friend's house and not telling people. Most missing people would eventually turn up. A lot of CCTV is set up in capital cities around the world, but Reykjavik isn't like most of them. The people of Iceland don't like being watched, and since crime isn't common, the people tend to police themselves. They watch out for each other and strangers, but someone saw her the night she went missing. CCTV showed her leaving the club with her coins in the ground and walking into a stranger. When Grimson checked the next camera less than a block away, she was gone. There were two options. Either she had gone down the side road off the corner or got into a car. Grimson paid close attention to the little things and he was sure that the broken CCTV footage held a clue that would lead them to Berna. The red Kaya Rio he saw was going the other way on the other side of the road from Berna. A short time after Berna had been seen at the Lebowski bar, he saw it drive by. The police had to follow up on this lead. What was next? They couldn't see the license plate, who was driving, or how many people were in the car. There were more than 100 of those kinds of cars in Iceland. This didn't make her parents feel better about their worries. Scylla was incandescent when they explained the quality of the tape was too poor to extract any more details from. Scylla said, can't you find it like in the movies? Grimson replied, it doesn't work like that. The police knew that even though they didn't have enough CCTV, the people in the area had hope. They asked the people of Iceland to help them. At a rare press conference, Grimson and Berna's upset family spoke in front of the cameras and begged Iceland to help them find her. In front of the media, Scylla showed what kind of person her daughter was by saying that she was very smart, bilingual, loved other cultures, and loved to travel. The police's hunch at the press conference would lead to a breakthrough. It proved right, and before long, they had their first lead. A pair of brothers decided to search Hafnarfjörder, where her phone had pinged off the tower, and when there, they headed towards the harbor. After searching in a fenced-off area, they found a pair of boots, Black Doc Martens, identical to the pair that Berna had last been seen wearing. Using the power of social media, they posted a picture of them to Facebook, and before long, the officers arrived. They confirmed the shoes were Berna's. The police finally felt like they were making progress. Grimson told the police to carefully look through the CCTV footage, and soon they saw a picture they knew. At 6 a.m. on the morning Berna went missing, a red Kia Rio pulled into the harbor. A drunk man got out of the car and stumbled toward a fishing trawler that had already been docked. After that, the car drove off. Finally, they were able to read the license plate. The car had been rented by Thomas Muller Olson, a 25-year-old fisherman from Greenland. A family had since rented the car and said there was a smell of chemicals coming from the back. After taking the car away, police were determined to find any sign of Berna. Eventually, they found a clue. There were blood spots in the back seat. So that they could find out if it was Berna, samples were quickly taken and sent to Sweden to be analyzed. For Grimson and his team, it was now a race against time. They needed to find the trawler and their only suspects, Thomas Miller Olson and Nikolai Olson. Thomas and Nikolai weren't related but were crewmates on the trawler. Thomas was considered easygoing, approachable, and generally likable while on board. His phone pinged and Thomas went pale. It was a news article saying that the ship he was on was linked to the disappearance of Berna. A journalist had contacted a Facebook group used by the men on board and asked who had rented the car and who was seen on the CCTV. Thomas was visibly shaken. His captain assured him if he was innocent, he would be fine. There was a huge challenge for Grimson and his team. The longer his suspects were on that boat, the longer they had to make up stories and get rid of anything that could be used against them. Not to worry, the ship's captain already had a plan. He read about the connection between the ship and Berna, so he turned the ship around and went back to Iceland. He and his top officers agreed that they would say the engine problems made them have to turn around and the suspects couldn't read anything about the case because the Wi-Fi was turned off. 
In order to catch them off guard, the police sent members of their elite counter-terrorism squad, also known as the Viking Squad, to board the ship as soon as it arrived back in Iceland. Finally, the police were able to catch their two suspects after dropping officers off from a helicopter on the ship. The reaction of the public to the case was massive, and the whole country was waiting on tenterhooks for any news of what had happened to Berna. The case seemed to take over all aspects of Icelandic life. Although their intentions were good, online sleuths only added to the confusion, and it became hard to distinguish rumor from fact. Stories ranged from a body being found in a lake to Berna and other women being found alive on the trawler swirled around social media. Grimson stayed calm and asked everyone else to do the same. People who meant well, though, were not helping the search for Berna. Around 11 p.m. on Wednesday, the ship came back into port and the two suspects were handcuffed and brought back to Iceland. Then the terrible news came out. Berna's blood was found in the rental car. It didn't take the police long to question the two men. Nikolaj and Thomas were sure they hadn't hurt Berna and they both told the same story about what happened that terrible night. They had split up and gone to different bars to drink before getting back together as the night was coming to a close. Nikolai was already very drunk, so it was hard for him to remember what they said. He had no idea who they were, but they said they had picked up two girls on the street, and one of them was Berna. Thomas said he left Nikolai at the ship and then drove off. Then he went to the back with the two girls and let them kiss. After an hour, he dropped them off. The police were inclined to believe Nikolai. He had been seen walking away and was clearly in no fit state to do anything. However, when it came to Thomas, they had a bad feeling and the evidence against him was stacking up. He was examined by a doctor who determined that the wounds on his chest were signs of a struggle or fight. When searching the ship, the police found a driver's license in the bin. It belonged to Berna. They also found drugs with a street value of nearly one and a half million pounds. Thomas claimed to have slept in the car, but the police checked the odometer, which showed that the car had been taken for a long drive. They also had CCTV on his person because he was seen buying plastic bags and cleaning fluid before cleaning the inside of the car. The police didn't believe his story that he was sick and just trying to clean the car because they knew the blood spots were Berna's. The back of the car lit up when they used luminol to bring out any blood that couldn't be seen with the naked eye. This showed that it was completely covered in blood. Four days after she vanished, Iceland launched the biggest search in its history. The search and rescue project manager said, today she is our sister, our daughter. And that became the mantra. We don't live in a society where we tolerate a 20 year old woman being abducted in the night. It wouldn't be long before the police found what they were looking for. A Coast Guard helicopter noticed something floating in the water near a local lighthouse and it was a body. They had found Berna. When this news came out, Iceland went into mourning and people were shocked and couldn't believe what they were hearing. Things like this only happened in movies and other places. In Iceland, they didn't happen. People in Greenland were shocked and saddened along with their Nordic neighbors. The main street in Reykjavik, where Berna had gone, was turned into a shrine with candles lit up. The funeral for Berna took place at the Hallegrim Skirkia, which is the country's largest church. Over 2,000 people, including the president and prime minister, were there. People needed answers from the police, and they had to give them. First, they had to figure out what killed the person. Berna had been found naked, but they could find no evidence of a sexual assault. The examiner found that she had suffered blunt force trauma to the head and had been strangled as well. However, the official cause of death was ruled as drowning. She had survived the initial attack and was alive when she was put into the water. Even though Grimson and his team looked at all the evidence, they couldn't find any link between Nikolai's death and the murder of Berna. They didn't think he had anything to do with it. He was freed after two weeks in jail and hours of questioning. They looked back at Thomas again his story hadn't changed, and he wasn't going to change it either. During nine interviews with the police, he insisted that he was not guilty. As more evidence came in, the police still couldn't figure out why Thomas would kill Berna, even though they had a crime scene and a suspect. His DNA was found on a lace of Berna's Doc Martens, 
and his fingerprints were on her old driver's license from March 30th, 2017. Breaking news alerts were spreading all over Iceland. The police had charged Thomas Miller Olsen with drug possession and murder. Media interest in the story reached a fever pitch as his trial began in August of that year. It was during his trial that he sensationally changed his story. He said that there were not two girls, only one, Berna. He claimed that he had left the car to go to the bathroom and Nikolai had driven off with Berna in the back seat. When he returned, she wasn't with him, shocking the court. He was now trying to pin the murder on his crewmate, admitting to the drug possession, but denying murder. At the end of September, the three judges found him guilty on all charges. He was then taken to start his 19-year prison sentence. When Thomas Miller Olson tried to appeal his conviction, the High Court upheld it. The next year, the High Court refused to look at another appeal. There was a lot of shock in Iceland when Berna Brian's daughter was killed. This case will be remembered. It changed us a bit. Our feeling of safety, the chaplain who led Berna's funeral said. More CCTV was put up around Reykjavik, and women became more cautious around strangers. Even though Grimson had been a police officer for 30 years, this was his first murder case. People in Iceland saw him as a hero because he was calm and coordinated. He is now proud to work for his country at the European Union's agency in The Hague for law enforcement cooperation. Even though Birna Brian's daughter's murder was a terrible event, her memory is still alive and the people of Iceland are determined that she will never be forgotten. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On December 20, 2017, a press conference was held during which Mark Perez, special agent in charge of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, announced a breakthrough in the disappearance of Mike Williams, a Tallahassee real estate appraiser who was originally presumed to have drowned while duck hunting on Lake Seminole. An alligator ate him on December 16, 2000. The truth is that Mike Williams did not drown in the lake. I can tell you that because I am here now. Perez said. Animals that eat people did not eat him. He didn't leave his wife and 18-month-old daughter behind when he left town. He was killed. We can't say more about it yet because the investigation is still going on, but I'm happy to say that. This morning, investigators told the Williams family about new information they had found in the case. Today's story is about love, betrayal, cheating, and greed, but it's also about a mother who has been strong for 17 years and four days. Mike's mom, Cheryl Williams, didn't believe that her son had drowned in Lake Seminole. She pushed hard for police to look into her son's disappearance. And she really thought that the people who did it would be punished, even when no one else did. Either he was alive or he was dead. I chose to believe he was alive, and I think that's what helped me, Cheryl said on December 20th, 2017. A lot of people told me I was crazy, but we would never have found him if I gave up. Brian Winchester was given a 20-year prison sentence the day before the press conference. He was a close friend of Mike and his wife Denise, and later married Brian. In a strange way, those who did what happened got what they deserved when the truth came out in 2000. Mike's mother was right. In 1997, Brian and Denise started having an affair, which turned into a murder. After a few years, they went from being lovers to strangers who didn't trust each other. Brian was afraid that Denise would tell the police about what happened to Mike after the divorce, so he beat her up. On the other hand, Denise did everything she could to get him a life sentence. When she asked the jury for the harshest sentence, she was very convincing. Because of this, Brian felt he had nothing to lose, so he made a deal with the prosecutor. In 2017, Brian got 20 years in prison for kidnapping Denise Williams. He avoided getting a life sentence, though. Denise was happy about the win and didn't know that Brian Winchester, 49, actually agreed to plan the murder and a 17-year cover-up of it in exchange for not being charged with any crimes related to his part in the case. In exchange, he showed police where Mike's body was and told them the whole truth. In just a few months, on May 8, 2018, Denise Williams would be caught and charged. Things look a little fuzzy at first glance, don't they? Let's look at this case in more depth. 
She was born on October 16, 1969, in Bradfordville, which is north of Tallahassee. His father drove a bus and his mother taught kindergarten. He was known as Mike by family and friends. His family didn't have much money, and he and his older brother lived in a trailer as kids. Those were good times. Because the parents cared about their son's future, they didn't build a house. Instead, they saved money for both boys' college education and worked part-time in supermarkets at night. The sons signed up to go to North Florida Christian High School. Mike did great. He played soccer, led the student council, and was active in the key club. Mike began duck hunting as a hobby when he was 15 years old, and that's how he met Denise Merrill. It was a girl who played soccer and was president of the student council. As a cheerleader and council secretary, Denise met him and started dating. Their friends thought they were a great match while they were still in high school. Denise put Mike in touch with Brian Winchester, who became his best friend. Katie Thomas became Brian's friend after a while, and the two couples stayed friends for the rest of Mike's life. Following high school, Mike went to Florida State University and majored in both political science and urban planning. The lovers graduated at the same time. Denise went to school to become a public accountant, and Mike learned how to value real estate. Mike did a good job at work. His job went well, even though he worked 15 hours a day most of the time. The young well-off man married Denise in 1994. Around this time, Brian also got married to Kathy. They all stayed in close contact with each other. Mike was very energetic and loved his wife very much. He worked hard to provide for their family as best he could. Mike Williams had a lot of success as a real estate appraiser when he was 31 years old. He was making almost $200,000 a year. In 1999, they had a happy child and were able to afford a house in a small, nice neighborhood on the east side of town. The name they gave their daughter was Ansley. His friends told me that he was always smart. The young man was doing some pretty dangerous things, so he wanted to make sure that his family would be taken care of if something went wrong. It was no surprise that Mike went to his best friend, who worked as an insurance agent at the time. Brian sold him two insurance policies, the first for $250,000 and the second for $500,000. Mike's dad died in the year 2000. Williams was shocked by how quickly this happened that he turned to a friend again to get money for his family. For $1 million, Brian helped Mike make sure he would live. Denise says that the loving father of the family had almost $2 million in life insurance about six months before he went missing. They were married on December 16, 2000. Her husband got up early to go duck hunting on Lake Seminole, a big lake that is connected to the Apalachicola River. Today was their sixth wedding anniversary and they had planned to spend the night in Apalachicola, a small town on the bayou. Mike's wife and daughter were waiting for him at home at noon, but he never came back. Of course, Denise was worried, so she called her dad, who then called Brian Winchester, Mike's best friend. Brian drove to Lake Seminole with his dad. They found Mike's Ford Bronco car near the boat dock, but Mike wasn't there. There was no boat to be found, so the men called the police. They looked in all the places Mike liked to hunt. Police from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission were called to help look for Mike. After a few hours, a helicopter pilot saw the boat drifting away from the boat ramp about 225 feet. The boat was searched, and Mike's shotgun was found still in its case. It looks like he never got to use it. The search turned into a mission to save lives. People in the area thought that the reservoir used to be an orchard before the three rivers were dammed up to make the lake. The lake was named Stumpfield because there were so many stumps left. The water level had stumps that stuck out above and below it. Because of this, any motorized boat in the area had to be handled carefully. People looking for Williams thought he hit a stump on his boat, fell out, and went under the water. His wading boots filled with water and he probably drowned when he couldn't get out. A dive team from Montgomery, Alabama, and the Jackson County Sheriff's Office were among the other groups called in to help, but the thorough search turned up nothing. Mike was never found. After a week, the search for bodies turned into a rescue operation. Dogs were brought to the site, and probe poles were given to the teams to use to look into the lake's bottom. Ten days into the search, 
people found a hunting hat with a camouflage pattern that could not be linked to Williams. Fish and Wildlife Conservation officials in Florida thought that Mikey's body had been eaten by alligators, which is why it couldn't be found. Most of the alligators that lived in the lake were male. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement agreed with this theory because they didn't see any signs of a violent death. The search was over after five weeks. Denise held a memorial service for Mike the day after the search was over. This was less than two months after the alleged accident. Everyone thought Denise was okay with losing her husband, but Mike's mom wasn't. In June 2001, six months later, an angler found wading boots floating in the lake. Divers searched the area around the lake and found a light hunting jacket and flashlight at the bottom. Williams had signed and written on a hunting license that was in one of the jacket pockets. The find made a lot of people wonder. There were no teeth marks on the hunting jacket or the boots that would have been made by an alligator. The things that were found didn't look like they had been in the water for six months. The flashlight still worked and the boots weren't slimy. But after a week, Denise's lawyer asked the court to declare Mike Williams dead based on the things that had been found. He said that alligators and other animals that live in water had eaten the body whole and the motion was granted. The death certificate said Mike drowned while duck hunting on Lake Seminole on December 16, 2000, which was an accident. The body hasn't been found yet. For Mike Williams, this is how things might have turned out if Cheryl Williams hadn't given up and kept looking for her son. All I know is that I can't stop looking for him until I find him, she stated. Cheryl's efforts made things very difficult between her and her ex-sister-in-law. Denise told her to stop looking and face the truth. She told them, I'm sick of reading about Mike's disappearance. I just want to move on with my life. If you keep pushing this investigation, you will never see your granddaughter again. Denise kept her word, and Cheryl couldn't give up on her son. If the mother hadn't been so determined, her son's story might still be at the bottom of a dark, algae-covered lake. Three years passed before Cheryl Williams could get the police to start looking into what happened to her young son. Cheryl will tell you years later, I called, put up signs, wrote to the governor of Florida every day, put together my notes into an evidence book, asked people to post on social media, and talked to reporters about my missing son. The mother was so determined that she finally called alligator expert Matthew Oresco. In his answer, he said that alligators don't eat in the winter because it's too cold. The water temperature drops when it's cold, so alligators don't eat in the winter. They only keep their bodies at the right temperature. Alligators don't care about food at all when it's 14 degrees outside. Oresco also wrote that forensic evidence is always left behind after an alligator kills an animal. After three years, Cheryl Williams finally got the police to drop the crazy alligator theory and start a real investigation into her son's disappearance. Investigators decided that Williams' death was not an accident after learning some little-known facts about what alligators eat, talking to people, and looking at some official records. All the police agencies working on this case agree with my gut that Mike did not drown in Lake Seminole, said Ronnie Austin, who used to work as an investigator for the Second District State's Attorney's Office and prosecuted Mike's case. At first, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Agency took over the case because Williams was thought to be a hunter who had gone missing. Police spent 735 hours looking for the body in a 10-acre area of the lake, but they didn't look for any signs of wrongdoing. The Jackson County Sheriff's deputies who were brought in to help with the search also didn't look at any other options. Investigators talked to everyone who helped with the search. Years later, police officer David Arnett, who was at the scene that day, said that some things seemed odd right away. Williams didn't usually hunt alone. His truck was found in an undeveloped area from which he would have had to drag the boat over mud, not on the nearby concrete boat launch. He usually used. The terrible storm that night should have pushed the boat to the east shore, but it was found on the west shore. The boat's motor wasn't running, but it was full of gasoline. If Mike had been driving the boat and fell out of it, it would have continued to float in circles until it ran out of gas. Sadly, law enforcement started to doubt too late that they were dealing with a straightforward drowning. A lot of volunteers and searchers had already walked all over the crime scene. A car that could have been a clue was taken by the family without any checks being made. 
possible witnesses were not found. When police learned that Winchester had divorced his wife Kathy and married Denise, they became suspicious of both Denise Williams and Brian Winchester. They also found out that Denise got an unexpected windfall of almost $2 million from the life insurance policy of her late husband. Investigators found that Winchester was the one who sold Mike the policy. They also thought it was odd that Denise, Mike's wife, didn't want to be involved in the investigation and tried to stop Cheryl from doing anything, even telling the grandmother she couldn't talk to her granddaughter. They were called in for questioning in 2005, but it didn't add anything new to the investigation. Brian made up an excuse for what happened the morning of the disappearance of Mike Williams. Based on what his ex-wife Kathy said, he was 60 miles from the lake and in bed at home. He told her that he had planned to go hunting with his dad in the morning, but had slept in instead. Even questioning Denise didn't turn up any new clues. In 2008, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement said they didn't think Mike's disappearance was an accident and that they thought he had been robbed. Unfortunately, they can't bring charges because there isn't enough evidence. We have suspicions, but we need proof, Cheryl Williams said after another investigation failed to find out what happened to her son. She did not give up, though. Because of her work, the Discovery Cable Channel did a story on Mike's disappearance and the investigations that followed. By late 2011, Cheryl had lost faith in the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and thought it was either not capable of solving the case or not interested in doing so. Since 2012, Mike's mother has sent Governor Rick Scott about one letter a day, asking him to either give the investigation to another agency or name a special prosecutor to do it. Over the course of nine years, Cheryl wrote 2,600 letters to the governor. Brain and Denise broke up after Denise caught him cheating on her in 2012. After a few more years, Denise asked for a divorce. An evaluation of the old family home was to happen. After that, not even property issues would hold them back. This event changed the course of Mike's case. Brian and Denise didn't want to get a divorce, but they also didn't want to stay together. They fought all the time, and the Williams investigation made fun of them. Brian called Denise, but she stopped calling him back. He was too stressed to handle it. Denise left her house on August 5, 2016, to drive to work at Florida State University. That day, a real estate appraisal was due because of a court order. She saw someone get into the back seat of her car while she was on the phone with her sister. Winchester was the one it was. Denise was told to keep going straight ahead by Brian, who put a loaded gun to her ribs. He said he had to do it because she wasn't home when he called. Denise tried to make Brian feel better, agreed with everything he said, and said she would give him a chance to save their marriage. Brian thought so. He got out of the car after Denise told him she wouldn't call the police to report what he had done. The brown sheet of plastic, the bleach sprayer, and the tools were with him when he left. As time went on, it became clear that Denise had miraculously lived. Denise called the fire department. Brian was quickly arrested and charged with kidnapping, which in Florida is a first-degree felony with a maximum sentence of life in prison. Besides that, he was charged with assault and armed burglary. The judge decided that Brian should stay in jail without bail. Cheryl Williams said she was hopeful that this new information would help solve the mystery of where her son went. Brian will not leave Denise with all the cash by herself. I pray that he will tell us what really happened, she told the New York Daily News. Brian did tell, and he was able to get a very good deal from the prosecutor that kept him from getting a life sentence at first. Brian started his story by saying, I think we were all doing really well, but I wasn't a good husband. I found a note in my first wife Kathy's purse one day and knew she was cheating on me. I was after revenge. Denise and Mike and I often went to bars and concerts together. Denise and I had been friends since high school. I've never really liked her, but after Kathy cheated on me, I changed how I felt about other women. Brian and Denise started seeing each other in October 1997. What started as drunk sex at a rock concert quickly turned into regular secret meetings. We started getting together at hotels during the workday and did so whenever we could. Brian said he didn't want to get a divorce. Denise made it loud and clear that she would never leave her husband. 
She cared about what other people thought, and she didn't want to share custody of her daughter. Over time, the relationship grew into more than just meeting up for sex. Denise and Brian sent each other gifts and love letters because they saw themselves as a couple. It was clear that things could not keep going this way. They couldn't live without each other, and Denise didn't want them to get a divorce. It wasn't okay to hurt her image of a religious woman. Around this time, Mike almost died in a hunting accident, but Brian saved him. Denise saw an escape route all of a sudden. After the deal with the prosecutor is over, Brian will tell us the year 2000, which will lead us to talk about how Mike and Kathy died. For Denise, she wanted everything to be blamed on me and not on her. She also wanted it to be an accident instead of a murder so she could deal with it. Brian and Denise chose a boating accident after thinking about other options. By doing this, they planned the murder to get the most money from Mike's life insurance policy. They both knew that Mike had to be killed before the end of December 2000, when one of the three policies ran out. The plan was set. Brian told his friend that he had found a great place to hunt on the shores of Lake Seminole. Mike planned to go with Brian and get back home by noon so he could spend his anniversary with his wife. I told him that we were going to go to a special place and that he absolutely had to bring his wading boots with him. I had to make sure he took them with him because it was believed that if you fell overboard in wading boots, you would drown very quickly. The plan was to make death look like unplanned drowning. Brain pushed Mike out of the boat once they were in the water. He almost drowned, but he climbed up on the stumps and started wading through them to get to the shore. Brian became scared. I didn't know what to do. Mike started calling loudly for help. I didn't know how to get out of this situation. I had a shotgun. I was panicking, and I shot him in the head. I didn't think about what I was doing. Things didn't go according to plan, and I needed to cover up what happened. There was hardly any time left. I should have been back home by now and getting ready to go hunting with my father-in-law. No one knew I was at the lake with Mike, so I decided it would be best for me to drive home and pretend like I had overslept. I drove home and hoped that Kathy was still asleep. Katie was asleep. My phone was on the floor. I went to bed, called my father-in-law and apologized. Brian did all he could to make an excuse for himself. Then he concealed the corpse. Denise didn't know that Brian had killed Mike with a gun and buried him. He tried to tell her, but she didn't want to hear him. She was happy that her husband was dead. For as long as Denise lived, she thought that God had kept him from swimming out and let him drown. Brian says that they promised each other that they would never talk to each other again. It was okay for Denise and Brian to do what they did because they said Mike was killed because they couldn't live together. Brain would say in court, we said the money was just the cherry on top. It turned out that Brian was the one who put down the hat, boots, flashlight, and license. First, he had to keep the searchers from leaving a lake. Then, he had to find a reason to declare Mike dead so Denise could get insurance. Usually this takes five years, but the lovers got it done in seven months with social security and other benefits added in. Denise got around $2 million. Denise Williams was charged with first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and accessory to a felony on May 8, 2018. She could get life in prison if found guilty. Denise said she wasn't guilty of all three charges. She was given a life sentence in prison in February 2019. Five months later, Ansley, Mike, and Denise's daughter got all of her late father's property and the insurance money that Denise was owed. Denise Williams appealed her conviction and life sentence in January 2020. Her lawyer told Florida's First District Court of Appeal that there was no proof that she had anything to do with the murder. In November 2020, the murder conviction was thrown out, but the 30-year sentence for planning to kill someone was kept. Denise is being held at the Florida Women's Reception Center right now. When she gets out, she will be 78 years old. To serve the rest of his sentence, Brian Winchester was sent to the Madison Correctional Institute in Florida. His current date to be freed is July the 30th, 2036. He'll be 67 years old. The daughter of Mike and Denise, Ansley, says her mother is not guilty and blames Brian Winchester. The woman wouldn't talk to any reporters about the case or her personal life. 
Cheryl and Nick Ansley's uncle says that they haven't been able to get in touch with Ansley. Cheryl is very sorry that she lost both her son and her granddaughter. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Limer Township, named after the first settler William Evans, is one of thousands of small and cozy towns scattered across the country in January 2023 in the state of Pennsylvania. A measured and quiet life flows here, and nothing appears to disturb this harmony. The inhabitants of such places know each other by sight, and their friendships unite many of them into one family. Jennifer and Blair's friendship began while they were working as business partners on joint projects. Even after Blair decided to become a simple chef, their bond remained strong. Their friendship developed beyond the confines of business and became more than just a working relationship. Jennifer's friendship with Noah, her autistic eight-year-old son, took on added significance. Blair had always shown his friend genuine concern and assistance in caring for Noah. Their children were friends as well. They frequently spent time together, and when the children's games ran late, Noah would spend the night at the Watts house. Jennifer Brown, born in 1979, was a vibrant and active woman. She was always smiling and exuded a positive energy that spread to everyone around her. Friends and family often wondered how she managed to do so much and be so active. Her true calling, however, was motherhood. Nothing was known about her son Noah's father, but this situation did not overshadow their lives. On the contrary, it strengthened Jennifer. Taking care of her young son, Jennifer became a reliable support and best friend for him, especially after Noah was diagnosed with autism in early childhood. Mom and son were inseparable friends who spent a lot of time together, sharing happy moments and helping each other in times of need. Everyone who knew them felt tenderness and admiration for them because of their friendship. The people of the small town noticed their closeness and admired this family for their joy and genuine kindness. Unfortunately, none of them could have predicted what happened to Jennifer on January 3, 2023. She vanished without a trace. The Limerick Township Police Department received a disturbing call from Antonio Blair Watts Richardson on the morning of January 4, 2023. He was deeply concerned about his close friend's disappearance, despite the fact that it had only been less than 24 hours since he had last seen her or heard her voice. His anxiety was growing by the minute. Tony had been attempting to contact Jennifer for several hours and had received no response. This was completely unlike her. She was always active and responsible, always answering calls or messages, especially when it came to her son Noah. However, for some reason, the boy's mother did not meet him after school on this particular day. The missing person's family and friends knew what a loving mother and caring woman she was. As a result, her sudden disappearance alarmed everyone who knew her and left no one indifferent. Antonio's 911 call was the first step in a long and mysterious investigation that would soon engulf and shake the entire city. A massive search was launched immediately after Blair reported his girlfriend missing. Police officers, family members, and friends banded together in the hope of uncovering any evidence that could shed light on Jennifer's disappearance. Many questions remained unanswered, the main one being what could have caused the caring mother to abandon her son without explanation. Officer Stephen Crawford of the Limerick Township Police Department went to the Brown family's home at 4 p.m. that afternoon to see what was going on. He discovered her vehicle parked by the porch of the family home. When he entered the house, he discovered that her keys, purse, tablet, and work cell phone remained. The officer, however, was unable to locate Jennifer's personal cell phone. When police attempted to locate it, it was discovered that the phone had been turned off at 7 or a.m. on January 4th and has not been found since. The last location where the signal was received was near Lewis Road and Ridge Pike in Limerick. This was the investigation's first significant lead, and it indicated that something terrible had happened to Jennifer. She was reported missing, and police began an investigation. Investigators began questioning Jennifer's family friends and neighbors, 
hoping to learn if anyone saw or heard anything around the time she went missing. However, none of the young woman's loved ones or acquaintances could offer any useful information. Jennifer's Aunt Diane Brim, as well as her friends Tiffany Barron and Blair Watts, claimed that the young mother would never have left her son alone. This was a woman who was completely devoted to her child. All efforts by authorities and volunteers were futile. They couldn't find any traces or clues to Jennifer's whereabouts. Her family members appealed to the public via the media for any information on the young woman's possible whereabouts. A prize was set up, but it was also inconclusive. Jennifer Brown's mysterious disappearance was just getting started, leaving investigators and family members with questions and anxious expectations. The police investigation began with a thorough examination of all of the events of that day, and her close friend Blair Watts, who was the last person to see Jennifer alive that day, was brought to the forefront. Jennifer and Blair sat in their cozy living room on an ordinary January day, discussing life, future plans, and their children. Their children frequently played together, and Jennifer had asked Afreen to pick up her son Noah from school so that they could spend the evening together. This was a common occurrence among friends. Blair, being the loyal friend that he was, agreed and immediately headed to the school to pick up Noah after they finished their conversation. But then something strange happened at school the next day. Noah's behavior was unusual, which worried his teachers. They discovered that the boy had missed two doses of his medication, which helped him manage his illness-related condition. Jennifer had always been a devoted mother never neglecting her son's caregiving responsibilities and always keeping in touch with teachers if anything went wrong at school. The school staff attempted to locate his mother and were informed by Noah that she had gone to the grocery store and had not returned. This raised even more concerns because the sensitive woman's behavior was out of character. She never left her son alone. Jennifer's friend Blair Watts tried unsuccessfully to contact her at the same time. Blair decided to go to the bus stop to pick up her son after not hearing back from Jennifer or contacting her. However, when the woman failed to appear and Blair's concern grew by the minute, he was forced to go to the police station and report his friend missing. As time passed, no new information about the missing woman's whereabouts emerged. Hopes for her return had been fading with each passing day since the investigation began. Jennifer appeared to have vanished without a trace and might never be found. However, two weeks after her disappearance was reported, on January 18th, two employees working in a warehouse near Roseford in the neighboring municipality of Limerick Township discovered something strange. They came out of the building to get some coffee and noticed a freshly dug hole in front of them. When they are, they were horrified to discover the body of a woman buried in a shallow grave when they went closer to inspect it. The workers immediately called the cops who arrived at the graveyard. After examining the body, police identified Jennifer Brown as the young woman they had been looking for for the past two weeks. The sheriff called her family to inform them that the body of the missing woman had been discovered partially buried near a warehouse in Roseford. Jennifer's death was clearly violent, according to an autopsy. Her death was caused by asphyxiation and she suffered from three broken ribs. This indicated that Jennifer had most likely fought her assailant, who had beaten her to subdue her. The investigation's focus has shifted. The missing person case was reclassified as a murder investigation, and police interviewed everyone who knew the murdered woman, including her family and friends. These interviews, however, provided no new information about the case, and the police had no suspects. The investigation appeared to be coming to an end, and the police had no one to follow up on. However, when the detectives least expected it, they received a tip from an unexpected source. After the news of Jennifer's disappearance and murder broke, police asked anyone with information that could help them solve this mysterious case to come forward. Noah's teacher stood up. She recalled a case that, at first glance, appeared unimportant to her, but raised serious suspicions after Jennifer's death was discovered. Noah, according to the teacher, told her an important detail about Jennifer's disappearance on January 4th. Little Noah told her that when Blair Watts picked him up from the bus stop on January 3rd, he noticed his mother's personal cell phone among Blair's belongings. Noah recognized it right away, 
because the lock screen displayed his own childhood photograph. That moment proved crucial in the investigation into the young woman's murder. Investigators had previously assumed that Jennifer's killer had taken her cell phone. Blair Watts was thrust into the spotlight as the prime suspect. The police began to investigate Jennifer and Blair's relationship and mysterious details began to emerge, shocking even experienced investigators. Jennifer and Tony's friendship appeared to be strong and long-lasting. They spent a lot of time together, got to know each other well, and their families interacted. However, once the business side of their relationship was revealed, it was revealed that there was a dark history lurking beneath the mask of friendship. Blair Watts was the owner of the Bird's Kitchen restaurant, which unfortunately fell into disrepair and closed in early 2022. Blair then turned to his friend and asked for her assistance. Jennifer decided to invest in her friend's business in August 2022 in order to help him reopen Bird's Kitchen in a new location. They agreed to a contract in which Jennifer agreed to make regular financial contributions to the restaurant every six weeks or so. Jennifer handed over approximately $36,000 to Blair between August and January to rebuild the business, according to Blair. They also agreed that she would give him an additional $99,000. Blair was to find a new location for the restaurant, deposit some of the money as rent, and enter into a contract to reopen Bertie's Kitchen in January 2023, according to their agreement. However, it was discovered that the funds allocated for the investment were spent on Blair's personal needs. His failure to fulfill his financial obligations was brought to the attention of the property owners with whom he had entered into the agreement. As a result, they terminated their agreement with him on December 26, 2022. Blair found himself in an impossible situation. He not only lost his money, but also the chance to open his restaurant. The police began to suspect that he had decided to commit a heinous crime in order to save his business out of desperation. Investigators discovered two unauthorized transfers of $177,000 to Bertie's Kitchen on January 3rd, after closely scrutinizing Jennifer's iPad's financial transaction history. The funds were not included in Brown and Blair's formal agreement. Furthermore, the transfers failed several times and were only successful after the iPad's two-factor authentication system was disabled, pointing to Jennifer's friend's involvement in her murder. The owners of the property who had terminated their lease with Blair were then interviewed by police. On January 4th, the day Blair reported Jennifer missing, he appeared in front of them, claiming to have the funds to enter into a lease agreement. Blair was identified as the murderer by investigators. They needed irrefutable evidence because they knew he would never admit his guilt. Their first step was to question Blair's wife, Tiara Taylor, about where Blair was on the day Jennifer vanished. Tiara told detectives that Blair paid a visit to the Brown family on January 3rd, around 1 p.m., and didn't arrive home until 4.30 a.m. when he picked Noah up from the bus stop. Tiara also claimed that her husband returned home briefly before leaving around 5 p.m. and didn't come back until late that night. This time frame became crucial. Further investigation revealed that Blair had spent the night with his mistress, Tatiana Garrett, and did not return to her until around 8 p.m. This meant Blair had no alibi between 5 Oz and 8 p.m. Detectives assembled an alleged chronology of the murder based on the available evidence. Blair went to Jennifer's house around 1 p.m. on January 3rd, while Noah was at school, according to their version, and allegedly murdered her. He then transferred funds from the murdered woman's iPad to his account and left around 4 p.m. to pick up Noah from the bus stop. He later returned to Jennifer's house, dropped off Noah, and returned to the crime scene to dispose of the body. He buried the body in a shallow grave in a field near Roseford. The killer then went to Tatiana's house, where he spent the rest of the night. Everything was meticulously planned, and it appears that the murderer might have gone unnoticed if it hadn't been for one fatal mistake. That blunder was allowing Noah access to his mother's cell phone. That was the decisive moment that led the cops straight to Blair. Law enforcement now had enough evidence to convict Blair, but they decided to conduct additional investigations to determine his guilt. 
It required the participation of film experts, as well as a specially trained dog capable of detecting cadaveric odors indoors. First, the dog was brought to Jennifer's house to learn the scent of the woman. The terrible crime had occurred in her own kitchen. The dog was then directed to Blair's car, where it immediately detected the same depressing odor. It was the final piece of evidence needed to convince detectives that Blair was involved in the murder. Blair was arrested and charged with first-degree murder, third-degree murder, and theft on February 8th, after months of investigation. He is currently incarcerated at the Montgomery County Correctional Facility without bail and awaits a preliminary hearing in which he will have to answer for his heinous actions in front of the law. Jennifer's friends and family were devastated when she was discovered dead. However, the pain and shock that the killer was someone they knew and trusted, someone who should have been a close friend to Jennifer and her son, continue to pierce their hearts. However, now that the murderer has been identified and apprehended, they can finally feel that justice has been served. During the interview, Tiffany Barron, a friend of Jennifer's who spoke on her behalf, expressed her feelings. I still dream about Jennifer, and Noah keeps asking about my mom, and I don't know what to say. If Blair is found guilty at the end of the investigation and trial, he will be imprisoned for the rest of his life. Jennifer's eight-year-old son's keen observation helped solve the case. The boy noticed a mistake made by the murderer, which aided in the discovery of the truth and the punishment of the criminal. The Limmer Township tragedy serves as yet another reminder that even the most meticulously planned crimes will be solved sooner or later. Meanness and inhumanity will not go unpunished, and the perpetrators will be brought to justice before the law sooner or later. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Detective Jeremy Ogden from the Hobart, Indiana Police Department gazed upon a manuscript that had kept him busy for months. It revealed an emotionally wrenching tale involving 53-year-old Christopher Reagan's tragic story. Born in Detroit, Michigan, and receiving his education there, Christopher decided at the age of 20 to join those willing to protect their country by enlisting as an active duty soldier. Upon being accepted into service with honor and devotion by standing guard over citizens' peace, he forever changed his destiny with his choice to join. Christopher was sent to a military base near Marquette. While there, fate brought Christopher together with Terry from Iron River. Their friendship developed over time after meeting as young people often do on city streets. Shy people may hesitate to say hello, but they eventually began walking together and became closer friends over time. They remained close for years since Christopher's service prevented any chance for more meaningful relationships to form between them. At one point, Chris decided to leave military service and move to Traverse City, located nearby but far from where his beloved lived. But this did not become an obstacle to their feelings. On the contrary, communication became even stronger between them. Christopher proposed to Terry that they start an extended romantic relationship, knowing each other for years but never violating any boundaries or ethical rules. She readily agreed, and their long-distance romance began shortly afterward. Soon enough, Christopher and Terry realized they shared many interests, from appreciating nature to preferring an organized lifestyle to yearning for peace. Iron River became their ideal location, and they decided to move together. Christopher moved in with Terry while finding employment at a factory producing parts for military ships. Soon enough, he even had subordinates who reported directly to him. Life was finally looking bright, but after two years, complications arose in their relationship. With passion slowly diminishing as Christopher and Terry failed to address its difficulties, it eventually became evident that this could not continue, and they took the difficult decision to part ways peacefully and remain friendly toward each other. Christopher realized he could no longer continue living at Terry's house, so he decided to rent his own place instead. As time progressed, Chris realized he wanted a change of scenery as well. 
Iron River seemed too small, so Chris began looking for more dynamic cities like Asheville in North Carolina. Fate presented Christopher with the chance to start over and embark on an entirely new chapter of life. Not only would Asheville provide him with job opportunities, but it would also offer picturesque, natural attractions, perfect conditions to launch himself into life anew. Christopher told Terry on October 14th that he had taken off work due to a doctor's appointment, suggesting they meet and go for a walk as they often did while living together. Christopher then proposed they meet later that afternoon and join her. Terry became worried when Christopher failed to contact her after October 15th and didn't return any calls or text messages from her girlfriend, Terry. Concerned for Christopher, Terry reached out to mutual friends, but they knew nothing. Ten days later, she filed a police report regarding Christopher's disappearance. Terry filed a report, but police quickly comforted her, assuring her that people often disappear for periods of time, only to return at some later point, sometimes even ending up somewhere new. Additionally, Terry revealed to police officers that Christopher had recently received a job offer in North Carolina. For them, this was another indicator that Christopher may have reached his new residence and begun living a completely different life after having cut all ties with the past. Investigators quickly launched an extensive investigation to disprove speculations. To do this, they identified Christopher's newly hired company and spoke to one of its employees to discover any information regarding Christopher. However, none could be obtained as Christopher hadn't shown up at work for over 10 days. Police speculated he might have been injured due to frequent trips outdoors alone. Search forces heated into nearby woods looking along routes Christopher had used. Specially trained dogs were deployed, yet no sign of Christopher was ever discovered. Terry suggested visiting Christopher's former apartment to ensure no accident had taken place or perhaps find any traces that may give an idea as to his current whereabouts. Agreeing with her suggestion, investigators went directly to his former place of residence. They were shocked at what they found. Items scattered across the floor and closet doors open. Their initial thought was likely Christopher was just being disorganized. However, Terry quickly dismissed this theory, asserting he wasn't as messy. Detectives began to suspect that all these circumstances might be linked to Rand's disappearance. So, after inspecting her home, it was decided to expand their search efforts and locate him on an even wider scale. Police searched carefully through the neighborhood before eventually discovering Reagan's car outside the city limits, about eight miles from Iron River. Since it appeared unlikely, he left it there intentionally. One door needed to be broken open for entry into it. At first, there was nothing suspicious in the vehicle's interior. On its seats were ordinary clothes typically found among locals, a hat, coat, and gloves. But one of the policemen noticed something peculiar on the front passenger seat, a small piece of yellow paper bearing an illustrated map describing an itinerary for travel. No specific addresses were indicated, only an itinerary, so they decided to follow it closely. Terry explained to Christopher that despite living in Iron River for years, he still hadn't learned the names of streets and roads, so he wrote down directions like turning at a bus stop or passing gas stations as guides for navigation. Terry noted that Christopher had indicated in his notes that this was his first trip to this location. Terry and her colleagues followed the route indicated on a piece of paper and stopped in front of a house listed in Christopher's notes before heading toward their final destination in a neighboring town. Investigators knocked on the door they needed to establish who lived there and why Christopher had traveled this way. Jason Cochran was surprised when uniformed men appeared outside his home. Shortly afterward, his wife Kelly appeared, and they were informed by officers of Christopher Reagan's disappearance that his abandoned car contained a piece of paper that pointed toward this address as part of their investigation. Kelly candidly revealed that she and Christopher worked at the same plant and were close. Although they hadn't spoken since mid-April, Kelly did manage to reconnect with Christopher in mid-June. Kelly Cran attempted to reach Chris via text messages between September and October, but received no reply. She assumed he had moved to North Carolina in search of employment, or possibly due to health concerns. Kelly also mentioned Christopher was having health problems and may have decided to start over somewhere new. When investigators found an address written down on a piece of paper found in Christopher's car, they became confused. 
Nonetheless, the couple remained willing to cooperate in any investigations that came their way. After brief questioning at Christopher's home, without finding what they needed, detectives decided to head out. Their next phase involved speaking with Christopher's co-workers at work before proceeding to interview workers and supervisors at his factory. One supervisor made mention of an affair between Christopher and Kelly Cochran, a rumor circulating among workers. After hearing this claim, investigators decided to re-interview both parties involved so as to gain clarity as to their true natures and establish exactly what had transpired between them. Kelly ultimately acknowledged her affair with Christopher, but could not tell him due to Jason being present. According to Kelly, their open relationship was fine with Jason being aware of any such affairs on the side. However, discussing such sensitive topics might hurt his feelings and be painful for both parties involved. Christopher's co-workers refuted Kelly's statements claiming Jason approved of their affair or there being any loose connections among their family as she claimed. Jason followed Kelly into the police office and their conversation revealed his opposition to Kelly's infidelity vehemently, thus making him an obvious suspect. However, due to a lack of evidence linking Jason with Christopher's disappearance, it became impossible for officers to conclude anything conclusively against Jason or Kelly. They had no choice but to release both from detention. The investigation continued for five months without yielding any clear resolution of its mystery. On March 5, 2015, Hobart Police Department Detective Jeremy Ogden took on the case immediately and began actively working it. Ogden began by conducting a comprehensive analysis of Kelly Cochran and Jason Cochran's history, meeting in high school before moving in together post-graduation. Their personalities couldn't have been any more different. Kelly was open and loved talking, while Jason preferred listening more than starting conversations first. Despite these differences, Jason and Kelly decided to marry. Following their wedding, the two started their own company providing swimming pool maintenance services, it was modest, but provided them with a decent income. Most of Jason's pool maintenance duties fell upon his shoulders until overwork and strain took its toll. Jason began experiencing back problems and felt heavier every day. Eventually, Kelly took over running the business. When it became clear he couldn't continue running it himself, though this period proved challenging, she remained hopeful that Jason would soon recover and resume his duties once more. Kelly searched for ways to help Jason recover since medical drugs weren't providing enough relief. One day, she learned of a plant that offered hope for Jason's recovery. Unfortunately, its use in medical practice hadn't started yet and wasn't available everywhere they lived. It had even been banned in their state. To get this drug, they moved from Florida to Michigan's Iron River Township. Jason could visit his doctor and receive his prescription for this miracle plant. Suddenly, his agony would finally end. Early in 2014, a plant that specializes in manufacturing parts for U.S. warships, hired 34-year-old Kelly Cochran, who had moved with her husband, Jason. Kelly made every effort to secure financial well-being for herself and Jason. Therefore, they accepted employment at Christopher Reagan's plant, where Kelly also worked. Over time, Christopher and Kelly discovered commonalities of conversation that helped foster their friendship. This proved particularly vital as Christopher had recently experienced difficulty with Terry in his relationship. After reviewing all available evidence, the prosecutor made a strong argument to a judge in Michigan in support of obtaining a search warrant for Cochran's residence. After successfully receiving a ruling from the judge on March 5th, she sent investigators straight away on March 6th to locate Cochran's address. Searches were carried out of the Cochran home with extreme care looking for any signs that Kelly and Jason may have played any part in Christopher's disappearance. Unfortunately, all efforts proved futile. The only significant discovery was a book written by Jason under a pseudonym from video gaming culture. Although its title may cause amusement, its content was truly disturbing. Jason detailed horrific murder scenes of everyone who had wronged him. One character matched up perfectly with Christopher as they read through this dark and violent work. Suspicion increased surrounding Jason. Perhaps his crimes weren't made up, but instead stemmed from actual incidents he had committed himself. With these concerns in mind, investigators decided three weeks later to conduct another search of the Cochran house, hoping to unearth the evidence missed during their previous search. When police officers drove up to their home, they noticed no vehicles present and that both the yard and driveway were empty. 
as no answer came when knocking at their door. No one answered the door when knocked. As soon as Kelly and Jason had left town after the initial search, they moved quickly into Indiana, prompting investigators to become concerned they might never find evidence they needed for months, especially DNA samples of suspects like Jason Cochran. Michigan police officers reached out to their Indiana counterparts, asking them to collect samples instead, prompting Indiana officers to head toward Cochran's new address to take DNA samples instead. Ready to assist their Michigan colleagues, Indiana officers then traveled directly to Cochran's new address where DNA samples would be taken before heading directly toward Jason, Cochran's new address. The couple didn't object, seeing no legitimate basis to charge them with murder nor evidence of Christopher Reagan. Meanwhile, investigation gradually disbanded, leaving little hope of solving his disappearance. Time passed until, on February 22, 2016, an alarming phone call arrived at Hobart Police Station from Kelly Cochran, who was clearly distressed over what had transpired. She attempted to explain that Jason wasn't breathing, but her emotions rendered it impossible for her to provide concrete details. Rescuers arrived quickly on the scene where Kelly attempted to prevent doctors from treating Jason due to her extreme terror and panic. Soon enough, however, it became evident that Jason no longer required assistance. Sitting in a chair, with his face lit up like it had been from extreme overheating, doctors were forced to confirm his death and send his body for forensic examination, while Kelly was handed over to a police patrol who took her back home with relatives living nearby on her street. Investigators were determined to ascertain what had transpired, so they conducted a search of Cochran's new home and discovered evidence in the form of a syringe needle at the foot of the marital bed. After inspecting Jason's body, an investigator concluded that his death was due to illegal drug abuse. However, this report came as a shock for detectives. Jason had an excessive amount of illegal substances in his system. However, the results from forensic tests indicated something more disturbing. His death had been caused by strangulation as evidenced by bruises on his neck and face. So Jason, who had been suspected of kidnapping Christopher Rean himself, became himself the victim of crime. This revelation raised new questions and necessitated a thorough re-examination of evidence. Immediately thereafter, forensic specialists turned their focus onto Kelly Cochran who many suspected as being linked to both incidents. She became suspect not only for Christopher's disappearance, but also in her husband's murder. The investigation became even more complex. On February 23, 2016, Kelly Cochran was summoned to testify in Jason's murder case at the police station. Investigators directly interrogated her about her possible involvement in his death and whether she administered excessive doses of illegal drugs to him. Regardless of the lack of concrete evidence and pressure from investigators, this young woman did not confess to either the murder of Jason or the kidnapping of Christopher. Investigators were unable to find sufficient proof of Kelly's guilt and were unable to arrest him, leading Detective Jeremy Ogden on a trail that eventually brought him face to face with Walter Hammerman, one of Jason's closest allies. During this investigation process, Detective Ogden met up with Walter Hammerman Walter immediately ran to the police upon hearing of Kelly's shocking story of Jason's tragic death from illegal drugs, emphasizing how close they were. Walter assured his partner that any changes would certainly have been communicated. Jason had been taking medicinal herbs with the sole aim of relieving his back pain for quite some time now, yet Walter noticed his friend had fallen into an unstable situation recently. In March last year, Jason revealed his concerns with him regarding travel arrangements to Indiana, due to Iron River police involvement in a disappearance case. All this had had a lasting impactful impression upon Jason. Walter witnessed Kelly become severely depressed and attempted suicide, necessitating medical intervention and therapy. Walter noticed a distinct change in Kelly's behavior as he took more control over his life. Jason seemed on edge, while in the past, the boys could spend hours playing video games together. Now he would avoid parties whenever his wife returned from work, this information became crucial in understanding what was transpiring within the Cochran family. After learning that Jason had died by strangulation, Detective Ogden devised an intricate plan to force Kelly Cochran to reveal the truth regarding Christopher Rean's fate. 
Walter, Jason's close companion and close ally, was chosen as bait, intended to lure Kelly into an incriminating trap and cause her to make mistakes that could potentially compromise Christopher Reen. Walter accepted a difficult role within this investigation while playing out this performance before Kelly Cochran. On March 12, 2016, Walter called Kelly while under surveillance by police officers with listening devices, intending to present her with a letter purporting to come from Jason that contained something important and urgent. Walter explained to Kelly that Jason gave this letter shortly before his death with instructions not to open it and send it immediately to police should anything occur. This came as quite a shock, both to Walter and to those watching over their situation. Yet even with this development, detectives had no direct evidence against her husband's killing. Investigators conducted numerous interrogation sessions with Kelly in an attempt to extract the truth. She denied her guilt throughout. On April 26, 2016, however, it became evident that Kelly Cochran had managed to slip away from their scrutiny. It seemed a mockery of justice, and detectives immediately joined forces with police officers from Iron River and Hobart in launching a federal manhunt against Kelly Cochran. Walter Hammerman was both shocked and alarmed that Kelly hadn't yet been apprehended. He worried she may get away with this crime once more and later attack him in return. Her phone had also been disconnected as though she were playing a cat and mouse game with the police. Detective Jeremy Ogden managed to piece together, after two long and hectic days of trying, that Kelly Cochran had managed to avoid detection by fleeing to Kentucky's Wingo Town, more than six hours away from Hobart. On April 28th, Kelly was located at her cousin's house by police officers who issued the same warning. As soon as they received this information, an arrest team quickly proceeded to the house, knowing Kelly could be dangerous and likely attempt to flee. They moved swiftly without warning, and Kelly was apprehended and taken into custody that afternoon. Later that same evening, Detective Ogden arrived in Wingo, where he resumed interviews with suspect alongside investigators from Indiana and Michigan. Once I spoke with Kelly Cochran, everything became crystal clear. Christopher Rian and Kelly's relationship went deeper and further than anyone imagined. Kelly truly loved him and dreamed of leaving this cursed city together and starting a new life together. But everything changed on October 13, 2015 when Jason learned about her cheating. They began fighting and Jason remembered their wedding night pact whereby anyone found out cheating would be required to kill their partner as punishment. Kelly asserted that she never intended to take their agreement seriously. It had always seemed more like a joke to her. Jason warned Kelly if she didn't keep her vow, threatening that he would carry it out himself if necessary. Although Kelly didn't wish for this responsibility, she nevertheless helped Jason commit a horrifying crime. On October 14, 2015, Christopher Rian traveled to Kelly Cochran's house, hoping to take full advantage of their first meeting. Rian wanted every moment to count, their encounter, and every memory he would create together with Cochran. Kelly took full advantage of his absence from home to offer him dinner and an intimate time together. All plans went according to plan, their evening promised to be memorable. After dining together on the first floor of Kelly's house, according to Kelly, they moved up onto the second. But their solitude was abruptly interrupted when Jason burst in with a rifle in hand, panicked and terrified. Christopher quickly recognized he was trapped, while Jason took aim and fired one shot directly at Christopher's head without delay. Chris was mortally wounded by Jason's bullet and died instantly. Following this event, Jason instructed his accomplices to bring Christopher's body down into the basement where they dismembered it with a hacksaw. Eventually, all his limbs and head had been severed from its torso. The perpetrators then placed Christopher's remains into several trash bags before disposing of them by dumping them in the woods near Crystal Falls Village. Christopher's car was moved away to avoid suspicion while they thoroughly cleaned Christopher's house to erase evidence of crime. They had become accomplices in an awful crime. Kelly Cochran was open about her involvement in Jason Cochran's tragic death saying the plan to commit the act came about after learning of Kelly having had an affair and Jason becoming jealous that Kelly had chosen someone else as his partner. According to Cochran, 
This idea of revenge came when Jason learned of Kelly having another lover and decided on taking drastic measures against Kelly in revenge for what had transpired between them. Kelly wanted revenge against Christopher for taking away their happiness together and feeling betrayed by Kelly's spouse. Kelly revealed how deeply in love with Christopher she was and felt that his absence had prevented them from living life fully. Kelly struggled to cope with both her loss and its accompanying pain on a daily basis. Kelly loathed Jason for forcing her into doing what he forced her into, realizing she couldn't continue living peacefully with it. An opportunity presented itself when Jason complained of backache on February 22, 2016. Kelly decided it would be time for action against Jason. Kelly convinced Jason to give her an overdose of medication. Unfortunately, however, its effects weren't instantaneous and Kelly covered his mouth and nose with her hands to ensure suffocation occurred before squeezing his neck to make sure Jason was dead, thus leading to bruised body parts on him. Kelly Cochran provided testimony that assisted law enforcement authorities to identify where Christopher's remains were buried. On May 18, 2016, Detective Jeremy Ogden, along with investigators and canine team, went to a site near Crystal Falls Village. This rarely visited neighborhood had become the site of an astonishing mystery. A team of investigators set off a thorough search around Lake Erie's surrounding woods, penetrating between trees to ensure no spots had been missed. One of their canine dogs suddenly sensed an odor and led the officers toward it. Officers were following the dog closely, expecting to discover something soon. Instead, it led them to an unassuming hill covered with fallen leaves and branches. Upon clearing this area, Investigators found objects including what looked to be human remains, unmistakably identifiable skulls. On closer examination, it was evident that Christopher Reagan had been murdered. A bullet hole attested to this. Investigators knew they had found Christopher's severed head. Additionally, there was evidence such as a 22 caliber bullet and broken gun found at the scene, as well as glasses belonging to Reagan that may have belonged to her. Dental records helped identify his remains, solving an investigation that had perplexed investigators for two years. Kelly Cochran was officially charged with murdering Christopher Rian and Jason Cochran in April 2016. On February 13, 2017, Michigan State Court officially arraigned this 34-year-old individual in Michigan State Court. The prosecutor noted Kelly was significantly reduced her role by being behind both crimes. Christopher only saw Kelly as a casual companion. Kelly, however, genuinely loved Christopher and planned for their future together. Christopher's refusal of her romantic advances resulted in fury, and Kelly decided to kill him by fabricating a story of an alliance between herself and Christopher's brother-in-law. Kelly confessed in court, yet presented another version. As per her allegations, she had been subject to abuse at the hands of her jealous husband, who orchestrated this act of violence. On November 9th, he hid in their basement and caught their lovers off guard before seizing an opportunity and using it as an excuse to grab a weapon in a fit of anger and shoot Christopher. Jason suggested dismembering Christopher Rian's body and Kelly agreed by being threatened to kill Jason Cochran. When presented with this new version of events, however, the jury began questioning Kelly's guilt. After three hours of deliberation, they reached their verdict of premeditated murder of Christopher Rian, resulting in life imprisonment without parole for Kelly and 65 years for Cochran. Kelly Cochran was taken directly from the courtroom and sent directly to Crown Point Correctional Facility in Ypsilanti, Michigan, where she is serving her sentence with only regrets regarding her personal life. Kelly stated in one phone interview, I tried my best at doing what was expected, from school through college and marriage, but ultimately, all my efforts went in vain. All I ever did was work, while my husband entertained himself with computer games. At prison, Kelly Cochran continues to reveal details of her crimes and claims she and Jason committed additional offenses. Christopher was just one of their many victims. Unfortunately, due to Kelly not disclosing additional crimes committed or victims she claims existed at this point in time, it's difficult for anyone to corroborate Kelly's statements her brother heard from Kelly that there may have been others, yet there is no concrete proof to back that up yet. 
Detective Jeremy Ogden from Hobart, Indiana Police Department, is carefully scrutinizing every aspect in hope of uncovering clues or uncovering evidence pointing towards any additional crimes committed by either of Kelly or Jason Cochran. Hopefully, it can close another chapter in this twisted tale. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. 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 Wedding travel, also known as a honeymoon, is a significant event in the lives of young families. It can leave vivid memories of an unforgettable adventure or, for example, provide a long-awaited escape from the mundane life somewhere on the azure coast, under the shade of palm trees. But what if you go on a wedding trip and end up committing or being accused of a crime? Would the honeymoon be as bright and carefree in that case? I don't think so. Unforgettable, of course. Hellman, whose real name is Isabella Rodriguez, was born in 1975 in Colombia, a country where everyone speaks Spanish. But Isabella really dreamed of the American dream. She read English books and listened to English songs on the radio to learn the language as quickly as possible so she could go to the north of Europe. Even though she was able to learn the language, she would always have a southern accent. This didn't stop the young woman from moving to Florida where she worked as a real estate agent for people who only spoke Spanish. Isabella married William Hellman in 2002, even though her previous relationships didn't work out. They were married for 10 years, but their whole relationship was marked by constant fights and problems at home. Finally, when neither partner could take it any longer, they filed for divorce. The process took a very long two years. Isabella even found a new man during this time, and she hoped to be happy with him. Lewis Bennett was the name of the new lover. He was born in Great Britain but moved to Australia as a child and had dual citizenship. He went back to his home country to finish his education at the prestigious Camborne School of Mines. Lewis, on the other hand, never got a job in his field. He eventually went back to Australia and started his own business making solar panels. After four years, he went into the American market. His main office was in Florida so the young and promising Lewis started using the internet to look for a wife there. Lewis tried to meet someone online for a long time, but had no luck. He looked at the profiles of women, but didn't pay much attention to them. The women who wrote to him first either turned him off or didn't interest him. But when he saw Isabella's picture, he thought she looked a lot like Jennifer Lopez, so he wrote to her. They wrote to each other for a long time, and Isabella talked about her hopes to move to the United States from Colombia how hard it was for her to learn English and her job search. She eventually told him about the men she dated in the past. Bennett didn't care at all about her past because she knew Isabella and William were going to get a divorce soon. In order to meet Lewis in person, Isabella made plans to go to wherever he was, whether it was England, Australia, or even Thailand. Lewis bought a catamaran to show his new girlfriend Isabella how much he liked her. He planned to take her on a trip around the Caribbean Sea. He dreamed of doing this since he moved around a lot as a child and found it hard to make lasting friends. In his spare time, he read adventure books by authors like Jules Verne and Robert Louis Stevenson. Treaser Iceland was his favorite book and it would become an important part of his life. When Isabella had free time, like on vacation or over the weekend, she always went on trips with Louis. She saw that Lewis almost forgot about work while on these expensive trips, though it could be said that his company's processes were highly automated, which gave him time to relax. When Isabella tried to talk to Lewis about his work-life balance, he either laughed it off or said that he had a big inheritance and didn't need to worry about anything. Isabella was happy with his answer. The couple celebrated the birth of their daughter Amelia in July 2016, it was a big deal for both of them, and that's when the fight started. Isabella had a hard time deciding how to raise their daughter, or even which country would be best for her upbringing, because of things that had happened to her in the past. Lewis wanted Amelia to grow up in Australia with his parents, but Isabella wanted to stay in the United States. As a compromise, they finally moved to Florida. In 2017, even though they already had a child together, 
they decided to get married. Isabella asked her husband to take her on a honeymoon on his catamaran because she thought that being on the water would bring them back together. Lewis agreed, but the date was pushed back. They finally left on their romantic cruise at the end of April 2017. At first, their social media posts made it look like everything was going as planned for Isabella. Photos of them smiling and having a great time sailing around the Caribbean islands gave her hope. However, after the first photos from the honeymoon, there was silence for two weeks. When Isabella went online again, she told her family that they were in Cuba and were planning to go back to Florida, but they didn't know the exact plans yet. She also said that their internet connection was slow, which meant that they might not be reachable for a few days. In the middle of the night on May 15th, Lewis called the Coast Guard to say he was lost and alone on a raft out at sea. Right away, the rescuers started looking for Lewis. They found him near the Bahamas on a raft that was full of food and other supplies. Lewis told a story about how he had asked Isabella to rest for a few hours after a long day and then given her control of the catamaran. A heavy thump from below woke him up after he went to take a nap in the cabin. He thought Isabella had been thrown overboard when he couldn't find her and saw that the catamaran was taking on water. He got his things together and moved to the rescue boat, thinking that her life vest would keep her safe. It was strange that he didn't use a beacon or a satellite phone to call for help. The Coast Guard didn't understand what was going on. They looked around and saw that there were no underwater rocks or reefs that could have sunk the boat like Lewis said. The boat also had open escape hatches, which is against safety rules, and suggests that someone was trying to sink the ship on purpose. It was proven by divers that the holes in the catamaran's bottom were made from the inside. The condition of the boat did not match Lewis's account of hitting rocks in the water. Another strange thing about the case was that Lewis only put his things on the life raft as if he didn't think he would find Isabella alive. He even brought silver coins that are hard to find that are hidden in aluminum tubes. Later, investigation showed that one of Lewis's friends had stolen these coins in 2016. Lewis was charged with smuggling because of how he behaved. The fact that there were open escape hatches and other suspicious circumstances. While the person was being held for smuggling, the investigation went on and more evidence came to light. In the house where Isabella and Lewis had lived, recording devices were found that had recordings of Lewis making death threats against Isabella. Isabella told her friends about these threats and how she wanted to leave her husband, but she also wanted to give their marriage one more chance. Debts, real estate, electricity, and credit cards were the main things that made them fight. Lewis had a lot of debt but didn't. He declined to deal with his money problems and instead chose to travel instead of working. Even told Isabella she had to get a job to help him pay off his debts while he kept traveling. The investigation also found that between 2014 and 2016, Lewis sent money to other countries worth a total of $160,000. These transfers had something to do with the stolen collectible coins that Lewis had on him. Lewis was facing more charges of involuntary manslaughter as the evidence grew. Lewis Bennett took a plea deal in November 2018 and pleaded guilty to both smuggling drugs and manslaughter by accident. He went to prison for eight years and couldn't get any of Isabella's insurance payments or property. The court told Lewis that he had to give his daughter Amelia money because she would have to deal with the emotional pain of losing her mother as she grew up. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. In January 1999, David and Belinda Temple were expecting their second child. Belinda was due to give birth as soon as possible. Doctors predicted labor in a few weeks. Belinda, like all pregnant women, was extremely tired and quickly exhausted. She still had her son Evan, who needed attention and care. That day, David decided to relieve his wife of household chores and give her some time to rest in the evening. To keep her from being distracted, he and his son went for a walk in the park. The father and son were enjoying their walk in the fresh air. Walking quickly tires and wets the appetite, so they stopped at a cafe to eat a sandwich and drink a Coke. 
After the cafe, they drove home. David parked the car and noticed that the front door to his house had broken glass. Evan, I'm going to take you to visit Harland for a bit, okay? David asked. Without waiting for his son's response, he quickly led him across the street to a neighboring house where family friends lived. Why can't we go to mom's? Asked the son who struggled to keep up with his father. David replied, Mom is in the hospital right now. He didn't know what else to say, so he kept going. Quentin Harland had barely opened the door to the unexpected visitors and had not even had a chance to greet them when David took his son into the living room and ran toward his house. Quentin, not understanding anything, yelled at his wife to look after the child and ran after his silent friend. What's the matter, Quentin? He yelled. But when he saw the temple's broken front door, he realized David most likely had no idea what was waiting for him inside. The house was a disaster, with all of the closets open, items scattered on the floor, and worst of all, blood trails leading to the stairs. Quentin pushed David aside and noticed Belinda lying belly down beneath the stairs in the dressing room, her arms spread apart in a large hole in the back of her head. David, apparently in shock, did not cry out, did not say anything, did not rush to his wife's body, but instead took out his cell phone and dialed the police number. The operator on the other end of the line had not anticipated the brutality of the murder, so he instructed David to check Belinda's pulse and even perform CPR. What the hell kind of CPR are you talking about? Her head is splattered all over the walls, he replied. Police officers responded quickly to the scene, but they did not enter the house for a long time. Shaq, the Temple family's bull terrier, growled and barked at the unfamiliar uniformed men, appearing ready to lunge at the police officers. One officer even drew his service pistol. David, who had emerged from the house, yelled for them to put their guns away and hurriedly led the aggressive dog into the garage. Once inside the house where the tragedy occurred, the police investigated and concluded that burglars had been at work. They were unaware that the mistress was in the house at the time. Even though she was pregnant, they had no choice but to shoot her and thus eliminate the witness. In 1986, Belinda attended college in her hometown. Even though her twin sister Brenda left to attend Steve Austin University, Belinda remained with her parents because, in high school, she began dating Marshall Kelmy, who was three years her senior and whom she adored. Her father and mother were against the relationship, at the very least, because of her boyfriend, their daughter would be unable to obtain a prestigious education, and as is typical, she would become pregnant early and drop out of even a community college. There were numerous scandals in their household regarding this topic. Carol's mother refused to let her daughter start a joint life with Marshall, saying, He is nobody to you. When you get married, you can move out anywhere, but until then, you have your own house. Belinda was a stubborn girl who always got her way, so her mother's words must have served as a wake-up call. Later, at a family dinner to which Marshall had been invited despite his reservations, the young couple announced their engagement. There was a palpably silence at the table. Well, now that they've decided, Mom gritted her teeth, and they remained silent for the rest of the evening. Belinda had made the decision herself, wanting to show her parents that she was an adult capable of making her own decisions. Her boyfriend was not particularly eager for an official marriage, but he did not refuse his girlfriend's proposal. Belinda packed her belongings and moved in with her husband, who was still living with his parents at the time, with no plans to rent a separate place. Indeed, their relationship was unaffected by their official marriage. As previously stated, Belinda did everything she could to avoid motherly reproaches and achieve independence. But the taste of this life proved to be very bitter. Not six months later, Marshall began to spend little time at home, claiming to be working late, but in fact with another woman. Belinda found out when she noticed her husband acting strangely one day. She waited until his workday was over before following her husband. That's when everything came to light. Marshall was walking hand in hand with a strange woman, most likely a colleague. The deceived wife did not organize any fights or gee Lucy Cenas, but instead packed her belongings and returned to her mother. The guilty Marshall hung around her house for a long time, frequently calling to beg her forgiveness, but Belinda was unwavering and too proud to forgive the young man. 
they soon divorced. By 1998, Belinda was pregnant with her child, but continued to work part-time at the school. The children listened to her half-heartedly, respected her for her fairness, and were even slightly scared. Belinda was concerned that due to her pregnancy, she would miss the inter-school basketball competition and would be unable to adequately prepare the team. Her colleague, Richard Bachman, didn't care about her team or children in general. He had confessed to her numerous times that if he had another job, he would have quit being a teacher long ago. Belinda despised this attitude and couldn't understand why this flabby and overweight 40-year-old man was still in his position. Belinda was not one of those teachers who tolerated student absenteeism. So when she discovered that one of her students, high school senior Riley Joe Sanders, had been absent from class for months, she immediately contacted her colleagues. She wanted to know if this was her fault as a teacher or if the boy was a habitual truant. Her colleagues responded that it was not her fault. The boy was raised in a bad family, no one cared about him, and he only attended school on rare occasions. Belinda could not leave it at that. That same evening, she went to see his mother, who lived nearby, and had a serious conversation with her, which later proved fruitful. However, it did not meet the young teacher's expectations. Riley Joe Sanders came to class and practiced on an equal footing with the other students, but during a basketball game, when Sanders pushed his opponent and Belinda pointed out Riley's disgusting behavior, he insulted her with the last words, saying something like, You'll answer to me for this. You better look around, especially in the evenings. After her breakup with Marshall in 1987, Belinda had nothing left in her hometown. So she accompanied her sister to Stephen F. Austin State University. She enjoyed her time at the university. It appeared that she had truly discovered her calling. In addition to studying, she worked part-time as a basketball coach and the young woman had high hopes. At the same university, she met David Temple. He, like Belinda, was a part-time soccer coach who also played as captain of the university team. Soccer was an important part of David's life. He had been playing since he was a child, and it was clear from the start that he would become a school star. Despite David's difficult personality, he always played well for his team and was respected by all teachers. He could easily insult someone or start a fight, but he got away with it all while on the field during the game. Belinda also attended the taste and David's parents idolized her. They liked that she, like their son, was a big sports fan, so they had a lot in common. But her twin sister and Belinda's friends were not pleased with the union. They knew Belinda as a strong-willed and independent woman, and in this relationship, she changed dramatically. She became constrained, silent, and humble. Her whole life seemed to revolve around pleasing David. In addition to everything else, Belinda's toxic relationship caused her to become estranged from her family. Calls to her parents became increasingly infrequent and trips home, whether for vacation or weekends, ceased entirely. Who in the family might like this? Closer to graduation, the couple purchased a bull terrier and named him Shaq. After receiving their long-awaited diplomas, David and Belinda married. In 1999, police began investigating the crime scene. How could a burglar enter a home guarded by such a vicious dog? In fact, how could the perpetrator distract the bull terrier that was preventing the police from entering the temple yard? Then they focused their attention on the front door. The glass was broken, as if the perpetrator attempted to open the lock from inside. However, in that case, the shards of glass would have been near the threshold. They were in the distance, to the right of the entrance. So, when the door was unlocked, the glass broke. Why would they do this? In the living room, there was a box on a nightstand and a toppled TV on the floor next to it. The policeman opened it, revealing earrings, rings, a chain, and gold jewelry. Additionally, it was unclear why the robber did not touch the jewelry. With each passing minute inside the Temple family home, the police officers became increasingly convinced that everything had happened in a dramatization. They knew from experience that in a robbery, the criminal takes everything they can find and carries it away. However, it appeared that nothing had been taken. <laughs> then there was the dog who would not leave their thoughts. 
something was obviously wrong here. The murder was committed by firing a shot in the back of the head, most likely with a 12-gauge shotgun, while the victim was kneeling with their back to the killer. However, shotguns are not a popular weapon among robbers. It's extremely difficult to carry or transport without being noticed. In Belinda's case, the murder occurred at 4 hour p.m., and no criminal would walk around with a shotgun in broad daylight. David, do you keep any weapons at home? One officer inquired. Yeah, I have a couple of rifles, David explained. David showed the police officers his weapons, but not the shotgun that could have killed Belinda. The cops asked David to accompany them to the station to provide a statement and take inventory of the stolen items. The man was extremely nervous, but he went with the police officers. His son, Evan, who had no idea what had happened, stayed at Harlan's house. In 1996, David Temple and Quentin Harland were not only neighbors, but also worked at the same school. You could say they were true friends. They frequently met outside of work hours to watch games on TV or have a family BBQ. Something other than their shared interest in sports brought David and Quentin together one day. Heather Scott was a new young teacher at the school. Quentin immediately paid attention to her, gave her various signs of interest and even invited her to dinner one night. But Heather turned him down. Quentin happened to have a rival who, surprisingly, turned out to be David. Quentin was outraged and resentful that his married friend, who even had a son, was developing a secret relationship at work. You have to give it to Quentin. He was a good friend who could keep secrets. Heather had no idea David was married because he didn't wear a wedding ring and didn't tell her anything about his real life. Furthermore, outside of the school, David and Heather appeared to be a happy couple, which was noticed by the entire teaching staff. Belinda knew nothing about David's second life. She once talked to Quentin and told him she suspected her husband of cheating. However, Quentin, of course, dissuaded the suffering wife. You have a vivid imagination. David is your husband and a great family man. How could you think such a thing? Said the man. And there was plenty to think about. If David had previously been extremely reverent toward Belinda, he could now insult his wife in public. For example, he frequently referred to her as fat, despite the fact that she had only gained a few pounds since giving birth. He asked her to move to another room when there were guests in the house, as if her untidy appearance scared them, and so on. Instead of having a serious conversation with her husband about it, Belinda accepted this attitude toward herself while crying at night and feeling deeply unhappy as a woman. Meanwhile, David was enjoying his new relationship with Heather. In 1999, the police suspected David but couldn't prove it. Flipping through the case files of burglaries in the neighborhood, they discovered that eight days before the murder at the Temple House, a house on the next street was burglarized and the perpetrator was Riley Joe Sanders, the same persistent truant from the school where Belinda taught and who had threatened her. He was immediately brought in for questioning. Riley had no alibi on the day of the murder and his father owned a shotgun, albeit a 12 gauge. However, when they searched the Sanders house, no weapon was discovered. When the high school student discovered that, police had every reason to detain him. He admitted that on the day of the teacher's murder, he was with friends and concealed it because he was with a large group of people smoking pot and did not want to frame others with his testimony. Riley's charge has been dropped. David became increasingly estranged from his family after starting a new relationship with a co-worker in 1998. His psychological pressure on his wife increased gradually. He never raised his hand to her, and their entire communication consisted of insults. It was during this year that Belinda discovered she was pregnant again. This news made her forget all of David's previous offenses, and she was ecstatic. David appeared to be attempting to portray himself as a happy father as well, but it was ineffective. David didn't always return home at night, and Belinda was afraid to ask why, because her husband could become enraged and cause a major scandal. A pregnant woman didn't want that. Belinda frequently asked David to assist her in preparing for the baby's birth, such as going to the store for supplies, making repairs in the new children's room, and installing wall shelves. David ignored all of his wife's requests, and Belinda, despite her position, began to do everything herself, including going shopping, painting the walls, and assembling the purchased furniture. 
David made no effort at all. Christmas was coming. Belinda was already eight months pregnant. She decided to talk with her husband about what they would give each other. However, David suggested that they not exchange gifts this year because the money saved would be better spent on the baby who was about to be born. Especially since the doctors had warned the expectant mother that she might go into premature labor and the baby could be born before the new year, Christmas arrived. Despite their agreement not to give each other anything, David never gave Belinda anything, not even a small gift. Furthermore, he packed his belongings and announced that he would be spending the entire New Year's holiday with friends on the hunt. Belinda informed her sister, and she canceled all plans to visit her so that Belinda would not feel abandoned. As the doctors warned, labor could start at any time. David, of course, was not on any hunting trips with his friends. He spent the holidays with Heather, who wore a gold necklace that Temple had given her for Christmas. In 2007, it appeared that David Temple had nearly forgotten about his wife's murder, as if Belinda Temple had never existed. He didn't care that five years had passed since the murder, and the perpetrator had yet to be identified. He married Heather in 2001, and together they raised Evan. However, in November 2004, he received a knock on the door. On the doorstep, police officers handcuffed David and informed him that he was being held on suspicion of murdering Belinda Temple. David, like before, denied everything. David's trial didn't start until 2007. According to the investigation, the motive for the crime was his new romantic relationship with Heather. David's interviewees stated that they overheard him bragging about how easily he swapped his fat and pregnant wife for a young and beautiful Heather on several occasions during her pregnancy. According to the prosecution, David murdered Belinda as soon as she returned home from work because the young woman was wearing her work uniform and shoes. He then began the robbery by throwing items around the house before quickly driving to the park with his son, providing an alibi. The prosecution also stated that nothing was stolen from the house and that there was a vicious dog in the yard who would not allow any strangers into the house. The murder weapon was most likely dropped by David in the rice paddy, as witnesses saw David's car stop near the paddy with only Evan in it. However, the shotgun was never found in that location. Heather testified that before Belinda's murder, their relationship with David was not serious and she didn't even love him. Temple clearly disliked these words, which added confusion to the jury's decision. Could David kill his wife for a non-serious relationship? Or is Heather lying to save her husband in this way? In November 2007, David was sentenced to life in prison. In 2009, Riley Sanders' friend goes to the police to clear his conscience. Riley told him a few years ago that he took his father's shotgun with the intent of robbing the Temple family home and teaching his teacher a lesson about his mother's popularity at school. And he almost got into the house, but at that point, a bull terrier ran out of the garage, and Riley shot at the dog but did not hit him, and he quickly fled, fearing that the sound of shotgun fire would attract the neighbors. The court received this testimony, and the case was reviewed. In the meantime, David was released from prison on bail. Heather had no intention of marrying a man who had spent so much time in jail and didn't know how long he would be there. She has filed for divorce. The jury took a long time to decide what type of punishment David deserved. The pandemic began when Temple was free and the court had yet to decide on a sentence. It was not until 2023 that the case was reviewed. In the end, David was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 17 years. His son Evan did not believe his father was capable of such a cold-blooded murder until the very end of the trial and he supported him throughout. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. In April 2016, in Fort Worth, Texas, a shocking and brutal murder startled even experienced investigators. Elizabeth Paula Arellano worked as a paramedic before falling victim to this vicious and senseless act. Prepare to be shocked as you discover who carried out Elizabeth's execution. Her death was so peculiar that the police initially suggested it might have been voluntary. 
However, this explanation didn't align with the testimony provided by accidental witnesses to this tragic scene. Investigation teams had to go the extra mile in their efforts to understand everything and bring justice against the individual who committed this extremely brutal crime. Unfortunately, given his conduct, his sentence appeared too lenient and unfair compared to many others. Elizabeth Paula Arellano was born on August 16, 1987 in Fort Worth, Texas, where she would live her short life. Elizabeth spent much of her childhood alongside Alessandra and Giovanna, whom she found to be her companions. Elizabeth's birth father left when she was still young, showing no interest in or contact with his daughter. Soon thereafter, her mother, Juanita, remarried Fidel, who eventually treated their children as his own. Elizabeth developed an extremely close bond with Fidel, who supported and assisted in every way possible in all family matters. The girl studied diligently at school and dreamed of one day becoming a doctor. While in high school, she met Rudolf Arellano, whom she soon fell in love with. Elizabeth chose a man almost eight years older than herself, causing some embarrassment among her parents. Nonetheless, they did not interfere with the romance, as their son-in-law appeared serious and reliable enough for them not to intervene. At 16 years old, just out of school, Elizabeth legally married her lover. Elizabeth and James eventually had four children together, three sons and a daughter. However, Elizabeth did not intend to become a housewife, as she remembered her childhood dream of becoming a doctor, and she graduated from medical school to work as a paramedic while planning to pursue further education. The young woman was kind and devoutly raised in Christian traditions. She took her children regularly to church and instilled in them love and compassion for their neighbors. Family and friends recognized her as an attentive listener who was always willing to lend a helping hand. At first, their marriage seemed strong and blissful, but after 13 years, it began to unravel as Rudolph tried his hardest to control every aspect of her life, becoming increasingly inconsiderate over time. Eventually, their union disintegrated entirely as his jealousy of his young wife became uncontrollable. After yet another jealousy-fueled argument initiated by Rudolph, Elizabeth took her children and moved them back to her parents' house. Although Rudolph attempted reconciliation with Elizabeth, she had grown tired of his fits of anger and didn't want the children exposed daily to their scandalous arguments. She mustered enough courage to officially file for a divorce, and shortly thereafter, she mysteriously vanished without a trace. According to friends and family, she appeared in good spirits and decided, in order to distract herself from family problems and the impending divorce, to visit a nearby club after work with colleagues. On Friday evening, April 15, 2016, the 28-year-old mother went to a fun place with some friends. There, she danced and had fun but did not consume alcohol due to her plans to return in her own car, which she had used to arrive at the club. Elizabeth arrived home well past midnight on April 16th. Once she parked the car, she called her friend, with whom she had spent the evening at the club, to inform them that she had already reached home and that everything was okay. However, after hanging up the phone, she never entered the house. The next morning, Juanita became very distressed to find that Elizabeth had not returned home as planned. Although Juanita knew Elizabeth had planned on spending the evening with friends, she expected Elizabeth would have returned long ago, as her car had been parked outside their house, indicating her return from the club. Juanita approached Elizabeth's car, only to find it unlocked with its key still in the ignition. Inside were Elizabeth's purse and cell phone belongings, indicating that something horrible must have occurred. As soon as she noticed Elizabeth was missing, Juanita immediately notified the police and filed a missing person report. At first, the police believed they could quickly solve the case with hot leads, hoping Elizabeth might still be alive, as there was no blood or signs of struggle visible inside the car. However, that proved not to be the case, and their first priority became reconstructing every aspect of that evening and night for all possible witnesses who might help identify and interrogate. Friends and colleagues of the young woman who spent the evening before she disappeared were interviewed, providing details about when she left and returned home. Additionally, several calls and messages from Rudolf Arellano, who was trying to contact Elizabeth throughout that evening, 
were found on her cell phone, all without success, as Elizabeth never answered his calls or texts. Police officers visited Rudolph's home the evening and night prior to ascertain his whereabouts and activities. According to Rudolph, he had spoken with his ex-spouse that night, who assured him she would bring their children over for the weekend visitation. But after she stopped answering his calls, he believed she had changed her mind and abandoned him. Arellano offered up an unlikely alibi. According to him, he spent the evening sitting at a local bar before returning home at midnight and going straight to sleep. On Friday afternoon, Rudolph was confirmed by his friends and others to have been relaxing in the same establishment. However, no one knew where he went after that, and there was no one to verify his claim. So, the police were unwilling to exclude Mr. Arellano as a suspect due to his lack of an alibi, and his behavior raised further suspicions. At his ex-wife's funeral, Rudolph put on a show, weeping at her coffin and telling Elizabeth that he wanted her death as much as his own. Elizabeth believed in the sincerity of these statements. Furthermore, he actively assisted in creating a charitable foundation to raise money for her farewell ceremony. However, after the conclusion of this act, when police investigators called him in for questioning again, he looked and behaved completely differently, as though nothing bad had taken place compared to what Elizabeth had witnessed before at that point in time. After reviewing all the CCTV footage from the last several weeks, a thorough assessment was completed. Under Elizabeth's route, it was determined that a car of similar make and color to Rudolph's had driven away from her parents' house at 3 a.m., according to witness accounts. A neighbor also remembers seeing this same vehicle parked not far from where Elizabeth had been killed on a nearby bridge. Furthermore, investigators raised more questions when they obtained Rudolph's cell phone data for the night of the crime. On that night, Rudolph made multiple calls near Elizabeth's place of employment and then near his mother-in-law and father-in-law's homes, as well as sending his ex-wife several messages trying to find out when she would return. But none were returned by her. He followed her to Elizabeth's parents' home, where he decided to wait. Once the police had enough evidence against Rudolph, they arrested and brought him into the station for further questioning. One of the key witnesses in Elizabeth and Rudolph's case was their eldest son. When shown the rope that had been cut from Elizabeth's neck, he reported having seen it earlier at his father's house, recalling playing with it himself. Furthermore, the boy recognized pieces of concrete left lying around their garden after their fence had been replaced. Fragments from this concrete could even be found inside Rudolph's car trunk. The investigation revealed that the man waited for his ex-wife at her parents' home before abducting her and forcing her into his car where he had prepared rope and concrete in the trunk for use during the massacre at a nearby bridge. He planned on going unnoticed while carrying out this act of violence. Rudolf Arellano was arrested 10 days after his ex-wife's body was recovered from a lake, but denied all involvement in her murder, claiming he had been at home on that particular night. Given the severity of Rudolf's actions, death could have been imminent until, after consulting with his lawyer, he decided to confess and cooperate with the investigation to lessen his sentence. Arellano did not plead guilty until January 2019 when he presented evidence in court detailing how he abducted and murdered Juanita, the mother of their four children. Juanita fainted during his testimony, while Alessandra and Giovanna called Arellano a monster. Rudolph himself did not express any regret for his crime or apologize to those affected by it. Rather, he spoke nonchalantly and coldly about it, without offering an explanation for his motivations or actions. For this crime, he was sentenced to life without parole. Elizabeth's family members considered this sentence rather mild, noting that they forgave Rudolph because they did not want their hearts to be consumed by hatred towards him. Elizabeth is now responsible for raising her children, as her parents and sisters are responsible for providing care. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more.
northwest Harris County neighborhood on edge this Christmas Eve. A couple celebrating a wedding anniversary found tied up in separate closets. The husband had been stabbed to death. Tonight, investigators have plenty of questions about this. And it happened, as we see on this map, at a home on Kelsey Meadows Court and Village Terrace. And that's where Local 2's Andy Sirota is joining us live with the latest on this story. Jim and Sandra Melgar live in Houston, Texas. They celebrated being married for more than 30 years while living in a quiet neighborhood on Kelsey Meadows Court. Jim Melgar was born in Guatemala and moved to the United States when he was three years old. His family made the choice to move to Houston, where Sandra and her family also lived. Sandra said that Jim was funny, charming, and liked to make bad jokes and be a goofball. They met at school. He kept asking Sandra to go ice skating with him for weeks, and she finally said yes. As they say, the rest is history. In 1980, they got married. Jim went to work as a computer programmer, and Sandra ran a successful business doing medical billing and coding. Even though they were successful, they liked living a quiet life with their daughter Elizabeth, who went by the name Liz. Liz said that her parents were like best friends who were meant to be together. The three of them loved to travel and do outdoor activities like hiking and fishing, but their love of nature faded over time. Sandra endured various physical challenges, including lupus, epilepsy, hypothyroidism, and hip replacements. Liz recounted witnessing her mother suffer violent seizures, a terrifying experience for the entire family. Jim, desperate to help his wife, spent entire days researching her conditions in search of treatments and cures. On December 22, 2012, Jim and Sandra were out having fun to celebrate 32 years of marriage. They ate at their favorite Mexican restaurant, and then around 9.30 p.m., Jim stopped by CVS to get some candy for drinks. When they got home, they sat in their jacuzzi with drinks and snacks and talked about their plans for the future. Jim was excited to make plans for their time together because he was only five months away from retiring. Also, they talked about the small party that Jim's family was planning for their anniversary. The narrative takes a dark turn on December 23, 2012, at 7 a.m when a neighbor noticed the Melgar's garage door open throughout the day, an unusual occurrence. Jim's family arrived at the house around 4.30 p.m., finding it eerily quiet. Despite Jim's black truck in the driveway and Sandra's silver car inside the garage, there was no response when they knocked on the door. Concerned, they entered through the garage, discovering a somber atmosphere inside. The house felt stuffy, blinds remained closed, and the couple's dogs were agitated. Her man, Jim's brother, heard Sandra's soft voice coming from upstairs while the family searched the house. Sandy was tied up with scarves in a small walk-in closet. Jim was found naked, badly beaten, and stabbed several times in another closet nearby. Jim Melgar, who was 52 years old, was pronounced dead just two minutes after the police arrived. He had over 50 injuries, including defensive wounds that showed he had been in a fierce fight. Sandra woke up to the horrifying truth, but she couldn't remember what had happened after 1 a.m. Open drawers, jewelry boxes that had been searched, and prescription pills that had been taken but not found were all signs of a crime scene. The police reports didn't say anything was missing or stolen, even though the house was in bad shape. They found a white blouse and a kitchen knife inside the jacuzzi, which they knew was the murder weapon. It was locked but there was blood on the handle of Jim's loaded gun that was in the closet. When paramedics checked on Sandra, she showed signs of physical distress that reminded them of a seizure. However, there were no major cuts or scrapes on her hands or arms, which raises questions given how tightly she was tied up and for how long. Bizarre murder has a Northwest Harris County neighborhood on edge this Christmas Eve. A couple celebrating a wedding anniversary found tied up in separate closets. The husband had been stabbed to death. 
Tonight, investigators have plenty of questions about this. And it happened, as we see on this map, at a home on Kelsey Meadows Court and Village Terrace. And that's where Local 2's Andy Sirota is joining us live with the latest on this story. Andy? Bill, residents in this quiet community still baffled over a bizarre mystery involving two of their neighbors. Like police, they too have so many questions. We're just trying to get a statement. Sandra Melgar sought comfort today in the arms of a friend in the wake of her husband's bizarre murder. She was unable to speak from the back seat of this car where we saw her wrapped in a blanket laying down, still in shock after her 52 year old husband was found dead and tied up in a closet. Relatives who arrived at the couple's home for Sunday dinner also found Sandra Melgar tied up in a separate closet. 32 years was the anniversary they were celebrating it. Distraught family members tell Local 2 the couple had been happily married for 32 years and recently celebrated their anniversary. Deputies say Melgar told them she can't remember who tied her up or who may have hurt her husband. His brother told us he'd been stabbed to death. They were in the bathroom together, uh, her and her husband, at approximately uh, 1 a.m. this morning. And at some time, she blacked out, and the next thing she remembers is waking up in the closet. Relatives told us off camera the Melgars are devout Jehovah's Witnesses, own some rental properties, and insist there was nothing going on in the couple's lives to indicate trouble was on the horizon. Now, tonight, we're still not sure what caused Sandra Melgar to black out, but relatives tell us she does have a medical condition, and they say it appears that she may have been hit over the head with something. Investigators haven't released information on any possible suspects. They took Sandra Melgar to Homicide Headquarters to interview her. Andy, thank you, sir. Red relatives got to the Melgar house yesterday. They said they noticed that the garage door was open. Investigators haven't said anything yet about any possible signs of forced entry or about whether the couple's home had possibly been ransacked or if anything was missing. She was taken to the hospital for more tests, but was quickly sent home. They then took her to the Harris County Sheriff's Office to question her. The police thought Sandra's account of what happened was not quite right because of how strange the scene was. I need to do a statement from you, okay? That's why we're here. And I will report her and do a little statement and get some questions from you. Answer. After getting out of the jacuzzi, she had no idea what had happened and couldn't remember anything. She made it very clear that she had no idea what had happened to Jim and had seen or heard nothing that could have killed him. And did, did you immediately get into the jacuzzi at that time when you got home? We made drinks and went straight to the jacuzzi. <clears throat> he got out once to go get ice and then came back and then said he was going to put the dogs, move the dogs because they were barking too much. He got out and said he was moving the dogs to the office because when they're too loud, they want the neighbors to complain. It was taking a while, so I got out and was going to get dressed for a change in my closet. And I went in there and I started to change. And that's all I remember until I woke up. And then I remember I woke up and I thought I had, had a seizure because my muscles hurt and my head was just hurting real bad. Several hours later I woke up and realized I was tied up. That's all I remember. That's it. I mean, I would tell you more if I remember more. I just don't. So the, turn it on. the jacuzzi was making noise, it was pretty loud. Mm -hmm. You couldn't hear anything over that. I you didn't hear anything. Hear anybody scream? No. Mm -hmm. Hear the dogs? Well, you could hear the dogs bark. Yeah, because they were right outside our window. <clears throat> so did he have to go outside to get them? I don't think so. Usually he just calls them and they come. They come in the doggy door? Yeah. So you don't have to open the door? Sometimes, yeah. Because some of the little ones don't want to come in. They're not. That if you opened the door last night, you would have heard that, right? I don't think so. The front? No, you mean the back door. She told the police that she went into her closet, put on some lotion, and then lost consciousness. She thought it was because she hit her head or was hit by someone. After an unknown amount of time, she woke up and saw that she was tied. When she called for help, she must have passed out again because she thought she was having another seizure because her body always felt the same after having one. She said she felt this way. What she thought was the only strange thing about that day was that a car they didn't know had been following them home hours before. I think when we left CVS, there was a, a car following us because when we came in our neighborhood, it was still behind us. 
and he was really close. And my husband, I'd get upset with him because he he would drive slower to when someone was tailgating him, and I'd tell him, "Don't do that," because you know it's dangerous. But the guy turned left, and we turned right, and so we thought it was just coincidence. And I keep trying to remember. But investigators were still dubious about her story. They couldn't understand how she hadn't seen or heard anything, especially given how violent the scene was and how loud Jim likely would have been while fighting off whoever the attacker or attackers were. Given his defensive wounds, the struggle must have lasted for a while and it could not have been a quiet ordeal. They also couldn't fathom why someone would kill Jim but leave her alive and virtually unscathed with just a few bruises and small scratches. It was such a different scene in both closets. Y'all had no disagreements? No. At all? Not along very well. You ever have any fights? Usually they were with my daughter, but she's been gone for five years now, so no. Part of our job is what we do is we gather witness statements, okay? We also search for video cameras, mm -hmm. okay? And a couple of your neighbors had video cameras mm -hmm. and wanted to get your house pretty well, mm -hmm. okay? Your front door was locked, your back door was locked. Nobody came in mm -hmm. through the garage, mm -hmm. okay? We were hundreds and hundreds of murders. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we we work cold-blooded killers mm -hmm. that just on the street that would just kill somebody for nothing. Then sometimes we work murders that they're in an argument and something happens. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's two different types of people. At one point, Sandra mentioned that she thought she needed to talk to a lawyer, given the way the questions were going, but the interview continued. Because if you argue with somebody and you lose it, Mm. Your temper and an argument That's happens. That's not what happened. That's not what happened. And I think I'm going to stop talking now because I think I'm going to need a lawyer because I know how this works. I hurt all over and my head hurts. How often do you have seizures like that? I'm not able to drive anymore. How frequent? Um, at least once a month, maybe. When was the last time you had one of those? Um, about a month ago. No one in the neighborhood heard a noise or dogs barking. There was nothing strange about it for them. One neighbor worked in his garage until 1 a.m. and said he hadn't heard or seen anything odd near the house or on the streets. No noise, no cars, no dogs, nothing. He was shocked that someone had broken into his house right in front of him since he thought he was the more likely target. As he worked on his things alone with the garage door wide open, he thought that if anyone was going to be robbed, it would probably be him. Officers said there were no signs of breaking in, and the drawers inside looked like they had been carefully taken out, emptied, and put back in their places, not like someone was searching quickly for valuables. They thought it was strange that the murder weapon, which came from the Melgar's kitchen, was left in the jacuzzi at the scene of the crime. Investigators also saw that Sandra could have easily used a bath mat or a pillowcase to push a chair against the door. It was interesting that neither Jim nor Sandra had any ligature marks, since that's what they would have seen if they had been tied down. This led them to believe that Jim had been tied up after he had died, not before he was killed. Even though Liz and Sandra said that things were missing, police and experts said that the evidence did not point to a home invasion and that Sandra had set up the scene. When Sandra was asked to take a voluntary polygraph test, she said no because she was scared that being cold and shaking might hurt her chances. I'm not trying to cause you trouble or cause you pain. But we have a procedure. Are you familiar with a polygraph exam? Mm -hmm. We uh, have a person that's going to come here. He's probably I here now. I can't do it now. I'm just a nervous wreck right now. Okay, well, let me I explain. Just can't do let me explain now. this. <clears throat> And I'd rather get a, talk to a lawyer about it because I, I already I already feel like you know I know where this is going. Okay, well I want you to understand. Now I understand that you're 
upset, understand that you've been through a lot. This person that does this is a professional and is able to filter for that. And I want you to meet with him and talk to him, no matter if you take the exam or not. We're not trying to pin something on you. We're not trying to get you to say that you've done something that you haven't done. I'm asking you to also, you know, try to dig deep. I understand that you said that you were you were struck and that you went unconscious. I understand that. But I'm asking you to really dig you know, dig deep because you know you were there. You I don't weren't. think I went unconscious. Okay. I mean, I think having a seizure is different from going. I mean, it's okay. the same. I understand. It's the same. You said that you, you know, when you've had those experiences, that you forget things, and we understand that. But you know, and I'm not a doctor, but I'm asking you, you know, of course, for you and for us, for your husband's sake, you know, if you can dig down and try to remember anything. How you feeling? Freezing. How did the meeting go? I guess okay. Did you take the polygraph? No. How come? I don't I needed to wait because I'm just too shaky right now. You know, something I want you to understand is that we go to all extremes. Uh -huh. You know, we don't quit. You're going to see a lot of me. You're going to see a lot of my partner. We're going to learn everything. But I hope you're we're processing somewhere else too, because it's it's not me. We're processing this. You're seeing your house too, and you know, we didn't just walk into this ball game yesterday. I did yes. ask you to take a polygraph test. Yes, I did. And I know and I'm too shaken and I'm freezing. And what's your what's your explanation though? What's your excuse for not taking one? It's not holding water, Sandra. I'm just going to be honest with you. I just don't want to take it and then it's used against me. That's because, not possible. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. So, Those are not even admissible in court. What do you think should happen to the person that, if we catch that did this to your husband, what, what do you think his punishment or her punishment should be? Do you think they should get a second chance? No. What no. do you think should happen to them? Or her. They should go to prison. Isn't that what they normally do? They go to prison. Do you love your husband? Yes, I love my husband. Do you care about him? Yes. She wants to finally kill him. Of course. I don't think you do. Did you kill your husband? No, I didn't. Did you have anything to do with your husband's death? No. The detectives were sure of what had happened that night, so on December 24th, they called the office of the Harris County District Attorney to ask that Sandra Melgar be charged with murder. But the DA's office said no, because there wasn't enough proof. As tests from the scene started to come back, they showed that there was no blood other than Jim's, which was strange. An expert pointed out that someone might leave the house pretty clean. On some door handles, dresser drawer handles, the safe handle, and the scarves that were tied around Sandra. DNA profiles of men and women were found. These profiles didn't match any Melgar family members, but they weren't fully tested to find out where the DNA came from. Liz sent a message to the police saying she found a backpack in the garage with an Xbox inside. She thought someone had put it in a bag to steal it and then dropped or left it on their way out. This item also had the DNA profile of an unknown female. A tip came in a few days later about a man named Chad Sullivan who was acting strangely in the neighborhood that night. Sullivan, who was recently released from prison on assault charges after being convicted of theft, never answered when police tried to talk to him. Sandra later said that bits and pieces of her memory were starting to come back to her. She had a flashback of a young Hispanic woman talking to someone behind her in the closet. But investigators were still not sure. They kept building their case against Sandra over the next 18 months because they didn't think this was a failed robbery. Sandy Melgar was charged with first-degree murder in the summer of 2014 
which was almost two years after Jim's death. What a development here. A woman who once claimed to be the victim of a home invasion that ended up killing her husband is now charged with his murder. You may remember this story. Christmas Eve of 2012, Sandra Melger claimed somebody broke into her northwest Harris County home, tied her up in the closet, and murdered her husband. Well, now authorities say that was all an elaborate lie. Ms. Melgar says that uh, they were in the bathroom together, uh, her and her husband, uh, at approximately uh, 1 a.m. this morning, and at some time she blacked out, and the next thing she remembers is waking up in the closet tied up. It just seemed like something was really strange with how it all came down, with, with uh, them being tied up and just one person being killed. A year and a half later, 54-year-old Sandra Melgar is charged with her husband's murder. We were wondering, I mean, it was so weird that uh, what happened and how it happened, nothing was, didn't seem like we heard anything like anything had been stolen or anything like that. Now curious neighbors want to know what information led investigators to charge Mrs. Melgar and why it took so long. They have, after all, been unnerved for over a year, thinking a home invasion on their street was the work of ruthless thieves. Her defense team said that there was no physical evidence against her and that everyone was missing a very important point. She had no reason to do what she did. According to them, there was no way that something could have made her go crazy and hurt him over 50 times with blunt and sharp force. They said that someone or more than one person broke into the house from the back, and unfortunately, Robert and Jim were killed in the process. If the attack had been as bad as they said it was, they wanted to know why Sandra was found without any of Jim's blood on her. They said there had to be some proof on her, but her hands and nails were clean and her nails weren't broken. They also pointed out that she was only slightly hurt with some bruises on her upper arms. They thought the injuries would be worse given the nature of the crime. They also called attention to Sandra's many health problems, saying she could not have physically beaten him and gotten away. The defense said that the fact that unknown male and female DNA had been found in the house and hadn't been fully tested should be enough to make the jury doubt the accused. They said that Sandra couldn't be found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt if the jury had any reason to think that someone else might have done the crime. Lastly, they talked about how the lead investigator had to resign after changing the date on a search warrant for a murder case that had nothing to do with the current case. They said that the prosecution's case was poorly put together and based only on evidence that was already available. Defending Sandra, the prosecutor said her story didn't make any sense and gave two possible reasons for her murder. They told her that she wanted a divorce but was afraid of being shunned because they were both Jehovah's Witnesses. However, Sandra's family and friends said she had not said anything about wanting to leave her husband. Sandra would get money from Jim's $250,000 life insurance policy, which was the second reason. The prosecution said Sandra could have either tied Jim up before stabbing him, possibly to make it look like a sex game, or she could have stabbed and hit him with a rock before tying him up. So the knots might have been loose because they weren't needed to hold him down. They said Sandra set up the scene and then tied her hands and feet together at the end. Celestina Rossi, a researcher who looks at blood spatter and breaks down crime scenes, was called as a witness by the prosecution. She said in court that the crime scene did not look like a home invasion because there were no signs of forced entry and the dresser drawers were all over the place. Rossi also pointed out that the candle on Jim's nightstand was still lit, which would normally mean that there was a fight near the closet where Jim was killed. She agreed with the medical examiner that all of Jim's wounds were self-defense wounds and pointed out that his gun was still loaded and not touched, only a few inches from his body. The government said that since his wife was attacking him, he would probably defend himself by taking her gun away rather than killing her. They also didn't think it was someone else who put the chair in front of the door, because Sandra could have done it herself by putting a pillowcase under it to close herself in. 
Closing arguments have just wrapped up in the case against a woman accused of murdering her husband and then trying to cover it up. Channel 2's Lee Felici is joining us live downtown with what we're learning from the courtroom as we wait for a verdict in this case. Lee? Yes, Bill. Well, the prosecutor arguing very strongly that Sandra Melgar did murder her husband. The defense saying there was shoddy detective work and the evidence just does not add up. Now it's up to the jury. Sandra Melgar's fate lies in their hands. Thank you. Closing arguments began this afternoon. Okay. You guys saw the photos. You saw all the wounds that he had, the 13 stab wounds, and all the other wounds that he had in his body and his head. Certainly that person intended to kill him, or that person certainly intended to cause serious bodily injury, which resulted in death. We've proven all of those things. In the Sandra Melgar case. There's no physical evidence in this case that points to her at all. The prosecution graphically painting a picture from their case. And while he isn't looking, she makes a strike straight up all the way to his neck. That's what that first strike is. Jamie, of course, gets up to try and defend himself, turns around, and that's when she gets him on the, on the thumb. And that's when the blood starts spurting out onto the chair. The defense criticizing shoddy detective work and saying the evidence is just not there. Look at what remains. No broken nails, no problems with the hands, no bruising here where you would expect it if a knife was used. So the jury is expected to deliberate for only a few more minutes until about 5.15, then they'll be back at it again tomorrow morning. We're live at the Harris County Criminal Courthouse, Lee for Lisi, KPRC, Channel 2. In August 2017, the jury thought about the case for eight hours. They couldn't agree on what to do on the first day, but by the second day, they had made up their minds. Sandra Melgar killed her husband, Jim, and was found guilty. She was given 27 years in prison. Liz said that when the verdict was read, there was a gasp that could be heard throughout the courtroom. Sandra sobbed and almost passed out. She said that for a moment, she thought about her mother killing her father but now she didn't think that was possible. In court, no one really thought she would be found guilty. Jim's family and Sandra's family both believe her story and support her claims that she is innocent. Being fair about it is hard because these are my parents, but I tried to look at the evidence first. I still want justice for my dad in the end. It wasn't my mom who did this. I want to know. I'm sure she didn't do this. Liz said, I'm going to keep fighting until we can prove that. The prosecution was pleased with the outcome and the sentence that was given. As later said by the jury foreman, they said Sandra told a story that didn't make sense or add up. The jury also didn't believe her. Both mine and probably my fellow jurors, pendulum, uh, guilt or innocence, swung back and forth throughout the entire trial. What was your first impression of Sandra? Was how could this diminutive looking middle-aged lady possibly have committed this crime? Uh, it, was, it was frankly incredulous to see it at first. Uh, it didn't compute. Uh, I didn't, didn't think she could have done it at first. One, I'll say Colleen's, the prosecutor's testimony, right? It all made sense. Now, was it absolutely provable? Uh, uh, no, but it's the only thing that made sense. During the, uh, the trial, prosecution had acquired all the medical records and showed and just listed the dates up there and everything else of her doctor's visits, no seizure, no seizure, no seizure, getting better, you know, that kind of stuff. So we watched almost all the police video over again uh, during deliberations and, and that's what brought the other people over uh, until we had a unanimous verdict. A couple of months later, Sandra's team filed an appeal requesting a retrial. However, their request was denied. New at six, a celebrity defense attorney is taking on the case of a Houston woman convicted of murdering her husband, Kathleen Zellner, who was featured in the Netflix. In 2018, well-known defense lawyer Kathleen Zellner said she would be taking on Sandra's case because she thought she was innocent. Kathleen Zellner has helped 19 people who were wrongfully convicted get their freedom. When she started working with Stephen Avery, after he was convicted of killing Teresa Halbach in 2005, the Netflix show Making a Murderer brought her a lot of attention. 
We are ready to hear argument in cause number PD 024320, Sandra Jean Melgar versus the state of Texas. Good morning uh, to the court. I'm George McCall Seacrest Jr. from Houston, and along with Allison Seacrest, we represent Sandy Melgar on appeal and represented her at trial. The state did not prove Sandra Melgar's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, and I contend based upon a fair and full reading of the record in this case, and based upon its unique facts, the evidence is legally insufficient as a matter of law. Yeah, let me ask you a question real quick. Sure. So I know the state doesn't have to prove motive. They speculate about what your client's motive might have been. But if there's anything in the record or in the briefs, I missed it. Is there any evidence of any what, what would the motive to kill Jaime have been? Zero. According, Z let, let me I mean, no, no, not for your client. I mean, for someone else to kill him. Oh, uh, I, uh, I, I, I be we believe it was home invasion. And we the, that would be the motive. We believe that, in fact, people entered the home. We think this business about no breaking and entering, the garage door was up. There was an unlockable interior door. And there was, contrary to the Court of Appeals opinion, there was evidence that property was missing. Opioids were missing, a television set, jewelry, cash. That That is the motive uh, for why, why, why someone would, else did it. Why would they not have killed your client, too? I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I, I'd, have to, I'd have to speculate. There was another appeal for Sandra but it was turned down again. One of the judges said that there is enough evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt every important part of the crime. The Innocence Project of Texas said they would also be working on Sandra's case in late 2022. The woman has talked from jail and keeps telling the same story she always has. They got it wrong. They, uh, they got it completely wrong. Sandra, did you kill your husband? No, I did not kill my husband. No. And you have grandkids. And my grandbabies, yeah. You're missing out on. I know. I know that really hurts me. I, I miss them so much. I mean, I'm just going to keep fighting this until I'm out of here. That's all I can do. People have had different opinions about this case from the start because it is so strange, tough, and sad. There are many people who think Sandra planned the whole crime and set up the scene to get away with murder, while others think she is just as much of a victim. From the start, the police were sure it was her. They made up the narrative and the killer or killers are still out there. A lot of websites, podcasts, and groups are trying to get her released, but some are also trying to keep her in. It's easy to see how bitter this case and conviction have been. No matter what anyone thinks, that night still leaves a lot of questions unanswered. Does someone deserve to be in jail for murder? Or is the real killer already there? Sandra Melgar will be eligible for parole in 2031. If she is not granted parole, her release date is August 2044. She will be 85 years old. Jim Melgar was a kind, hardworking, and thoughtful man with a great sense of humor and a big heart. He is missed dearly by everyone. With so many questions about what happened still lingering, family and friends say it only becomes harder to find closure when that was already so tough to get in the first place. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. In March 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic struck the United States and the entire world began to shut down. People were overcome with shock and fear of an unknown disease. On March 23rd, Gretchen Anthony, 12, who was visiting her father at the time, received a text message from her mother. Good morning. I have tested positive for the coronavirus. That means I will have to stay home for at least two weeks. Okay, I really hope you feel better, Ava responded. Soon after, her mother stopped sharing the location of her phone with her daughter. Friends and family members received several text messages over the next three days, detailing Gretchen's deteriorating condition. What was strange was that no one could reach the 51-year-old woman, and she did not even call her beloved young daughter, which was unusual for a loving mother. 
those close to her began to suspect something far worse than an acute case of COVID-19. Someone else was sending messages from Gretchen's phone to hide her disappearance. The police were called in, and investigators looking for Gretchen quickly realized that someone was using the pandemic to conceal the woman's disappearance. Gretchen was born January 8, 1969, in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. She spent the majority of her life up north, attending fashion school in New York City, before relocating to New Jersey, where she eventually became an educator. In 2006, the blue-eyed blonde relocated to Jupiter, Palm Beach County's northernmost city. After eight years of working in the county's private schools, Gretchen decided to try something new and accepted a position in the Human Resources Department of Viking, an electrical contractor. Gretchen enjoyed the opportunity to interact with new people through her position. She regarded the workforce as her second family. Her first marriage did not work out, but the former couple remained on good terms and raised their daughter with shared custody. Gretchen lived an active lifestyle and spent a lot of time playing sports. She met David Anthony while participating in sports. David, Gretchen's personal trainer and second husband, was charismatic and charming. Women from across the county came to see the young, muscular trainer. David was a star in the gym, attracting a large number of new students. Gretchen fell in love. The romance progressed rapidly. Following a brief engagement, the couple married at the Elvis Chapel in Las Vegas. Gretchen Stoughton Crane changed her name to Gretchen Stoughton Anthony in 2015, and she believes she has found the husband of her dreams. Gretchen's daughter adored her stepfather and even called him bonus dad. The couple's marriage lasted five years. However, the relationship that began with magic and perfect happiness evolved into a woman's fear for her own safety. When tragedy struck, police and later journalists began to investigate the identity of the second spouse. They were in for plenty of surprises. David Ethan Anthony was originally known as David Anthony Dutch before changing his name. David Anthony Dutch, a standout college basketball player, was arrested in 1997 for robbing a blockbuster video store with a water pistol and assaulting a police officer. In each case, he entered a plea bargain and served some time in jail. David grew up in Palm Beach Gardens without a father, so he spent much of his childhood and adolescence alone. He didn't say much, was withdrawn, had low self-esteem, and was bullied at school for his weight. He wasn't even allowed to participate in a recreational sports league because he was so much larger than the other kids. Not surprisingly, as a teenager, David suffered from severe depression and developed symptoms that his family suspected were indicative of bipolar disorder. He refused to take medication, instead focusing on sports and excelling at them. David received a scholarship to play college basketball after graduating from high school and quickly rose to prominence on the team. He idolized basketball legends and named his Husky Kobe after his favorite player, Kobe Bryant. On January 26, 2020, the idol died in a helicopter crash, which contributed to David's unstable behavior. Meanwhile, the smart, attractive coach ignored mental issues, basked in his well-deserved popularity, and married Gresham. The couple lived an active lifestyle. David liked bicycling. David liked bicycling, deep sea fishing, and kayaking. Gretchen worked out hard in the gym, went to the beach, kayaked and practiced yoga. Unfortunately, only the first two years of marriage proved to be happy. The smiling blonde would spend the next three years trying to leave. Gretchen admitted to her friends that her husband's behavior was becoming increasingly manic and that he occasionally insulted her. They even went through a six-month breakup before reconciling. David's former boss at the gym, Tabitha Hopkins, later admitted to noticing strange mood swings in David. In 2017, things became so bad that Tabitha was forced to fire him for his aggressive behavior, particularly towards women. David was behaving strangely and refused to seek help. In 2018, the man became obsessed with the end of the world and packed his truck with three large bags of rice, several pots and pans, and ten pairs of shoes. His family thought the episode was a sign of bipolar and manic depressive disorder. Bad periods were followed by good ones, during which David attempted to change his behavior. He even persuaded Tabitha Hopkins to give him his job back by assuring the gym owner that he was trying to be a better person and attending self-help seminars. Tabitha softened. There was no denying David's abilities as a trainer. The clients were overjoyed with him. David's condition deteriorated over time as his mental illness was not treated. 
Gretchen recognized her husband's problems and told her friends. She admitted to locking herself in their bedroom on occasion in order to increase the distance between them. I noticed this crazy look in his eyes. She texted a friend named Dawn one morning in late December. David was gaining momentum, and I didn't know what he was capable of. I'm watching him on the cameras and waiting for him to go to bed, Gretchen wrote at the end of the day. Then I'll go downstairs, get a knife, and put it under my pillow, just in case, and hopefully sleep. That same year, on Christmas Eve, Gretchen couldn't find her personal items. She searched the house, including David's backpack, and discovered her wedding ring, passport, driver's license, credit cards, and some money. Gretchen was so disturbed by the incident that she texted Dawn, her boss and friend, to express her fear of her own husband. By the end of the month, Gretchen had decided to end the turbulent relationship. In December 2019, she forced David to relocate from the townhouse to her mother's nearby home and change the locks. During this time, David's colleagues noticed a gradual shift in his behavior. The trainer was usually one of the first to arrive at the gym, but due to family events, he began to... He appeared increasingly withdrawn and sullen as time passed. On January 26th, David's idol, Kobe Bryant, died. When Kobe Bryant died, something happened that, as Tabitha recalls, you'd think David and Kobe Bryant were best friends. It traumatized him. In the days that followed, David became hysterical, crying and wailing in front of the fitness club groups he led and refusing to leave. Despite his emotionally fragile state, David actively participated in gratitude training, a contentious self-improvement program that critics compared to a cult. He paid thousands of dollars for seminars but refused to tell his family what he was doing during them. David's behavior regressed. On February 24th, he failed to arrive at work. When Tabitha tried to find out if he was okay, he attacked her and the supervisor decided to terminate the employee permanently. This time, Tabitha saw David's terrifying rage and was terrified. Hopkins informed Gretchen about the incident and advised her to be cautious. That's the last time I talked to Gretchen, she would later say. Gretchen filed for divorce four days later, on February 28, 2020, just a few weeks before she disappeared. David's stability rapidly deteriorated and he became more hostile. On March 7, the woman David had begun dating reserved a seat in an unusual art class. They were to drink wine and draw pictures while guided by the instructor. However, the evening did not go as planned. When David attempted to hug his companion during class and she refused, he jumped up, yelled at her in the middle of the class and ran outside. David's behavior terrified the young woman and she decided not to continue the conversation, informing him that he could not stay with her tonight. When they got to his truck, it was clear that David had different ideas about the situation. She had only known David for a month when he decided to move in with her. Duffel bags containing men's clothes were spread out on her bed and dining room table, and food from his mother's house was stored in the freezer. Kobe, David's husky, was running around in the backyard. David only left after a new friend contacted her neighborhood security company and Gretchen went missing. Her family informed investigators that David was returning to her home after he had left. The young woman was concerned about her safety and installed surveillance cameras throughout her home and garage. On March 11, the World Health Organization declared a pandemic. A few days later, David arrived at Gretchen's house in the early morning, convinced that the pandemic was an end, a world prophecy. He believed the world was ending and walked around the windows pleading with his almost ex-wife to accompany him to Costa Rica, where he hoped they could escape the virus. After a few hours, regression relented and let David enter the house. That evening, a patrolling police officer noticed David visibly nervous and sweaty, running around outside a Riviera Beach restaurant and approaching a group of teenage girls. The officer noticed David's license plate, which was partially covered with black duct tape, and approached him. David claimed that his 12-year-old stepdaughter had taped the license plate and became increasingly nervous. The man ignored the police officer's orders not to move, yanked open his truck's door, and began searching for something under the seat. Fearing what might happen next, the officer pointed a gun at David and ordered him to the ground. When the officer searched under the driver's seat, where David was attempting to reach, they discovered a large knife. David was arrested for resisting arrest, but he posted bail and was released a few days later. The pandemic was gaining momentum. Some states began prohibiting people from leaving their homes as early as March 20. Gretchen, 
like everyone else, was trying to figure out how to adapt to the new reality. She shared virus-related videos and safety tips, as well as memes and jokes mocking the absurdity of the new normal. On Thursday, March 19, she posted a quote from a meditation blog, There is chaos around you. The wisest choice is to create peace within yourself. After that, her profile was no longer active, and she stopped answering calls and messages. For all of her loved ones, this moment marked the beginning and end of their lives. On March 23, 2020, Gretchen and Anthony began texting their friends and family. Gretchen sent a series of messages to friends and family over several days, first stating that she was quarantined at home and then describing her deteriorating condition and hospitalization in the emergency room at Jupiter Medical Center. Another message stated that she had been transferred to another CDC facility that did not exist. On March 24, Don Paris, Gretchen's supervisor and friend, received a message from her saying, I tested positive for coronavirus early this morning. This is bad news, but I'm at a coronavirus KDC treatment center that only handles COVID cases. The good news is that my blood type can potentially be used in treatment. I'm not sure if you remember when I said I have a strain of mad cow disease in my blood. Well, that strain is important for gathering more answers and finding she could be placed in a medically induced coma and lose her ability to write. Jeff Dreer did not believe the reports. He was perplexed by the numerous text errors and abbreviations. The tone of voice in the messages sounded more like David Anthony, and Jeff became concerned. Furthermore, it bothered everyone who received these messages that no one, including his daughter Gretchen, ever called. Friends couldn't imagine Gretchen dying from anything because she was in great shape and took her health very seriously. When calls to the medical center confirmed that Gretchen Anthony had not been admitted, her family and friends decided to contact the police to see how she was doing. Brett and Anthony's boss reported to the police that he was last at work on March 20, when he called her insurance company to see if he was receiving medical care. They informed him that there had been no referrals under her policy to process treatment. Jupiter Police Detective Jared Kennison contacted Jupiter Medical Center and discovered that the hospital's records did not include any information about such a patient. In fact, police discovered that Gretchen had not visited Jupiter Medical Center since 2008. Police searched the medical center parking lot and discovered a Mini Cooper with Gretchen's purse in the most visible spot, which prompted patrol officers to become concerned. Officers visited the missing person's home. What they discovered at Gretchen's house was alarming, turning a routine visit into a possible murder case. A neighbor approached the officers and provided disturbing information. Early Saturday morning, March 21, I heard a desperate female screaming as if she was being attacked. And then I heard her scream, no. Then I heard her scream, no. Then I heard something like, it hurts. Stop. The scream was quite serious. Unfortunately, Gretchen did not contact emergency services. Some people are simply wary of contacting the police. Officers became even more concerned when another neighbor reported seeing a soapy substance leaking from under Gretchen's garage door. The front door to the garage was locked and a key was broken in the deadbolt. When officers opened the door, they noticed a strong, pungent odor of cleaning product in the garage. Patrol officers used body cameras to search the house multiple times. They discovered signs of a violent struggle, such as a broken picture frame, shards of glass on Gretchen's bed, and a soiled towel. Officers also discovered that surveillance cameras inside the house had been removed from the walls possibly to destroy compromising evidence, and contacted a service provider to retrieve the footage from the cloud. Police investigated and discovered that a neighbor had photographed a black Nissan pickup truck parked outside Gretchen's home following the terrifying scream. Gretchen's almost ex-husband, David Anthony, owned the exact same pickup truck before abruptly leaving. His mother told police that her son packed his truck and left on Tuesday, March 24, 2020, saying he was going to Costa Rica. Their suspicions were heightened when they saw a video shot in the parking lot of Jupiter Medical Center, where Gretchen's car was discovered. A Mini Cooper pulled into a parking spot, and a tall figure about the height of David Anthony emerged from the vehicle. Investigators began tracking Gretchen's mobile and discovered that it was registered in the Pensacola, Florida area. As later confirmed, David had driven only 600 miles to Pensacola, Florida, the westernmost city, after stopping at a couple of local pawn shops to sell some women's jewelry. He and his dog Kobe continued west, 
spending one night at a hotel in Picos, Texas, before settling in Las Cruces, New Mexico. David contacted detectives from 2,000 miles away and reported that Gretchen was alive and in no danger. He explained that his spouse had given him a written statement, which he read aloud on the phone. According to the statement, Gretchen discovered financial crimes at her workplace and fled Florida with David, fearing for her life. The statement also stated that she had fled from her first ex-husband, Jeff. Detectives did not believe it and continued their investigation. They tracked Gretchen and David's cell phone signals, which indicated that the two phones were in contact, expecting the worst. On March 29, detectives obtained a warrant to impound the truck and worked with Las Cruces police to arrange a traffic stop. Las Cruces police detained David and seized his truck and property, including his and Gretchen's phones, but there was insufficient evidence to bring him in for questioning. He was allowed to simply walk away. On March 30, 2020, Jupiter police obtained electronic records from Gretchen's home and investigators discovered the truth. On March 21, David lurked silently on the porch that overlooked the back of the garage. He was holding an elongated object. Gretchen appeared six minutes later in the video. The video shows David forcibly driving her into the garage and a scream can be heard over it. She first yelled to the Amazon Alexa device in the garage, Alexa, turn on the lights in the garage. The surveillance camera audio then recorded a muffled thud and Gretchen's muffled screams. She yelled at Alexa again, Alexa, call 911. David had no idea that unless he programmed her smart speaker to call 911, it would not call the police in an emergency. After a while, David's face appeared in the frame and his hands were gloved in one shot. Gretchen's bloodied head could be seen as he walked around the garage. On March 30, investigators had seen enough. Detectives obtained a warrant for David's arrest. The case evolved from a missing persons case to a murder investigation. Detective Kennison arrived in Las Cruces shortly before midnight on March 31st. Police arrested David outside a convenience store. A Jupiter detective questioned him at the state police headquarters in Las Cruces, New Mexico. They had one goal, to persuade David to reveal the location of Gretchen's body, and the detective failed. David claimed Gretchen was alive. During the interrogation, David Anthony repeated this claim 35 times. Detectives even tried using a voice recording of Gretchen's daughter, whom David adored. With her father's permission, the girl recorded her request. David, it's Eva. I love you. I'm scared. I miss my mom, she said to him. I need to know where my mom is. Please do the right thing and tell me where my mom is. Please. I love you. Detectives played the tape for David, but he remained unconcerned. While incarcerated, he refused to discuss what had happened to Gretchen. He remained silent for months, as is typical of him. David understood how difficult it would be for the prosecutor to obtain a conviction without Gretchen's body. He was charged with second-degree murder and extradited to Florida. While David was in custody in Palm Beach County, Florida, a grand jury indicted him for kidnapping and increased the murder charge from second-degree to first-degree murder. This marked a turning point. And in December 2020, after eight months in prison, the criminal agreed to a plea deal with the prosecutor. In fact, he could have received the death penalty for first-degree murder. Under the terms of the agreement, David would plead guilty to second-degree murder in exchange for a 38-year sentence. The primary condition of the agreement was that he lead investigators to Gretchen's body. On December 21, nine months after Gretchen Anthony's disappearance, David Anthony admitted what everyone knew. He killed his wife. Gretchen's body was discovered wrapped in a blanket three miles away in the woods behind a Walmart and near a nursing home. Investigators determined that she died from stab wounds to the neck and torso. There were numerous defensive wounds indicating that she was fighting for her life. At the sentencing hearing, David Anthony stated that the COVID-19 pandemic contributed to his crime stemmed from his perception of the pandemic as Armageddon, forcing him to flee. My delusions saw the COVID pandemic as a prophecy of the end of the world in Armageddon that I felt compelled to avoid at all costs. According to the plea agreement, David Anthony was sentenced to 38 years in prison on January 14, 2021. He is currently serving his sentence at Martin Correctional Institution in Florida. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more.
The tragic story of the Rose family is regarded as one of the most bizarre and perplexing crimes committed in America in recent years. This case stood out to investigators not only for its cynicism and cruelty, but also because the victims and alleged perpetrators were close relatives. Despite the fact that many years have passed since the crime was committed and the perpetrator has long served his harsh sentence in prison, this story still has many unanswered questions and white spots. Many people still question the fairness of the court's decision. Now let us get down to business. It was an ordinary family living in a provincial suburb of Bristol, Tennessee, who had never been on law enforcement's radar before. Curtis and Lena Maria Rose, an elderly couple who had lived together for more than 40 years, led the family. They had two grown daughters and six grandchildren, but we'll focus on the family members who were directly involved in this high-profile case. So at the time of the crime, the elderly owners, Curtis and Lena Maria Rose were present in the house and surrounding area, along with their eldest daughter, 39-year-old Tosha Milhorn, her husband James, and six children. Tosha and James had two shared children, and the other three were heirs from a previous relationship. A neighbor girl stopped by the house to play with them. It is worth noting that Tosha and James, along with their children, spent about two months living at Tosha's parents' house while their own home was being renovated. Later, another key player in those events, 19-year-old Seth Denton, arrived at the house. He was Tasha's eldest son, but his relationship with his mother and stepfather was strained, to say the least, and they avoided communicating with each other in any way possible. Their most recent meeting ended tragically, according to neighbors. The Rose couple was very happy and prosperous. Their daughter Tosha was happily married to James, who worked as an auto mechanic and enjoyed restoring vintage cars. The carnage took place at the Rose couple's family home. Police officers who responded to the call later described it as the worst crime scene they had ever seen and the bloodiest in the history of their quiet county. The bodies of two women, Lena, Maria, and Tosha, a mother and daughter, were discovered in the house, shot nearly point blank. Tosha was sitting in a chair at the dining room table, while her mother lay on the floor between the table and the refrigerator. James, Tosha's husband, was also lying on the doorstep of the house, critically injured and being rushed to the hospital. Despite the doctor's efforts, the man died as a result of severe internal injuries and blood loss. There were no injuries among the children in the house. They were most likely not targeted by the shooter or were simply out of his field of vision during the adult's massacre. Almost immediately after the crime, the police received two consecutive phone calls. The first call came from the house's owner, Curtis Rose, who reported that his eldest grandson, Seth, had committed a shooting and then fled the scene. But then Seth called, telling a different version of what had happened and blaming it all on his grandfather, Curtis. In addition, Seth was wounded in the arm and Curtis admitted to shooting him, claiming that he was trying to detain his grandson and prevent him from fleeing the scene of the massacre. Seth Denton, the alleged killer, was apprehended in a hospital after seeking medical attention for the wound. The investigation then sought to retrace the tragic events and determine what actually occurred in the Rose family's home. Surprisingly, only one version was used as the foundation for the investigation, with the second version receiving serious consideration only a few years later. On August 29, 2015, around 6 p.m., Residents of houses near the crime scene heard a series of gunshots. No one paid much attention because there were forests nearby where hunting wild animals and birds was permitted. Later, one of the neighbors stated that he was concerned about the number of shots and then the silence, but he did not believe it was a good reason to call the police. Another neighbor testified at the trial that um, in addition to the gunshots, he heard screaming and went out onto his house's porch to see what was happening. At that point, he noticed a young man running down the path from the neighbor's house to a parked car on the road. <laughs> he was being pursued by another man, but the witness had a limited view of what was going on due to the trees along the road. He only saw the guy jump into the car. Then two shots rang out, and the car took off. Just a few minutes later, neighbors heard sirens and saw police and emergency vehicles approaching Rose's home. Soon, an air ambulance helicopter landed on the lawn outside the house, ready to pick up James, who was still alive. 
Everything was like a movie shoot and none of the witnesses knew what was going on. Arriving police officers were greeted by the elderly owner of the house who was holding a firearm. Another gun belonging to him was later discovered in his bedroom. Curtis provided his version of events, which was used as the foundation for the investigation and was long thought to be the only one. Curtis claims there was no reason to pretend trouble that day. In his and his wife's home, he saw his daughter, her son-in-law, and grandchildren, as well as a neighbor's child who came to play. He was tinkering with his trailer in the backyard of the house. He heard gunshots, but like most neighbors, didn't pay much attention, assuming they were hunters in the woods. Suddenly, his oldest grandson, Seth, appeared at the trailer, unannounced and excited. The young man said there had been a tragedy and asked him to contact emergency services. Curtis immediately followed his grandson into the house, where he discovered the bodies of his wife and daughter. Curtis immediately thought about the children in the house. They were in the other room, terrified, but none of them were injured. He led them to the back of the house and locked them up so they couldn't see the horror that was going on inside. While Curtis was calling 911, he noticed his grandson hurrying out of the house and running toward the road. The homeowner drew his gun and began chasing Seth, believing he was the murderer. As Seth got into the car, Grandpa fired two shots. One bullet shattered the rear window without hitting the driver, while the second struck Seth in the left shoulder. Despite his injuries, he managed to flee. But after reaching the nearest house, Seth paused to call the police and report what had happened. The local sheriff, who was conducting an investigation, was puzzled. The crime scene appeared so strange and illogical that he couldn't recall any similar cases. In a breaking news report, he stated that the investigators had a difficult task ahead of them in reconstructing the entire crime scene. Following the arrest of Seth Denton, it was necessary to determine why the young man treated his family members so cruelly. Most surprisingly, such a motive was quickly discovered. Seth was Tosha's eldest child, whom she had given birth to when she was very young. Her relationship with the boy's father did not work out, and her son was primarily raised by his grandparents. While the young woman settled her personal life, some reports indicate that Tosha suffered from bipolar affective disorder and visited the clinic on a regular basis. Her son may also inherit this disease. The boy harbored a deep resentment for his mother, whom he rarely saw. With age, this feeling evolved into hatred, which Seth frequently expressed to friends and relatives. After graduation, the guy decided to join the army, and when he returned home a year later, he settled back in with his grandparents. However, the young man soon realized that he wanted to start his own life and relocated to the city, where he rented a small apartment with a friend. He got a job at a local fast food restaurant, but shortly before the tragedy, he was fired. Family and friends spoke highly of Seth, noting that he had no violent tendencies, did not associate with bad companies and never broke the law. Despite these positive characteristics, detectives believed that Seth's main motivation for the crime was his dislike for his mother and her current spouse. According to the investigation, the events of that day unfolded as follows. Around 5 or p.m., Seth drove his car to his grandparents' house. He wore a camouflage jacket and had a semi-automatic rifle in the car. He left the car by the roadside and entered the house through the back door, carrying the weapon. Seth then fired several shots, killing his mother and grandmother and severely injuring his stepfather before leaving the jacket and rifle by the back door and going to his grandfather's house to ask him to call the cops. The order in which the shots were fired was never determined because Seth denied all guilt. Furthermore, it was unclear why he asked his grandfather to contact the police rather than fleeing the scene of the crime. It is assumed that his primary targets were his mother and stepfather and the man murdered his grandmother as an unnecessary witness. The main evidence proving Seth's guilt in the case was his jacket and rifle found on the threshold at the back door of the house, traces of blood on his shoes, and bullets discovered in his car. Surprisingly, approximately a hundred rounds of ammunition were discovered, but no one questioned why he required so many if he only intended to kill two people. Another unusual feature was the timing. According to the grandfather, 
Seth hurriedly left the house after he and his grandson entered and saw the terrible picture. Curtis found and rescued the children, called the police, pulled out his gun, and eventually caught up with his grandson and shot him twice. It wasn't until 2016 that the young man presented his version of events in court, which no one had previously considered for whatever reason. According to Seth, he has always been close to his grandparents, who raised him, but he avoids meetings with his mother at all costs. As a teenager, he frequently visited shooting ranges with his grandfather, who encouraged him to join the army. On that fateful day, Seth called his maternal aunt Amanda, his mother's younger sister, and explained that he was going to see his grandparents but did not want to meet his mother there. The woman was unaware that Tosha and her husband were visiting her parents, so she assured Seth that he could leave without fear of encountering his mother and stepfather. Amanda confirmed this information in court, stating that her nephew could not have known Tosha and James were at Rose's home. Seth had hoped to go to the shooting range with his grandfather, which is why he had brought a rifle and so many rounds of ammunition. He drove up to the house, grabbed the gun, and went directly to the trailer where Grandpa usually worked. There, his grandson showed him his rifle and they had a brief conversation about it. Curtis then walked towards the house, holding the rifle, and his grandson followed him. Seth knew his grandfather had a gun and expected him to follow him, and then they would shoot targets together. However, when Curtis entered the room, he immediately opened fire, leaving the people in the room with no time to react and no attempt to flee or hide. According to Seth's lawyers, Curtis may have been temporarily insane when he killed members of his family, but this version appeared untenable, so it was not initially considered or marked in court. Although traces of the victim's blood were found on an elderly man's clothes and shoes, he was not initially included in the list of suspects. The young man in the dock faced the death penalty for the premeditated murder of three of his family members. His grandfather had been a key witness in the case from the start, and despite openly stating that he was willing to kill his grandson that day, the court found his actions justified. Curtis Rose was not taken to the station or questioned as a suspect, and his account of the events of that day was accepted as the only true one. Furthermore, many details and inconsistencies were simply overlooked, and Seth's version was not even considered until a year and a half after the incident. The majority of the physical evidence confirmed Curtis's words, but what was missing from the picture was somehow ignored by the investigation. The main argument in court was that Mr. Rose had no obvious reason for killing his wife, daughter, and son-in-law. The concept of temporary insanity seemed unrealistic and untenable. The trial lasted more than a week, with nearly 200 pieces of evidence presented and dozens of witnesses, including neighbors, relatives, and family friends, testifying. The grandfather and grandson's testimony contradicted each other, and it was clear that one of them was lying. The jury deliberated over several days. They admitted to being emotionally and physically exhausted, but when it came time to reach a verdict, they all agreed that the defendant was guilty of all of the charges. Thus, Seth Denton was found guilty of three murders. However, after a thorough review of all of the evidence and circumstances surrounding the tragedy, the court decided to exclude the death penalty from the possible punishments, instead imposing a life sentence without the possibility of parole for the next 50 years. The convict himself never admitted guilt. He's currently serving his sentence in a Tennessee prison. The orphaned children of Tasha and James Milhorn were placed in the care of other family members, including their Aunt Amanda and Grandfather Curtis. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. It's a terrible and often destructive emotion that can make someone blind and make them do bad things. The terrible event that happened in Costa Rica a few years ago was caused by jealousy. In the history of forensics, this case is known as the case of Gerardo Cruz. But let's go through everything in order. The year he was born was February 1975 in Costa Rica. Not much is known about her family when she was young. The girl grew up in a place called Cuba with her mother, Sonia Fonseca. Samadhi went to one of the nearby schools. Even when he was young, 
he showed that he was a difficult and troubled person. People in the area who knew her say she wouldn't put up with being turned down and that she often got what she wanted by force or lying. Samity's beautiful looks and perfect body made it easy for men to fall in love with her, but she couldn't keep them. She was very pretty and knew how to make the most of her looks, but she put money and her own needs above all else out of greed and vanity, which turned off her suitors after a short time together. In her younger years, she was also very angry and jealous. Because she looks like a doll, Samadhi Fonseca worked for a few years as Barbie in one of the big bookstores owned by the Universal Company. It was during this time that the girl got a nickname that made her feel good and stuck with her forever. Samadhi had an affair with a successful reporter who worked on local TV not long after she graduated from high school. Her age difference with the man was 16 years. His name was Osvaldo Fernando Baleri. Samadhi was in her longest and most serious relationship but Baleri never asked her to marry him. They had a son named Christopher in 1996 and a daughter named Christina the next year. He broke up with the young woman in 2012, though, because of constant scandals and jealousy. He died suddenly at the age of 53. Not long after Baleri died, Samadhi made the choice to do something on her own. She went to the house of her ex-lover and took it by changing the locks so that the family and heirs of the dead person could not get in. Samadhi also took some valuable things that belonged to the person who died. The Ballery family was very angry and went to court right away to punish Samadhi for stealing. The young woman was told to leave the house by the police, but she was not charged with a crime. Fonseca was in a lot of other relationships besides Miguel Angel Perez. She had her third child, a daughter named Maria, with him. Some reports say that this relationship was registered, but after a few years, they got a divorce. Some sources, though, say that Samadhi wasn't married. She also gave her lover's last name to her youngest daughter, without telling him or getting his permission. Although it's interesting that some of Barbie's lovers have mysteriously vanished or died in strange ways, no one paid much attention to this for a long time. As an example, one of Samadhi's lovers disappeared soon after he broke up with a woman who was rude and angry. The man has still not been found, and many people are sure that Fonseca has something to do with this case. However, strong proof of her guilt could not be found. Diaco, Samadhi's other ex-lover, died in a terrible accident after they broke up. He was killed, and it looked like someone tried to rob him but failed. It was never found out who killed those people. Again, a lot of people thought Samadhi had something to do with the crime, but no solid proof was found against her. But Gerardo Cruz was her most well-known victim. For Cruz, Costa Rica is home. He was born in San Jose in December 1992. He had never met his own father because the boy's real father had left the family before he was born. His mother, Anna Patricia, soon got married to Hermes Rodriguez, Rodriguez took the baby in and raised him as his own. After a few years, Gerardo got a sister named Milena. When the guy was young, he was calm and didn't worry about anything. His school was like any other. He liked motorcycles, and he met his true love, a girl named Carol, early in life. When Gerardo was 23, he moved in with his girlfriend and their four-year-old daughter, Genesis Cruz, they lived with his aunt and uncle in the suburb of San Sebastian. To make sure his family had everything they needed, the young father got a job at a nearby bakery. He and his wife were very happy. Soon they found out for the second time that they were going to have a baby. Gerardo met Samadhi in the summer of 2015, when Samadhi was shopping at the bakery where Gerardo worked. The woman was 40 years old at the time, but she was still very pretty, liked dressing in sexy ways, and flirted with younger men. As she got older, she started having affairs with men who were much younger than her. The attention from younger lovers probably made her feel good, even though they were almost 20 years younger than her. Even though the beautiful woman was with Cruz's family, Cruz quickly fell in love with her and started meeting with her in secret. The fact that she started going to the bakery almost every day to see her young lover caught the attention of other workers. Along with Samadhi, her oldest daughter Christina, who was 19 years old at the time, often showed up with her. 
At first, Gerardo did a great job of keeping his family life in check while meeting with his mistress in secret. Neither of the women in his life knew about the other. But soon, Gerardo, as they call him, let down his guard. To show off how good he was with women, he started to brag to his friends and co-workers about Samadhi and how she was a great mistress and gave him lots of gifts. The news quickly got to his mother, who tried to talk sense into her son and get him to leave his mistress. A few months into the relationship, Samadhi learned that her lover was pregnant and had a young daughter. They broke up in October of that year, 2015. The woman was so mad that she called and texted Carol, calling her names and threatening to kill Gerardo if he didn't belong to her alone. Gerardo was able to ask his wife to forgive him and keep the family together. When it came to his ex-lover, he didn't pay attention to her threats because he thought she would quickly calm down and find a new boyfriend. It's possible that he had no idea how sneaky and mean Samadhi would be. A mere few days after breaking up with Fonseca, Cruz happened upon a very public event. The young man was walking down a street in downtown when he saw an older man following a young girl while holding his phone so that the camera was under her miniskirt. The guy was so angry that he pulled out his phone and started recording what was going on. He then stopped the girl, told her everything, and told her to call the police. Cruz then went after the man and tried to take a picture of his face. He went after him for about two minutes and loudly asked him if he was having fun taking pictures of the girl's underwear without her knowledge. The man then got into a taxi and drove off. That same night, Gerardo posted the video he had made on his website. In just one night, the video went viral and users quickly figured out that the old man was Luis Sulmano Delgado, a former official who worked for the Ministry of Finance. The media quickly picked up the video and spread it across the country, making Gerardo a national star. The young man was asked to be on TV and radio shows and was interviewed almost every day for print publications. He talked about what he had seen, said that the former official had done something wrong, and said that he had no regrets and would do it again. Aside from that, Skilled lawyers hired by Sulmano Delgado started to work against Gerardo, accusing him of doing something wrong. They said that sharing the guy's videotape with other people was against the law, and they were getting ready to sue him in court. In fact, Cruz was shocked by what happened and didn't understand why they could judge him, but not the man who had done such a horrible thing to a girl. On October 7th, Gerardo did his last interview on the air of a locale radio station. He was sure he was right and didn't think he had anything to worry about. Gerardo had planned to meet up with his friend Oswald after work the next day, but he suddenly called off the meeting, saying he had to take care of something important. Later, he learned that that day, he got a message from Samadhi. In it, the young woman tricked him into going to the park in the evening for another interview. Gerardo didn't think anything was wrong, he just believed his ex-lover. When his shift was over, he went to the agreed-upon location, but there were no reporters waiting for him. Not long after, two unknown men showed up and took his bag. They then beat him and stabbed him several times in the chest and stomach before running away. Before he passed out, the hurt man was able to call his friend and tell them what happened. His friend then called the police and ambulance services right away. Gerardo was taken to the hospital right away and doctors there fought for 42 days to save his life. During this time, Gerardo had a lot of surgeries, but they were not able to save him. The 19th of November, Cruz passed away in the ICU. Since not long before the tragedy, he had become a real celebrity, and the whole country knew about his condition. In interviews that they did from time to time, Gerardo's family asked everyone to pray for his recovery. That's why they didn't know who or why could hurt Gerardo in that way. People from all over came to the young man's funeral to show their support for his family. They all hoped that the killers would be caught quickly by the police and given a fair punishment. At first, there were different stories about what happened. The first idea was that it was a murder robbery. In fact, Gerardo was attacked in the park at night, his bag was stolen, and he was stabbed with a knife which made it look like a normal theft. But just a few days before, Cruz put out a shocking video that implicated a well-known former official. So the second idea was that the person was killed in revenge. The media said and wrote that Sulmano Delgado might have hired hitmen to kill the young man, whose actions had hurt his reputation. 
The murder got a lot of attention in the news, and people took to the streets to demand that the killers be caught and punished. The police thought about different stories and looked for other people who might be Gerardo's enemies or people who wanted him to hurt. There was no progress in the investigation for a few months until May 2016, when a video from a street camera was found. There was video of two men running away from the place where Cruz was killed. These men were right away thought to be responsible, but it was up to the police to figure out who they were and find them. The tape was an important piece of evidence, and the case moved forward after it was made public. It was shown over and over on news shows, and people were told to pay close attention because these people could be dangerous criminals. The police could also make rough sketches of the men they were looking for and talk about their anthropometric data. Soon, one of the men's identities was known because he chose to turn himself in to the police and help with the investigation in the hopes that it would help him get a lighter sentence. Because he gave them information, the police were able to quickly find several other criminals who worked with him and the people who planned the crime. Soon, Samadi and her daughter Christina were taken into custody. Along with the mother and daughter, three other men were arrested. A cab driver named Ronald Arce, who had found the murderers, a worker named Cesar Chavez, who had acted as a go-between, and a young Miner who had been directly involved in the attack. Later, Omar Costa was also arrested. He had been following the victim and telling people where he was on the day of the attack. Phone calls and text messages were used to figure out what each person's role was and how they were connected to the crime. Samedi gave the order for the murder and had carefully planned the whole thing, even including telling her daughter Christina about it. To find hitmen to kill Gerardo, they asked their friends Ronald and Cesar for help. They wanted to make it look like a failed robbery in a park at night. Later, Omar joined them. It was his job to make sure the victim went to the agreed-upon place. Samadhi picked October 7th as the day of the attack. That day, she called all the people involved in the crime several times, gave them jobs, and made sure everyone stuck to the plan. In addition, the young woman demanded that they bring her some of her ex-lover's things as proof after they did the crime. Cruz thought he was going to an interview, when he left work and went straight to the park. He tried not to be late for the meeting, but he was attacked and stabbed several times. His bag and jacket were then taken, and the customer was given them as proof. The texts that showed Samadhi was guilty were the main proof. They clearly explained the murder plan and who was responsible for what. The woman was so sure that she could get away with it that she didn't even delete them. The woman did such a horrible thing because she was plain jealous. She didn't want to share her lover with his wife and thought that no one else would want him if he wasn't with her. She planned everything out and included her own daughter in her crime. Her daughter helped her with every part of the plan. The mother and daughter were arrested right away, and it was clear that they couldn't be freed on bail because the criminals would probably try to get away and leave the country. Their helpers were also put in jail before their trials, but Omar, who was in charge of surveillance and the youngest person involved in the crime, were given to authorities who deal with juvenile offenders. The investigation took about a year and a half, and the trial of everyone involved in the crime plot didn't start until December 2017. It also turned out that Samadhi had been charged with crimes before. In particular, she was arrested for making fake papers to get money from the government, but she only had to pay a fine. The story of Miguel Angel Perez has also come to light. He is the father of Samadhi's youngest daughter, it turned out that the young woman gave the child the last name of a man she used to date without his permission. Afterward, she used the court to get him to pay her alimony, which she did for more than three years. When it was discovered that the whole process was fake, the con artist was given three years in prison and a big fine. The court did change her sentence, though, because she had a young child. The five-year sentence was placed on hold. The murder victim's wife, Gerardo, admitted in court that she knew about his affair with Samadhi and that Samadhi had threatened to kill him. He did not pay much attention to the threats, though. The main reason for the crime was, as was already said, the woman's anger and pride because she couldn't accept that her young lover wanted to stay with his wife. The call logs showed that the mother and daughter planned the crime together. 
It was also made public that Christine had a nervous breakdown after the CCTV footage of the killers was made public. In tears, she called her mother and was about to tell the police what she had done. She tried to calm her daughter down by telling her that the investigation would never show who they were. The verdict wasn't made public until January 23, 2018. The court's decision said that Samadhi would spend 30 years in prison. Ronald, Caesar, her daughter, and her sister all got 25 years in prison. One of the killers went to a place for young offenders to stay, but the other was not found at that time. Omar, who had been following the victim, was found not guilty though. As moral compensation, $140,000 was given to the victim's family. The killers of Gerardo were given a fair sentence, which the family thanked the court for after the verdict was read. That being said, it was quickly made public that Samadhi and Christina's lawyers had asked the appeals court to lower the sentences. It was tried again in November 2019. At the same time, the second killer's name came to light. According to Ronald, this person took part in the killings, but did not know the details of the plan. Ronald and Caesar also went to the appeals court to try to get the sentence shortened. Because of this, each person involved in the crime got five years taken off their sentence. At this point, Samadhi is serving her 25-year sentence in a Costa Rican prison for women. Samadhi, on the other hand, will spend almost 20 years in prison. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. The discovery of Paige Bergfeld's car marked the start of a mysterious and perplexing story that unfolded on July 1, 2007. On that day, the missing Paige's red Ford Focus was discovered. However, the location and condition of the car raised numerous questions and serious concerns. The car was in a remote location that Paige rarely visited. It was also completely engulfed in flames, implying that something terrible and unusual had occurred. The county district attorney had been looking into this case with great interest, and his preliminary findings indicated that the fire around the car was deliberate. The fact that nothing else in the area had burned supported this conclusion. The strange incident with Paige Bergfeld's car was only the beginning of a much more complicated story. Paige's family and friends will remember June 28, 2007 as a special day. The young woman left her three children with her friend Carol Linderholm and left early in the morning on this ordinary day. Nothing pointed to trouble, and no one could have predicted what would happen next. Paige was a responsible mother who always called or came to pick up her children on time. This time, however, a warning was issued, but Paige never returned to pick up her children. Concerned friends and family members began attempting to contact her, but their efforts were futile. Jazz, the eldest of her children, took the initiative to look for the missing woman. She insisted on searching with Carol after sending several messages to her mother's phone and receiving no response. Jazz reported to the police station that her mother had not returned for her. This 911 call was critical in the beginning of the police investigation in the search for Paige Bergfeld. Paige's loved one's concern grew with each passing hour. The community was shocked by Paige's mysterious disappearance and many were eager to assist in the search for her. A massive public search was launched to reunite this young woman with her children and loved ones. On the same day, Paige's father, Frank Bergfeld, received a disturbing call from a sheriff's department official. The message was brief, but devastating. His daughter had vanished. Frank realized that something serious had occurred. He attempted to contact Paige, but received no response. Frank dialed his oldest son, Craig, who was on the other side of the country, terrified and desperate. Craig didn't think twice about purchasing a one-way ticket and arriving in town to assist in the search for his sister. Family members and friends joined forces with police and volunteers to launch a massive search. People from various neighborhoods began looking for Paige, combing the area and checking every corner for any sign of her whereabouts. Paige's relationships with her loved ones were investigated to see if they had anything to do with her disappearance. Authorities naturally focused on Paige's relationship with her first husband, Howard Bigler. 
That relationship started during her high school years. Paige enrolled in nursing school at the University of Florida after graduating from high school, where she met a young man named Howard Bigler. They began dating because their feelings for each other were mutual. Paige returned to Colorado after completing her nursing degree and continuing to live with her family. She and Howard Bigler married after some time in 1995. The spouses appeared to be a happy couple at first glance. They shared many interests and perspectives on life. However, there was one major schism in their marriage that eventually led to divorce. Paige wished to have a child and start a family, but Howard was not interested. On numerous occasions, this topic became the source of heated debates and discussions. None of their attempts to reach an agreement were successful, and the couple decided to divorce in 1997. Despite the divorce, their bond remained strong, and the former spouses remained friends. Paige later married Rob Dixon, but their marriage was also annulled. Paige reconnected with Howard after her divorce from Rob. Paige's first husband claimed to be one of the last people to see her alive on the 28th. They met in Eagle County, Colorado for personal reasons. They spent Thursday together before splitting up and returning to their respective cities. Howard confirmed that they kept in touch by phone after the meeting. In addition, when Howard learned of Paige's disappearance, he immediately contacted emergency services. He expressed his deep concern and belief that something terrible had happened to Paige while speaking with the operator. He observed that she would never abandon her children without a reason. Cell tower data confirmed the phone recording, indicating that Howard was in the Denver, Colorado area on the day Paige vanished, which is several hours away from where she vanished. This gave officers a reason to remove Howard from the suspect list. Paige's relationship with her second husband, Rob Dixon, was thoroughly investigated by police, who quickly uncovered numerous events that raised questions and warranted further investigation. Paige had reported Rob to the police twice for harassment during their marriage, it turned out. Paige took a job at a Denver strip club after her divorce from her first husband, where she met Rob Dixon, a wealthy man who had inherited a large fortune through his family's business. Paige and Rob married in 1998 after falling in love with each other. Paige's dream of becoming a mother was realized when the family moved to a luxurious home in Colorado. After a few years, the couple had three children who became the most important thing in her life. Paige and Rob were immersed in the world of luxury and led a well-to-do lifestyle during their first years of marriage. Suddenly, however, things started to fall apart, and the reason for this was Rob's financial difficulties. Some of his family's businesses had serious problems, and as a result, the family's financial situation deteriorated to the point where Rob was forced to declare bankruptcy. The financial collapse triggered a major family crisis. Paige had called 911 twice by 2004 because family tensions had reached critical levels. She reported Rob threatening to kill her and the children the first time, but by the time the police arrived, she and Rob claimed to have resolved their issues on their own. A year later, there was a completely different incident. Paige filed an assault report against Rob, alleging that he hit her while she was holding her youngest child. Rob was arrested and charged with third-degree assault this time. Rob avoided jail time after pleading guilty to one count of molestation. The husband and wife's relationship deteriorated further and they decided to divorce, after which Rob relocated to Pennsylvania. Investigators interviewed Rob to try to establish his alibi for the day Paige went missing. Rob claimed he was at home and couldn't have hurt her, ruling out his involvement in her disappearance. Investigators were unable to link Rob to the disappearance, so he eventually joined the search and became very involved in the effort to find Paige. The detectives made no compromises in their pursuit of clues and unraveling the mystery surrounding Paige Bergfeld's disappearance. One of their first steps was to thoroughly examine Paige's car with the hope that it contained evidence that could help them find her or shed light on her disappearance. According to Sergeant Weiler of the County Sheriff's Department, arson is frequently used to destroy potential evidence. However, the vehicle examination provided useful information. They discovered that the driver's seat had been pushed all the way back, indicating that the last person to drive the Ford 
was a tall person, which contradicted Paige's short stature and inability to reach the pedals from that distance. They discovered Paige's missing notebook in the trunk of the car, with Paige's torn out from June 26th to June 29th. The search for Paige became more desperate with each passing hour. A random driver encountered tire problems on a highway southeast of town a few days after the burning car was discovered. He discovered a checkbook nearby while investigating and immediately reported it to the authorities. They also discovered medical records, insurance cards, and other items belonging to Paige along this stretch of road. Sergeant Weiler discovered that several pages from Paige's checkbook had been torn out and were scattered over a large area. The most significant find, however, was a business card found on the side of the road. This discovery revealed that Paige led a secret life that her loved ones were unaware of. According to the business card, she worked as an escort under the alias Carrie. This revelation called into question all previous assumptions about Paige's disappearance, leading investigators into uncharted territory. Paige realized she needed to work hard after her divorce to provide for her children, so she set out on a determined path. She started her own children's clothing company, taught dance, and sold kitchen supplies. Paige, despite her hectic schedule, always made time for her children, attended PTA meetings, and was involved in school groups. The discovery of a cell phone in Paige's car was a major breakthrough. Detectives looked through a list of contacts and phone calls made and received in the hours leading up to Paige's disappearance. The last call made from that phone was around 9 p.m. on June 28. This resulted in the identification of seven suspects, one of whom was Lester Ralph Jones. Lester Jones's criminal history, which included domestic violence and kidnapping, drew special attention from investigators. He had been in prison for five years for kidnapping. Furthermore, Paige's friend Carol saw a car with a similar external description to Lester's white car. Carol told Paige about an incident in which another white car blocked her driveway, and when Paige tried to drive away, a collision occurred, and the unknown driver fled the scene. Lester Jones had attempted to schedule an appointment with Paige for intimate services the day before she vanished, according to further investigation. Although Lester was questioned and denied any involvement in Paige's disappearance, police discovered suspicious items in his home, including a disposable cell phone, men's wigs, Viagra, a sheet with an escort service's phone number, and women's lingerie in various sizes. Lester's possession of a disposable cell phone raised suspicions. An examination of Paige's cell phone call records revealed that on the day of her disappearance, someone attempted to contact her several times from an unregistered number. During questioning, Lester denied having a second cell phone, indicating that he had lied to the police. The disposable phone's packaging led authorities to believe it was purchased at a supermarket on North Avenue. Lester was identified as the purchaser in store video footage, though he refused to acknowledge his presence in the video. Lester Jones emerged as the primary suspect in Page's disappearance as a result of these developments. However, there was no concrete evidence linking him to the crime. The police continued to monitor him and worked hard to find Page's body in order to gather enough evidence to press charges. For several years, the case was put on hold, leaving Paige's family and loved ones in a state of grief and uncertainty. A significant breakthrough occurred in 2012 when a hiker unintentionally discovered human remains in a Delta County ravine, very close to where Paige's personal belongings had been discovered five years earlier. A DNA test was performed, which confirmed that the remains belonged to Paige. While the exact cause of death could not be determined due to the state of the body, it was clear that Paige had suffered multiple injuries, including broken bones in her face, which were most likely the result of a severe beating. This revelation added a chilling new dimension to Paige's tragic story. Soil erosion had brought her remains to the surface over time, which could explain why she hadn't been discovered sooner. After Paige's remains were discovered in November 2014, Lester Ralph Jones was charged with first-degree murder, second-degree murder, and kidnapping. The trial lasted 22 days and started in July 2016. Prosecutors claimed Lester, who had a history of violence against women, became frustrated 
when he couldn't get an appointment with Peige to use her services. Lisa, Lester's ex-wife, testified for the prosecution, recounting her own terrifying experience with Lester, in which he kidnapped and threatened to kill her at gunpoint in the late 1990s. During one of these incidents, Lisa's partner was shot. Lester's defense attorneys attempted to argue that the police had detained an innocent man and suggested that other potential Page clients may have been involved in the crime. They did not, however, provide convincing evidence linking other people to the murder. Lester's current wife testified in front of the jury and confirmed that he had used an escort service, but she did not provide an alibi. She also recognized him in surveillance video from a supermarket where Lester bought a disposable phone. The jury was unable to reach a unanimous verdict on September 9, 2016, resulting in a mistrial. The district attorney, on the other hand, remained convinced of Lester's guilt and continued to work tirelessly on the case, re-examining all evidence. After reviewing the evidence, the jury reached a decision on November 21, 2016. Lester was found guilty on all charges related to Page's death. The judge sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Page's final farewell was held on April 28, 2012, and her obituary described her as a beautiful and radiant woman with a sun-like smile. Her tragic death left an indelible mark on the hearts of her family and friends, and her three children had to deal with the loss of their mother, who had been a source of support and encouragement to them. Page's case drew widespread attention and lasted many years, but the unwavering determination of her family and law enforcement ultimately resulted in justice. Lester Ralph Jones was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, ensuring that he could no longer cause harm to others. Page's story is a powerful reminder of the importance of persevering in the pursuit of justice, even when it takes time and effort. Her spirit will live on in the hearts of those who knew and loved her. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Martin Gardner sat on the porch of his desolate home, clutching a photo album he had received years after the tragic event. That album had become a symbol of his loss a living reminder of a terrible tragedy. Martin's gaze fell on the photographs of his small and innocent children, Talon, Saya, Savi, and Yazi. These photos were all he had left from his happy days. When he looked into their eyes, he could almost hear their children's voices filling the house with laughter and warmth once upon a time. Martin's first child, Talon, was just four years old. He was the source of happiness for his father. The man fantasized about spending all of his free time with him, teaching him everything he knew, and drinking beer with him in the future, when Talon would be a real grown man and Martin himself would be gray and important. Little Sia, who was only three years old, always ran to her father when he returned home from work, remembering to bring her cloth doll with her. She always asked Martin to kiss her and her doll before bed. This always brought a smile to her father's face, and he took this sweet ritual seriously and respectfully. Savi, a two-year-old girl, was quiet and intelligent. She enjoyed flipping through books and watching animal movies. Martin frequently sat her on his lap and read her favorite stories to her. He saw in her the potential of an intelligent and serious woman who would go on to achieve great things in life. Yazi was the youngest, a very small baby with deep black eyes. Martin looked into her eyes and saw a vast world. Her eyes were identical to those of her mother, Shanithia Gardner. Martin recalled how grateful he was that she had given him this beautiful world full of love, comfort, and children's laughter. But that world was shattered one fateful day. Shanithia Gardner was born in late 1980s in Memphis, Tennessee. Little is known about her early years, except that she was the daughter of Eleanor Snodgrass, who lived in Madison, Alabama's cozy cabins. Shanithia's childhood and youth were as typical as any other girls at the time, she was a young brunette with curly hair, slim and attractive. The girl was always surrounded by loyal friends and demonstrated exceptional talent. Shanithia was endowed with a genuine creative spirit. She possessed a unique talent for songwriting. Music was her passion and singing was her way of expressing herself. 
Her vocal abilities piqued the interest of the locals, and she became a local celebrity. However, singing was just one of her many interests. Shanithia was captivated by the world of fashion and photography. She looked fantastic in front of the camera and could transform everyday situations into works of art. Despite her colorful hobbies, Shanithia was a generous woman who made time for religion. She was a regular churchgoer who took good care of her family. Shanithia's life appeared to be predetermined, with a promising future ahead. Shanithia was just 14 years old when she met D-Trail Clayton. It began with a casual introduction via mutual friends, and they quickly discovered common ground and became friends. When they grew up and graduated from high school, their relationship became more serious, and the two officially became a couple. Shanithia and Detrail spent a lot of time together, and everyone thought they were responsible and stable young people. However, there were some questionable incidents on their records. Both were involved in minor offenses, such as traffic violations or disorderly conduct on the streets. In 2008, things became more serious. Detrail was accused of assaulting a woman, and even though it was unintentional, he faced serious consequences. The guy got lucky, and all charges against him were quickly dropped. Shanithia and Detrail did not have a formal relationship, but they lived together. In 2008, the couple welcomed a son named Dalian. Shanithia became a caring mother, not only to him, but also to the children of his previous relationship. Sonia Clayton, Detrail's mother, saw Shanithia not only as a woman in love with her son, but also as a member of her family. Shanithia was known for her devotion and care for her children, making her unique in Sonia's eyes. However, the lover's relationship did not last long, and little is known about what happened between them. Despite the breakup, they maintained some distant communication. Shanithia continued to be a good wife and mother. Shanithia became involved in a minor incident when Dalian was only two years old. It was a minor infraction, possibly a parking ticket or a minor argument of little consequence. It was also insignificant in light of what lay ahead for her. Marrying Martin Gardner marked a new chapter in Shanithia's life. Fate had brought her to this man who appeared to bring joy and stability into her life. Shanithia, on the other hand, won Martin over with her kindness and affection for children. In her eyes, he saw an ocean of feminine tenderness and wisdom. Their story progressed rapidly. In September 2013, they decided to begin their lives together and moved into an apartment complex in southeast Shelby County. The wedding marked the start of a new chapter in their life together. Shortly after the celebration, they welcomed their first child, Talon, and in 2014, little Sia was born. Soon, two more girls, Savi and Yazi, joined their large family, making them even happier and busier. Martin and Shanithia had four children together, plus one from her previous relationship. For the young mother, children always came first, and she enjoyed working part-time at the children's hospital. Furthermore, she was actively involved in a center that raised funds for children. It was her calling, and she gladly dedicated her life to assisting those in need. Shanithia was on the phone with her husband, Martin, around noon on Friday, July 1, 2016, an ordinary day with no sign of anything unusual. Her voice was calm, as it often is. She informed her husband that she was going to watch a movie with the children. There was no indication that something terrible would occur on this ordinary day. And then, as the spouses were having a quiet conversation, an incomprehensible madness began to unfold. Shanithia abruptly changed. She took a kitchen knife and entered the living room. There, she assaulted her own six-month-old daughter, Yazi. The defenseless little girl, unable to fight back, was caught in a horrible trap. Her life was cut short in an instant by the hands of her most loved and closest person. Dalon, the oldest of the children who was only seven years old, witnessed the terrifying scene. A terrible tragedy unfolded before his eyes, which he was too young to comprehend. The boy only had one thought, he needed to do something to save his younger brother and sisters. Panicked and desperate, he fled the house. Shanithia did not stop there. The a young woman followed her son out of the house armed with a knife, ready to carry out her nightmarish plan. 
She rushed after Dalon, but the terrified and desperate man screamed so loudly that he drew the attention of the neighbors. A couple of neighbors heard his screams and dashed outside to see what was going on. They found themselves witnessing a nightmare that would not leave their minds. Shaninthia halted her progress when she realized Dalen was being watched. However, the horror was not yet over. Shaninthia returned to the house where Savi and Talon had been waiting for her, distraught. She went up to the bedroom where the children were. It was the final moments of their innocent lives. Meanwhile, those who witnessed the nightmare did not waste a moment. They quickly contacted emergency services, requesting assistance and rescue for little Dalon and his younger siblings. At the time, none of them could have predicted the tragic consequences for this peaceful street. When deputies arrived, they discovered an eerie scene inside the home at 7,149 Southern Hill Drive. They discovered a bloodied Shaninthia and her four children lying motionless, lifeless. The sight shocked everyone. Shaninthia sat with her cell phone in her hand. She slowly dialed her husband, Martin's number. Her voice was quiet and cold as she admitted to killing her children. The tragedy that had occurred in their lives was the horrific event that would live on in this quiet neighborhood. It was already too late when the prosecutor's office and the special unit arrived. There was only an eerie silence in the house that had once been home to the happy Gardner family. Blood and horror lurked around every corner. The investigators carried a bloody knife, silently witnessing the heinous crime. Chaplains arrived to help and were taken aback by what had occurred, as were specialists ready to assist Delon. The horror he had experienced necessitated immediate action. While the necessary information was gathered and investigations were underway, law enforcement requested that residents remain inside their homes and not go outside. Some people did not need this request. They were still scared and uncertain. Their home appeared to be the only safe place. A major operation compelled sheriff's officials to restrict access to the apartment complex, including the golf course and country club. Shaninthia was apprehended and placed in custody without bail. Her trial date was immediately set for July 5th. Society could not ignore the horrific events that were unfolding in Shaninthia Gardner's life. Regardless of how monstrous she appeared, she was a mother and partner who exuded love, care, and joy. Michelle Jiman, a co-worker, claims Michelle vigorously defended Shaninthia on social media, speaking out about the unfairness of the allegations. She also mentioned an important issue, postpartum depression. Cases like this have sparked debate, and Dr. Joel Riesman, a psychiatrist at the University of Tennessee Medical Center, confirmed that the killing of children by their own mother is uncommon and usually accompanied by mental health issues. He also mentioned the state's lack of mental health funding, which prevents many families from receiving the necessary support. Dr. Diane Barnes, a psychology and postpartum health specialist, differentiated between postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis, emphasizing that they are completely different conditions with distinct symptoms. While Shaninthia's exact condition required further investigation, Dr. Barnes doubted that women suffering from postpartum depression would commit such acts. She leaned toward psychosis. The investigation into Shaninthia Gardner's case was difficult. Craig Morton became her defense attorney, but he chose not to speak to the media about the case in its early stages, believing it was too early for such discussions. Shaninthia did not speak during the court hearing on July 5, 2016, and instead appeared via video link. Judge Lewis Lambert questioned her, but the young woman did not respond. Shanianthia was admitted to the Mental Health Institute following her trial. Shanianthia's next of kin arrived at the courthouse but declined to comment to reporters. Jennifer Nichols, Morton's attorney and prosecutor, intended to file a motion to preserve evidence in the case, including information gathered through social media. Shaninthia faced formal charges in January 2017 for aggravated child abuse, aggravated murder with a deadly weapon, aggravated child abuse, and child neglect. The mysterious and gruesome investigation continued, leaving the community waiting for justice and answers to numerous questions. The hearing featured testimony from Shaninthia's loved ones. 
On that fateful day, Sonia, D-Trail's mother, was undoubtedly shocked to learn of the tragic event. She rushed to the scene in a desperate search for her grandson, Dalen. Sonia insisted that what had occurred had nothing to do with the young woman she once knew. She expressed her belief that something supernatural, possibly diabolical, was behind it all. As time passed and the initial shock subsided, Sonia began to speculate on possible motives. She speculated that the young couple was in the process of divorcing, and Shanithia may have made the terrible decision to end it all for fear of being alone while caring for five children. Despite these reflections, Sonia found it difficult to believe. Shanithia, as she knew her, was incapable of such a heinous act. Dalon's father, Detrail, also refused to believe Shanithia was guilty. He admitted that, while he was never his son's guardian, he was always able to see him after his relationship with Shanithia ended. However, November 2014 was the last time he saw his son. He noticed that Shanithia's actions and decisions became increasingly radical as time passed. Every attempt he made to contact his son was unsuccessful, and he was simply not permitted to be involved in his life. However, Shanithia's friends and family had long noticed that she had experienced a completely unexpected upheaval. The young woman began to feel strange discomfort, which progressed into severe anxiety, paranoia, and worse, panic attacks. Her behavior became erratic and unpredictable, and many people suspected that it was due to postpartum depression. This came as a surprise to those around her, as Shanithia appeared to be a strong and dependable woman. She had always been in control, but now she appeared to have lost her footing. Many people were perplexed as to why this tragic situation occurred due to her abrupt behavioral change. The first signs of strange behavior appeared in March 2015, and neither her friends nor family could figure out what was going on. Shanithia once left work early to pick up her children. With five children in the car, she drove down an unknown road away from their home. At the time, her husband Martin assumed she had gone for a walk and to relax in a park, which was typical of her daily routine. However, as time passed, she never returned home. Martin, deeply disturbed, decided to issue an APB for his wife. Shanithia drove east with five children in the cabin, covering more than 74 miles between Memphis and Corinth. But she didn't know anyone here, and there seemed to be no particular reason for her visit. She was later discovered in the emergency room at St. Francis Hospital, but police never explained how or why she ended up there. Shallow cuts were discovered on her neck and one of her wrists. If she attempted suicide, her only witnesses would be her children, who were too young to understand what was going on. Authorities eventually returned Shanithia home, but her behavior became even more bizarre. She informed Martin that someone was threatening her and their family, her husband was taken aback because Shanithia provided no information about who it could be or why, and there had been no previous instances of such threats. Shanithia also began complaining about her job and workload while spending time with family and friends. She claimed that she felt terrible about it. She soon began to claim that some of her co-workers intended to harm her. Despite these abnormalities, Shanithia demonstrated no signs of abuse or violence towards her children or others. The long wait for trial was not easy, and it was significantly delayed due to the defendant's numerous psychiatric evaluations. The COVID-19 pandemic added to the trial's length, which was longer than anyone had anticipated. The non-jury trial started in 2021. The defense centered its strategy on Shanithia's mental illness claim. The prosecutors acknowledged the defendant's mental illness, but they maintained that she was still capable of distinguishing between right and wrong and was aware of the illegality of her actions. Finally, Shelby County Criminal Court Judge James rejected Shanithia Gardner's defense, and she was found guilty of all charges in December 2021. Shanithia 34 appeared in court in February 2022 for her sentencing, accompanied by her husband Martin. Judge James sentenced her to life in prison for each count of murder, plus 15 years for each additional count of child abuse and neglect. Shanithia will only be eligible for parole after serving 51 years in prison, including the five years she served prior to her sentencing. 
Shanintia will be eligible for parole in around 46 years, when she will be 80 years old. Following the sentencing, the prosecutor stated that he agreed with the decision because it was consistent with their desire to obtain justice for Martin and his children. Martin, in turn, felt relieved to learn that Shanintia would never be able to harm any children again. Sonia Dallon's grandmother joined others, including neighbors, family members, and law enforcement officers, for an evening vigil at the family's apartment complex in memory of the innocent victims. Those who came to say their goodbyes held red and white candles and prayed several times for the souls of the deceased. The Reverend Pastor of the Baptist Church stated that the vigil marked the start of a healing process for the entire community because in the end, the only thing those present could do was support the surviving baby and his father. D-Trail did not attend the memorial service on his behalf. Sonia told the media that he was too angry to attend the ceremony. The president and CEO of Shanintia's workplace, the Children's Hospital, also expressed their condolences on behalf of the entire staff. Martin's colleagues established a social media account to assist him with funeral arrangements for his four children. Martin demonstrated incredible fortitude and nobility during the ceremony, speaking briefly about his children and family. In his final speech, he stated that his home was happy when his children and Shanintia were present, and that is how he will remember it forever. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. This is exactly what Kanyong's story is about. You might ask, is this really possible? How could a simple family dinner lead to a brutal murder that will shock everyone in Malaysia? The law will even be looked at by the local government. Let us look at this case. Princess Kani Ong Lake Yang is her full name. She was born in 1974 in Ipoh, Malaysia, into a big family. People from all over the world visit the city, but Kani had her sights set on something else. A better job and traveling. What else could a girl want? That being said, she knew that she had to work for her dream and that nothing good could just happen. First, Kani got a gold medal in high school. Then she went to the University of Hawaii and got a degree in economics here. After the start, more work had to be done to make things better. She went to Los Angeles and got a job at an advertising agency. She was already living on her own. The City of Dreams helped the girl see herself as an expert in her field. In 2001, Kani met Brandon Ong there. He was born in Singapore, like her father, but moved to the United States with his family when he was a child and was now legally an American. Young Kani and Brandon quickly got married and moved to San Diego, which is right next door. But after only two years together, something bad happened. Kani's dad got liver cancer. The surgery her father was going to have in Malaysia was very serious, and it wasn't clear if he would live or die after it. She quickly packed her things and flew to her father on June 1st, leaving her husband in the United States. The surgery went well, the disease got better, and the doctor said that Kani's dad, who they called b -Gen, would live a long time and definitely have grandchildren. Kani let out a sigh of relief. At last, she could go back to her husband and her favorite job. In the morning, she took a plane to Los Angeles. That night, Kani invited her whole family to a farewell dinner at Montes, their favorite restaurant that they used to go on vacation when Kani still lived with her parents. During dinner, Kani's mom got sick out of the blue and her sweet daughter offered to drive her home. She spent a long time looking for a parking ticket in her purse in the parking lot. When she couldn't find it, she realized she had left it in her car and forgotten about it. Kani then ran to the car and told her sisters to watch her mother. She wasn't seen for a long time. Her mother went to the car to check on her, but neither Kani's nor her daughters were there. When one of the sisters tried to call Kani's phone, it was even scarier to see that it was turned off. Her family knew her very well. She couldn't just disappear, and she would always call to let them know what had happened. But what could have happened in a parking lot that was locked up, only 300 feet from her family? The father of Canny asked the security guards to show him the video footage. His daughter was walking toward the car and checking her pockets and purse for her keys. At first, there was nothing strange about it, when they looked back, they saw a stranger moving behind Canny. 
He was speeding up and slowing down, just like Canny. The guards and Canny's worried father watched her car leave the parking lot from a different camera. There was a man behind the wheel, most likely the one who had followed her in the parking lot. It was strange that Canny was sitting in the passenger seat. The family called the police right away because it looked like someone was taking their child. People should praise the Malaysian police for starting to look for the missing woman as soon as they learned that the car had been stolen. After a few hours, a highway patrol officer saw a car on the road that fit the description. The police stopped the car to look at the papers so as not to scare the possible kidnapper. At the time, they weren't sure if it was a kidnapping or not for sure. The driver of the car stopped and gave the police officer his license, even though he looked tense. He tried to show the policeman some signs while sitting next to him, but the officer was busy checking the driver's license. He didn't understand, which is a shame. Kidnapper, on the other hand, paid attention, stepped on the gas, and drove away from the police car. The police shot at the car, but it got away. They still had the kidnapper's papers, though. His name was Ahmad Najib bin Aris, and he was 27 years old. Let me give you a short history of this person. They were born in 1976 and raised in Muar, Malaysia. He was the second child in a family of four. Ahmad Najib went to secondary school until the third year, but then he quit. He didn't go to the last two years of secondary school. In Malaysia, secondary school lasts for five years. He had to work to feed his family, and he worked hard. He went from Muar to Kuala Lumpur in 1998. In the end, Ahmad Najib got married and had two kids. Ahmad Najib was a good man who did his job well, according to people who knew him. Now let's get back to our case. After some time, it became clear that the shooting at the car had an effect. A young man went up to the police and told them a strange story. He told the story of a stranger who approached him at a roadside cafe while he was eating dinner. The stranger said that he was on vacation with his wife but had a flat tire on the way and could not go any further. The young man was happy to help the stranger. He got a jack from the trunk and gave it to the traveler when they got outside. But he saw bullet holes in the car, and in the front seat, he saw a scared woman who didn't look like a wife taking a carefree vacation with her husband. But the so-called husband didn't change the tire himself. He just played around with the jack for a while, complained, and then gave it back. The police knew right away that it was canny and that Ahmad was the one who took her. But that was the last time anyone saw Kani alive. Not long after on the third day, Kaniong, or rather her body, was found in a sewer manhole near a construction site. It was almost completely burned to the ground. The autopsy will show that the woman was stabbed several times in the stomach and then choked to death. Another thing that was found nearby the construction site was Kani's car, which had a shot tire and blood on the back seat. Even though the police had the killer's paperwork, they didn't go to Ahmad's house until after the body was found. For some reason, really interesting thing about this story is that the killer was at home, acting like nothing had happened, like he had. It was like he hadn't stolen someone else's car, kidnapped a woman who had come to see her sick father, and then driven away from police officers who were shooting at him. After Ahmad was caught, Forensic tests showed that the car also had Ahmad's DNA in it, along with Kani's blood. To be clear, we want to say that murders in Malaysia are very uncommon, especially ones that are so violent. According to the criminal code, someone who kills someone deserves the death penalty, not even life in prison in this case. Ahmad knew that the police had all the information on him, so it's not clear what he was hoping for. He admitted everything and even agreed to help with the investigation because he thought that would keep him from being put to death. Of course, the cruel criminal hid his identity at the trial by pretending to be a sheep. In the parking lot that night, he said, he was looking for a different woman, but thought he saw the wrong woman. He didn't realize it until he was in the car with Canny. He even said that they laughed about it together, and he later tried to get her to have sex with him. Again, he said that Canny wasn't even against it, and the marks on her neck from being strangled were just part of the woman's sexual fantasy, which is why she died. Ahmad, who was scared, decided to get rid of the body by setting Kani on fire. From beginning to end, Ahmad's lawyers made up this story 
because if they had been proven true, they would have only been found guilty of abusing the dead or, in the worst case, negligently killing Canny during the sexual encounter. If this isn't true and the defendant's crazy thoughts are all this, the lawyer said, then why didn't the captive run away while her captor changed the tire? If the person hadn't been stabbed in the stomach, this story might even sound plausible. The defense fell apart like a house of cards at this point. It was clear because the investigation had a different, more reliable account of what had happened, which was backed up by the autopsy. Ahmad saw a woman by herself in the parking lot outside of Monty's and followed her. When Canny opened her car door, he pointed a knife at her and told her to sit in the passenger seat. He then got behind the wheel himself. After the incident with the police and the failed attempt to fix a flat tire, he took the car to a place with no one else around, put Canny in the back seat, and used her more than once. When Canny tried to fight back, she was stabbed several times in the stomach and then strangled with a coat belt. Ahmad took her already dead body outside, threw it into the first manhole, and then put tires over it so no one would find it. His plan was to finally hide the evidence of the crime when he came back to this manhole the next day with several gas cans. He put gasoline in Canny's body and set it on fire. It turned out that Ahmad had also raped four women, luckily none of whom died. They did not report it to the police because they were afraid of being caught though. After what seemed like years, the court finally found the murderer guilty on February 23, 2005. Among other things, they gave Ahmad 10 lashes. Was this any better for the parents who had lost their daughter for good? Ahmad tried to appeal his sentence while he was in jail. He even wrote a letter to Salangor, the head of state, asking him to release him, but he was turned down. Ahmad got what was coming to him just 13 years after killing Canny. He was hanged in his cell on September 23, 2016. As I already said, this case got a lot of attention in Malaysia. People in the area were scared, not so much by the brutality of the murder and Ahmad's seemingly false belief that he would not be caught, but by the fact that it is not hard to kidnap someone in a busy shopping center, even if it's in a parking lot. To make sure this didn't happen again, the Malaysian government started to put up as many CCTV cameras as they could all over the country. They also hired more security guards for shopping malls and even made parking spots just for women. For these reasons, it is very sad that the life of an innocent woman who flew from tens of thousands of miles away to be with her father for two weeks had to be sacrificed. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Norberta Greywind looked at her 22-year-old pregnant daughter, who was struggling to climb the stairs to her third-floor neighbor's apartment complex on Saturday morning, August 19, 2017. Savannah was eight months pregnant, and August had been unusually hot. Her swollen legs made it difficult for her to walk. William Hahn, the boyfriend of Brooke Cruz, the same neighbor who had invited Savannah over, came up the same stairs a few hours later. When he entered the apartment, he discovered Brooke scrubbing the bathroom, Savannah's bloody shredded body on the floor, and a basin containing a baby on top of the toilet lid. Brooke picked up the infant and held it out to William, saying, This is our baby. This is our family. Please help me. William helped clean up the blood, carry bags of bloody towels and clothes out of the apartment, wrap bags around Savannah's body, securing them with duct tape and ropes and later dispose of the corpse. Today's story is about the tragic collision of two contrasting couples' lives, the dark one with a sticky, heavy, irresponsible, and unhealthy past defining their present, and the light one, loving, easy, and open, the result of which was broken families and the death that accompanied the birth. The next day, William Hahn informed his co-workers that his wife had given birth to a baby girl named Phoenix. In a cruel irony, the couple who took Savannah's life and daughter named the child after the mythological bird that can die and be reborn. Brooke's boyfriend later described his days with Hasley, as her family referred to the girl, as beautiful days that made me a happy little family man for two days in an interview. It's been fantastic. 
I never thought I'd have another opportunity like this. Savannah Greywind was born in Burke County, North Dakota on August 9, 1995. Savannah's father is a regular white American and her mother is a Spirit Lake Sioux Indian. Joy and Casey were the girl's two brothers and Kayla was her younger sister. Norberta and Joe, the parents, were extremely proud of their children. Savannah was nine years old when the family moved to Fargo, North Dakota. They then relocated to Spirit Lake Reservation, a Native American reservation in the state's east, in 2005. Savannah adored the outdoors and animals, particularly horses. The girl met Ashton Mayon on the reservation. Savannah and her husband met when she was 15 years old, and they have been together ever since. When the children were old enough to attend college, the family returned to Fargo. Savannah found work in a nursing home, caring for the elderly, while studying to become a nurse and preparing to take the exam in September. Savannah was a happy young woman, expecting her first child at the time. She and Ashton had found an apartment, made a deposit, and were planning to move into their own family nest in early September. Savannah was currently living on the bottom floor of a seven-unit, three-story apartment building with her parents. The 38-year-old Brooke Cruz and 33-year-old William Hone rented an apartment on the third floor of this building. No one is born evil. People are the result of their experiences, which shape who they are. Brooke Cruz had created a woman within herself capable of such heinous murder, seeking wholeness by accepting all aspects of her personality. She gradually cultivated a dark side that she couldn't control. Perhaps each of us possesses two distinct personalities, darkness and light. I believe we are predestined to have dark and light thought processes manifest as personalities. One of them is socially destroyed early on. But is this a good thing? Brooke wrote something in one of her pieces. Brooke has been drawn to mysticism since she was a child, and she finds a special beauty in the crimes of serial killers and high IQ maniacs. As an adult, she had studied criminal psychology professionally and worked hard to learn to think like them in order to understand them. Brooke stated that if Ted Bundy came to see her, she would gladly assist him. Brooke Cruz, on the other hand, was not a healthy, stable person. All of her lived experiences were downloaded into her personality, which was characterized by impulsive behavior, anxious avoidance, irascibility, frequent changes of partners and places of work, and an inability to complete what she had begun. The young woman tried to fight it, making discipline lists and even following them for a while, but she eventually gave up. She was 38 years old when she was overcome by depression, physical illness, exhaustion from unhealthy relationships that included regular physical abuse, and a disturbing fear of losing her partner because she couldn't get pregnant and give birth. Brooke couldn't stand it any longer. Darkness and light coexisted, and killing a pregnant woman was seen as one way to obtain the infant she desired. Brooke's apartment was left with a stack of books ranging from clinical, criminal, forensic, and legal psychology to obstetrics after her arrest. She discovered notes in a desk drawer listing birthing kit items such as scissors, blades, clamps, and gloves, as well as an infant cardiopulmonary resuscitation bag and the hormone oxytocin. Brooklyn Cruz grew up in the Bradenton, Sarasota area of Florida, where her mother, Paula Nelson, still resides. Her parents divorced, and seven children, including Brooke, were left to live with their mother, according to Christmas cards. According to one of her sister's recollections, the family did quite well. Brooke had a difficult childhood, which she worked hard to forget, according to diary entries she kept throughout her life. The transition age altered the caring, open-minded young lady, turning her testy but not aggressive. Brooke became a troubled adolescent, and she was the only child to decide to live with her father, whom her mother described as a professional criminal. Her relationship with her father did not work out, and she found herself in and out of foster care. Brooke was virtually forgotten by the siblings after that. They only found out Brooke is the mother of at least seven children after reading about a shocking crime in the news. Brooke met Aaron Edwards in 1995, when she was 15 years old. When she was about 17, 
She gave birth to a child in Pinellas County, Florida, left the infant with the father and moved away. A court ordered the mother to pay child support, but Brooke did not comply. She'd remember her daughter when she turned 14, and their communication would be limited to a few evening Facebook messages. Brooke worked as a waitress at the Chinese Dragon Restaurant in Bradenton, Florida, and as a sales representative and animal specialist at the Petland Pet Store. Brooke, 23, was arrested in Missouri in early 2002 for falsifying documents, but was released on parole on August 31, 2002. She was arrested again and imprisoned in Hidalgo County, Texas, for violating her parole. Brooke married Carl Cruz, a carpenter from Minnesota, in 2006 when she was 27 years old. The young lady. She managed to have two children while working as an administrative assistant in her husband's carpentry shop. Brooke cheated on her husband during their three-year marriage, which ended in divorce in June 2009. According to the documents, the father gained custody of the children, and Brooke left for California without explanation. Throughout her life, the only thing she did with care and diligence was keep diaries and record everything that happened to her. Following the heinous crime, the entries were made available to the press. The diaries described a slew of lovers, home births, and abortions. The relationships all began with heart-shaped marks around the edges, but after a while, the entries about the men changed. Each of them began playing intellectual games with me, making me feel like I wasn't good enough, not smart enough, Brooke wrote. It's impossible to say whether Brooke chose such men on purpose or whether any of her relationships experienced such difficulties as a result of internal problems. However, she was convinced that Carl was bullying her and portraying her as a bad, promiscuous mother, and this fact was emotionally traumatizing to her. Despite this, she returned to her now ex-husband's house after a trip to California, signed up for a dating site, and began studying psychology seriously. The young woman met Andrew Murray, a chef from Katoomba, New South Wales, Australia, on the dating site tagged, and decided to relocate to Australia. Brooke attacked her ex-husband with a knife in late 2011, in January 2012, during an argument over child custody. The woman was arrested and criminal charges were filed. Brooke denied the knife attack, but instead chose to flee to Australia on false immigration papers, where she married Andrew. The marriage in Australia lasted exactly six months. Andrew discovered her American past, husband, children, and forged immigration papers. According to Andrew, after discovering the truth, his wife began threatening him with arrest for aiding and abetting, prompting him to go to the police station and tell them everything just in case. Andrew remembers the marriage for the large amount of talk about maniacs. He would later reveal that Brooke was obsessed with crime as early as 2012. She majored in psychology and nursing and wrote her thesis on serial killers. According to her, she was always reading books about maniacs and crime and could tell you anything you wanted to know about them. She seemed to become more aggressive as time passed. From the time she arrived until she returned to the United States in October 2012, it took her six months and ten days. Brooke wrote in her diary on September 22, 2012, that she had changed significantly for the better since returning from Australia. She was involved in a protracted custody battle for her two children. She might have had a chance for a new life if she reconciled with Andrew Murray. But in late 2012, Brooke met 28-year-old William Hone, who had been convicted of child abuse a few months earlier. After bringing his son to the hospital with a fractured skull near his right ear in January 2011, Brooke falls in love with this man who is twice divorced, has two children, does not pay child support, has anger issues, and has a court order preventing him from seeing his children. Brooke is bursting with energy and a strong desire to be her new self, to take the kids and to move in that direction. She gets a job. Brooke turns her hobby into a career by enrolling at Minnesota State University in Moorhead in 2013, where she studies social behavior, physiological psychology, cognitive theory, psychology of deviant behavior, and directed research. She is especially fascinated by the psychology of serial killers. The first-year student wrote a paper about them and received the highest grade. Her personal life is the only thing that clouds the picture. William's relationship started off beautifully. 
We have a good relationship with him, which is good for the kids. We're loving, don't yell at each other and are affectionate and kind, Brooke explained. However, the relationship evolved into codependency over time. The use of alcohol and illegal substances together. Brooke thought she was doing well, but she was getting worse. She began avoiding her children, changed jobs because she couldn't get along with the staff, and became increasingly immersed in her psychological research into humanity's darker sides. Police responded to a call in May 2016 after William Hahn brutally beaten his girlfriend in the bathroom. He admitted to assault and was barred from approaching Brooke in the future. Six months later, police responded to a neighbor's call and discovered Hahn in Brooke's apartment. He pleaded guilty to violating the restraining order and they reconnected and the relationship was no longer healthy. Brooke was unable to have children as a result of an abortion she had in 2011. William, on the other hand, insisted on having a child with her. Brooke lied to Han about the pregnancy to keep him from leaving in early 2017 and even emailed a fake ultrasound picture and a picture of a positive pregnancy test. She discovered an online recording of a random baby's heartbeat and showed it to her partner, claiming it was the heartbeat of their future child. They had another big fight in August 2017, by which time it was clear that there was no pregnancy. But, because William had already informed everyone about the impending paternity and did not want to be made fun of, he literally demanded a child from his girlfriend, mentioning the pregnant neighbor three floors below. Brooke Cruz would later tell police officers that she interpreted William's demand as an ultimatum and a desire to take the baby away from Savannah, despite the fact that he did not explicitly say so. Brookie was well-versed in medicine, so she began compiling a list of what she needed to induce labor. She was used to anticipating and doing whatever her young lover wanted her to do by this point. Brooke knocked on the door of a downstairs apartment on a Saturday afternoon in August and offered Savannah $20 to serve as a model for a dress Brooke was allegedly sewing. Savannah agreed before proceeding to her upstairs neighbor's apartment. Savannah ordered pizza, intending to eat it when she got home. The mother-to-be did not return home on time after driving her younger brother to work an hour later. Around 2.30 p.m., the brother went upstairs on his own. He could hear a sewing machine, but no one opened the door. Savannah's father, Joe, went upstairs and knocked on the door a few minutes later. Brooke yelled that they were still working on the dress, that Savannah was trying it on, and that no one could come to the door because of it. Neither Roberta nor her son drove themselves to work. When she got home, she discovered the pizza had gone untouched. She texted her daughter several times but got no response. She then proceeded upstairs. Savannah had left a long time ago, according to a neighbor who opened the door. Norberta went downstairs to her apartment after they finished fitting and looked around. Her shoes, purse, car keys, and personal belongings had all been left in the apartment. Savannah couldn't go for a walk because the heat and swelling made walking painful and difficult. Norberta called Ashton, hoping he was the one who had picked up her daughter. But the young man said Savannah wasn't answering. I was driving and I thought, well, if she had gone somewhere, I would have found her nearby, the worried mother explained. But deep down, I knew she hadn't gone anywhere. Police searched Brooke and William's apartment later that day because it was Savannah's last known location. The landlord welcomed them and did not obstruct them, but the police did not search closets or behind closed doors because they lacked a warrant. The police department informed the family that Savannah was of age and old enough to make her own decisions without informing family members because no crime had occurred in or near the home. Investigators concluded that the young woman voluntarily went somewhere. Savannah's family was disturbed by the indifference with which the department's officers were working. The police returned to the apartment twice more and came up empty-handed. During one of the searches, William Hone would later testify that he hid the infant in a suitcase and Savannah's body in a dresser, with all the shelves removed. The couple would drive the dresser containing Savannah's body to a bridge over the Red River and dump it in the water two days after the brutal murder. On August 23, 2017, co-workers reported to police that William had mentioned having a baby at home. 
Residents of the apartment building heard a baby crying from apartment hash 5 that day and immediately called the police. The information provided enabled the officers to obtain a warrant and return to the familiar apartment, where they conducted a thorough search that resulted in the discovery of a live newborn baby girl. Brooke didn't mince words when she revealed that Savannah had given her the baby two days after her disappearance. Savannah, according to her, didn't want this baby, and when she came to help with sewing a dress that day, she asked Brooke how she could induce labor on her own. She then left and returned two days later at 3 swan a.m. Brooke took the baby in her arms and handed it to her. Savannah was reported missing after the couple was arrested. Cass County Social Services took temporary custody of the baby after it was taken to a local hospital. A DNA test confirmed parentage a few days later, and the girl was reunited with her father. Police and hundreds of local residents searched the valley for Savannah for three more days. Please check your property, buildings, garages, and outbuildings for any signs of entry or any indication that someone has been there. Landlords, please check any vacant apartments you may have for any signs of entry or evidence that someone has been there. If you are willing to check your dumpsters, we ask the public to help with that, Chief Todd said at a press conference on August 27th, eight days after Savannah's disappearance. On August 27th, fishermen discovered a body wrapped in plastic on the Red River near Harwood. Savannah was identified by a tattoo on her leg that read, Too Beautiful for Earth. On August 28th, Brooke Cruz and William Hone were charged with murder conspiracy, kidnapping conspiracy, and providing false information to police. The couple started confessing. Brooke claimed she started the fight by accusing Savannah of stealing mail and mistreating her cat. Brooke pushed Savannah, causing her to hit her head on the bathroom sink and lose consciousness as a result of the verbal argument. Brooke then took a knife and cut from hip to hip to remove the baby. Savannah went in and out of consciousness during this process. Brooke confirmed under questioning that William Hone was unaware of the impending plan. William, she claims, came home, went into the bathroom, saw Savannah, and asked if she was still alive. Brooke responded that she didn't know and asked for a task. William briefly left the bathroom and then returned in his underwear, holding a rope with which he strangled Savannah. He stated that if she had been breathing up to this point, she was definitely dead now. Brooke went on to say that the two of them scrubbed the floor and walls before stuffing the lifeless body into a bathroom closet. When the cops arrived at the door, Brooke tried to remain calm and unconcerned. The officers searched the apartment but discovered nothing. Because they did not have a search warrant, the officers were only able to look in closets and dressers. According to the perpetrator, the child was under a blanket on their bed next to William during both searches that day. Because the girl was calm and did not cry, she was not discovered during the third inspection on August 20th. The body was already inside the dresser, and the baby was hidden in a suitcase. They took the dresser down the stairs in the early morning hours of August 21st, loaded it into their Jeep Cherokee, drove it to the river, and disposed it of it. William Hone denied any involvement in the crime. He only admitted to hiding the newborn baby girl and lying to law enforcement to cover up the crime. Bail was set at $2 million for Brooke and William, which William remarked was an unrealistic and unreasonable amount for any ordinary person. Surprisingly, he seemed to believe he deserved something reasonable for what he had done. Brooke Cruz was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. During the trial, William's involvement in the crime was not proven. Brooke's cellmate, Jennifer Robinson, was also revealed to have testified against her. According to the inmate's claim, Brooke stated that she strangled Savannah with a rope. After learning about Savannah and William's affair, and suspecting that Savannah's child was the result of his affair. William was found not guilty of conspiracy to commit murder by a jury on September 28, 2018. However, on October 30, 2018, he was sentenced to life in prison after pleading guilty to kidnapping. William filed an appeal with the Supreme Court the following spring in May 2019. The sentencing review trial concluded on October 7, 2019. Judge Olin, who had originally sentenced William to life in prison, stated that despite the Supreme Court's decision, he would still sentence him to the harshest sentence available at the time, which was 20 years in prison. 
Given that William had already served 775 days in prison, he would have to serve more than seven years more, his 20-year sentence. Despite such an unusual delivery, baby Hasley was unharmed. The young lady is now six years old and attends kindergarten. Savannah's parents and the girl's father have joint custody of the child. The grandparents keep a public Facebook page where they post updates on how their granddaughter is doing. The case has gained national attention. Norberta is convinced that Savannah's disappearance was overlooked because she was Native American. I feel that her disappearance was not taken as seriously as the disappearance of a white woman, she said. I've lived in Fargo almost my entire life, and I've seen how differently Native Americans are treated. Savannah's death prompted Democratic Senator Heidi Heitkamp to introduce Savannah's Law, which was signed into law in October 2020. The bill seeks to reduce violence against Native American women by enhancing collaboration among federal, state, and tribal authorities. Norberta said of the bill's passage, It's sad that my daughter had to die for people to take Native Americans seriously. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. The exception was Cassandra and her twin brother, Rob. When they were younger, they would often spend an entire day telling each other scary stories in a dark room. Rob considered himself to be a natural storyteller. Every time he told a scary story, Cassandra would scream and he would scatter on his bed, mumbling to himself, you can't even scare the neighbors, little Joey, with stories like that. No, scary stories are not your thing. Together, they also watched the animated series Scooby-Doo, and during that time, they argued over which of the characters was really a vampire disguised as a ghost. Her brother was anxious because Cassandra's intuitive guesses were frequently more accurate than his. Even though Mary Smith did not have the twins' enthusiasm for reading, she nevertheless bought her kids' books by Robert Wall because she wanted them to grow up to be lifelong readers. The brother and sister's love of scary stories was a lifelong passion that they developed as children, even as adults. They entertained the idea of launching a horror-themed store and even gathered figurines of villains. Cassandra joined the set in 2004 due to her interest in horror films, and she made a cameo in a scary film that, while not very successful, still caused a lot of jealous looks. I'm ready to play anyone. Rob, you must have made some acquaintances there, right? Cassandra, maybe we should talk. Rob's sister responded, I'm pretty close with the head of the cast. Maybe something will come out of it, but no promises. I got the part by accident myself. Rob continued to beg his sister to broker a deal on his behalf. Rob was overjoyed, but even in an episodic role, he was unable to land a role. Colin Dudley was the leading man in that film, and chemistry blossomed between him and the newcomer on the set. None of them dared to take the first step, but that all changed at a Halloween party at the office. Colin dressed as Alex from A Clockwork Orange, and Cassandra dressed like Velma from Scooby-Doo. Colin perceived the cartoon character as more than just a costume, while Cassandra saw it as just that, a costume. Like his character in the movie, he strolled around with a glass of milk and gave everyone a glare. He read passages from the book as well. He would look at Cassandra and say, Beauty invariably caused my only desire to destroy it, for it did not fit at all into our ugly world. Cassandra took this as a compliment, and they soon started dating, but their brief relationship lasted only a few months. Colin began dating Rebecca, another actress, after finding her. The pair eventually moved in together. 2020. August 25th. Cassandra Cannell vanished. Without giving anyone any notice, she took off from home in her car, in an unknown direction, and didn't pick up the phone. For a very long time, the police refused to accept her mother's report, attempting to console the distraught mother by explaining that kids grow up and don't always tell their parents when they go out with friends. But Mary Smith was certain that something horrible had occurred, and perhaps she could still see her daughter alive if the indolent police would finally get to work. It took two days for the police to start looking for Cassandra, and on the third day, they discovered her car in an undesirable location beneath a bridge. The bad news gets even worse. The keys were inside the unlocked car. It was hard to know what Cassandra was up to there. This area was thought to be a homeless community, 
and the police regularly discovered bodies there that had either overdosed on illegal drugs or been killed in domestic violence. The police had to patrol the neighborhood, questioning a large number of homeless people who attempted to flee when they saw them. All of them were unaware of the time the car appeared there, though, and none of them had seen Cassandra. It was difficult to have any higher expectations of the people who lived beneath the bridge and consumed alcohol all day. As directed, the detective working on Cassandra's case asked to see her cell phone bill, but he knew from past experience that this would not help him in any way. And so it did. The signal indicated that the phone was in the body of water closest to the bridge, making it impossible for the investigators to retrieve it and obtain the information they required. Still, a group of divers started combing the shoreline. To see how far they could throw the phone, they picked up rocks from the shore and tossed them into the water before doing so. Cassandra's mother claimed that since her daughter's phone case was adorned with rhinestones, it would be easy to locate. While it is true that the phone was located quickly, Cassandra's body was not in the water. Although her mother was told this was good news, she did not feel any better. Her daughter's death appeared to have become second nature to her, and all she wanted was for her body to be discovered and for this terrifying period of uncertainty to end. She replied, I was looking forward to my granddaughter. I wanted to be a grandmother sooner, and I didn't even have time to give her a crib. It's just sitting in the garage in a box. What should I do with it now? The mother was saddened to learn that this became crucial information for the inquiry. Pregnant women are frequently the victims of crimes committed by their partners, the expectant fathers, according to statistics. However, Mary Smith was unaware of the identity of her future granddaughter's father. Cassandra had not even met anyone and was single, even though her age was already apparent. It made sense that she had become pregnant through a male partner, but Mary was unaware of the child's possible father. Even so, according to her mother, her daughter frequently called and corresponded with someone. However, for some reason, her interlocutor's phone number was not entered in her daughter's book, and the mother, understandably, could not recall the numbers. She had just realized that it was kind of weird to talk to someone so frequently and not get his phone number down. It was common knowledge that girls could not maintain complete confidentiality in their relationships, so Cassandra should have at least one friend with whom she could share her secrets, particularly if those secrets involved a pregnancy. One found a friend like that. She disclosed that Cassandra had revived her romance with her ex-boyfriend Colin Dudley in a chat with law enforcement. Yes, their 2004 relationship was brief, and they had already broken up 15 years earlier. In general, it was odd that they could still recall one another after all this time. Colin, as it happened, contacted Cassandra in 2014. He discovered Cassandra on Facebook, wrote her some kind words, and revealed that he and his wife Rebecca had a tense relationship before his father's recent death. Thus, he had no one with whom to commiserate. Cassandra made the decision to get together purely out of friendship and speak with her ex-boyfriend to help him feel better. However, the cordial get together evolved into something more. Colin started leading a double life in 2014, with Cassandra acting as his mistress. The young woman did not want to tell Colin Dudley that she was pregnant when she found out. She remembered their conversation, in which Colin declared emphatically that he wanted no children at all and that he was delighted Rebecca was infertile every time she felt the need to tell him so. Cassandra didn't want to hurt her lover, so she kept the possibility of his having a daughter or son a secret because she knew it could destroy a real family. In the meantime, her tummy continued to swell and protrude beyond the baggy sweaters. Cassandra stopped seeing him so that Colin couldn't figure out anything. But how can one go on? She knew that hiding it would not last long, and that lying to Colin about having another boyfriend would be hurtful and lead to their breakup. Cassandra told Colin over the phone that she was expecting a child with him after deciding that the bitter truth was preferable to a charming lie. After a long period of silence, Colin finally expressed his happiness at the news. Though it sounded very strange, Cassandra deduced that Colin was actually happy. When the detective knocked on Colin's door upon arriving at his residence, his wife answered. 
resolving that discussing a missing mistress with Colin's legal wife wasn't entirely moral, the detective presented himself as a longtime friend of Dudley's. Colin emerged at once, closed the door behind him, and left the house accompanied by the detective, who had not even made an introduction. He appeared to have been anticipating this encounter. Thank you for not making your credentials public in front of Rebecca. You're a man of honor, a true officer. My compliments to you, Colin said in brief phrases. I heard Cassandra is missing. It's weird, bloody weird. I can't even guess where she might have gone. She told me she'd had a big fight with her brother and was really worried about it. I advised her to stop by and make up with him. I don't know if she listened to me or not. Rob had told him about the fight as far as the detective knew. It was just a family dispute, nothing serious. Still, Cassandra's twin brother had been devastated by her disappearance because the day before, Cassandra had called him and asked it to come talk to him. But now that his arrogant brother had declined, he held himself responsible. His sister would not have vanished it if she had visited him that day. You know, officer, I'm not the nicest person. I think you realize that dating my ex-girlfriend in secret from my wife for such a long period of time. I'm sure I'll be punished for it in the next world. But the human heart doesn't decide who you fall in love with. In 2014, my father died. He literally hated Rebecca with all his soul, and the feeling was mutual. But he really liked Cassandra. He often remembered her, reproached me for the fact that we broke up with her almost immediately after Christmas. We often fight with our parents, accusing them of not understanding, and then it turns out that it's us, their children, who don't understand, and it hurts. My father was right, of course. And after he died, I just wanted to fulfill one of his wishes, and so I resumed my relationship with Cassandra. Rebecca needed to be broken up with. It was a conversation I kept putting off, you know. This family stuff sucks you dry, so I kept stalling. I've been living a double life for five years. It was hell. I had to make excuses for coming home late all the time, to hide it. I'd tell her about some fictitious business trips, and even bought a fishing rod, even though I hated fishing. A stupid pastime, and I'd tell Rebecca I was going to the lake while I went to Cassandra's. Before coming home, I'd buy fish at the supermarket for extra convincing, and Rebecca would bake it in the oven, and I'd eat it even though the smell of fish makes me sick. Did you know Cassandra was pregnant? What? Pregnant by whom? I don't have that information, but she told a close friend of hers that it was from you. That can't be true. She's been adamantly refusing to see me lately, and I guess I understand her and can't blame her for that. Naturally, she was tired of being in the background and wanted a family, which unfortunately I couldn't give her. I guess that the reason she refused to see me was because she had found someone else. Detective asked, when was the last time you saw her? Honestly, I can't even remember. I think it was about three months ago, maybe four, if you don't count the time we literally ran into her at the mall by chance. But that was fleeting because my wife was in the fitting room, and I just got tired of waiting for her and decided to take a walk to the coffee shop. Tell me, officer, is there any chance you'll find her alive? Dudley continued. We're doing everything we can, believe me. Colin had more interactions with the detective after this one. Despite the fact that Cassandra's phone was recovered from the bottom of the pond, the police still asked for the missing person's call logs. The unsigned number her mother had informed her about actually belonged to Colin Dudley. Cassandra called him most of the time, and they even spoke on the day she vanished. Furthermore, the CCTV footage from the train station near the bridge, where Cassandra's abandoned car had been discovered, was given to the police that day. A strange man who stood out among the other passengers on the platform was observed by them. He had on a long cloak, gloves, a scarf covering his face, and a hat with the sides pulled down over his eyes. The detective claimed that although he couldn't see the man's face, Colin Dudley's gait was strikingly similar to that of the man. Regarding the hat, it bore a striking resemblance to the one donned by Alex in A Clockwork Orange. The investigators noticed that the strange man actually entered the cafe for a short while before exiting and heading toward the parking lot, where he got into his car and drove off. After they kept tracking him down through the CCTV cameras, the stranger never revealed his face to them during this entire time but they were able to see the car's licensee plate number, which belonged to Colin Dudley. 
that the stranger got into. A search warrant was used to send a unit to his home. It was the detective's hope that Cassandra was still alive and in Dudley's home's basement. Initially, there was no proof of a homicide at Colin's residence. However, they discovered the exact hat Colin was attempting to conceal himself in the closet. After that, they descended to the basement, where they found no sign of the crime and no sign of Cassandra. But when the service dog sniffed the couch, it was trained to search for bloodstains. It barked, and that raised red flags right away. Colin affirmed that he hadn't broken any laws. The police were attempting to blame him, an innocent man for the crime because they had no other leads and no evidence. When the detective spoke with his wife, she was naturally horrified to learn about the activities in their home, the charges against her spousy, and the years-long deception. She had a lot to say about her husband and her feelings, but after giving it some thought, she responded negatively when the detective asked if her husband was capable of murder. Rob and Mary Smith were furious that Colin could not be imprisoned despite the abundance of evidence against him, and the detective was simply raising his hands. Colin was brought in once more for interrogation. Considering that he had an alibi for every accusation, he gave the crime considerable thought. Colin visited a hardware store early on August 25th at 6.30 a.m. and bought trash bags and household cleaning supplies. The store's cameras did, in fact, verify this, but this whole thing was overshadowed by the big garbage bags. Then Cassandra texted Colin to let him know that she was almost at his house, but Colin quickly deleted the message. But it stayed in the cell phone carrier's memory, and the call and message dump gave it to the police. Additionally, the couple did not leave the house for several hours that morning, based on their cell phone bill. Subsequently, Colin switched off his phone, but unintentionally left his mistress's phone on. This allowed the police to track Colin's entire path of movement, including his location as captured by the station's CCTV cameras. It was already known by the police that he had visited the cafe, likely using the restroom to clean up after the murder. Colin hopped in his car and headed to the pond where he had thrown Cassandra's phone, which was where the cell phone's last signal had come from. Now was the time to find Cassandra's body. The GPS tracker from Colin's car was taken by the police so they could follow the route precisely. The gadget accurately mimicked Cassandra's mobile signal movement. However, his actions the next day provided fresh evidence in the case. When the police followed his route through the woods, they came across a large trash can that was rope-tied in a ravine. Blood stained the entire area surrounding it, making it obvious what was inside the container. It was a month after the murder by that point, and the body was hard to identify. The description of Cassandra's tattoo in the search notes proved helpful to the police. The same day, Colin was arrested and accused of murder. After performing a forensic examination, forensics determined that blunt force trauma to the skull resulted in a fracture that caused death. The police discovered bloodstains in the basement of the Dudley house that were impossible to remove entirely. Rebecca was unaware of the homicide. She spent the entire day in a different area of the house where the sounds from the basement were muffled. She also stated that Colin's claim that she was infertile was untrue and that she had never desired children. This was seen by the police as the crime's motivation. The absence of witnesses and tangible evidence, like the murder weapon, made it impossible to persuade the jury that Colin Dudley was the murderer during the trial. The murderer was then offered a reduced sentence by the court in exchange for his guilty plea. Colin received a 26-year prison sentence. The fact that the murderer would probably live to see the day he could be freed caused great distress to Cassandra's mother and brother, who were still upset about his refusal to meet with his sister prior to her death. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. The case of Nobuyuki, who abducted Fusako Sano, a schoolgirl, and kept her as a pet in his house, eventually realizing that the perpetrator was a maniac, is possible due to the nature of his actions. As a rule, maniacs abuse, torture, and then brutally take the lives of their victims. However, sometimes such abuse lasts for years or even decades. If the account of a maniac has more than two victims, criminalists call it a series, and the criminal himself is a serial maniac. 
The history of world criminalistics knows many cases when maniacs did not kill their victims, but held them captive in their own homes, basements, or specially created bunkers. It is enough to remember Natasha Kush, or Elizabeth Fritzel, who was kept by her own father in the basement of their house for 24 years. Alas, there are many such stories, and what is most curious is that in most cases, the hostages were, one might say, in full view of everyone, and the kidnappers had previously come to the attention of the police. Fusako Sano was held captive for nearly 10 years in an unlocked room, allegedly to serve as an inspiration to Natasha Kush's kidnapper, although by the time this tragedy became publicized, Austrian schoolgirl Natasha had already spent over one year living under captivity. But let us explore this complicated case known as the Niigata Girl Captivity Incident thoroughly from its inception. Fusako Sano was born in Nagata Prefecture's small Japanese town of Mitsuke on November 28, 1980, and quickly became one of the favorite children within her household. With average incomes and regular attendance at local schools, as well as cheering for local teams, such as baseball. Unfortunately, however, on December 7, 1986, she fell prey to her attackers while walking home alone from school on that fateful November day in 1980. Fusako was in fourth grade at the time and returning home after staying to watch her school's baseball game on November 13th, 1990, two weeks before her 10th birthday. Due to this sporting event, her parents weren't too concerned when she took her regular route home that evening, as it got darker quickly. Almost no passersby were around, and passing cars quickly vanished from view. Unexpectedly, one car suddenly overtook Fusako and then abruptly braked and swerved to avoid her. A loud squeal of brakes split Fusako's life in two. Nobuyuki Sato was born on July 15, 1962, in Nagata Prefecture, Japan into a wealthy family. His father ran his own successful passenger transportation business, and his mother was 37. At his birth, his parents were aged 62 and 37, respectively, and no ties between Nobuyuki and any of his five siblings from his father's previous marriage existed between them and Nobuyuki himself. The boy became a particularly capricious and spoilt child who displayed no restraints or inhibitions in his behavior. Yet, at times he could become very emotional or even aggressive if his demands weren't immediately fulfilled, sometimes throwing tantrums or even attacking his mother with fists during store visits when she refused to buy him the toys he demanded. At school, Nobuyuki had few friends due to his unique blend of complex personalities, strange habits, and sometimes inappropriate behavior. Furthermore, his height had caused embarrassment so much that he often slouched when embarrassed leading him to acquire offensive nicknames. On one of the city's central streets was built a luxurious two-story European-style house for Nobuyuki, where most of the second floor was dedicated to his children's room, which Nobuyuki frequently detested and said was too scary and did not like spending time alone in there alone. At first, his anxiety and unreasonable fears prompted a visit to a regular hospital, followed by a referral to a psychiatrist for evaluation. There he was diagnosed with several disorders, such as nyctophobia, fear of darkness, misophobia, fear of germs and dirt, autophobia, fear of loneliness, and sociophobia, anxiety disorder related to social interaction, as he avoided both solitude and contact with others equally well. Nobuyuki had always been an outcast, neither with a girlfriend nor with friends. In high school, he became an outcast due to peer disdain. When his anger and displeasure with himself or others surfaced, he could only vent it on his elderly parents, who gave gifts or money in an attempt to placate their son. As an adult, Nobuyuki never held down any jobs for long. He frequently caused trouble and caused conflict among colleagues, while also neglecting direct duties that made others unwilling to work with him. At times he would leave midday just because it rained, or because it made him sad. Once, however, due to misguided sympathy, he intentionally injured a female co-worker, which resulted in immediate termination from employment. Since then, he has lived off of parental funds alone. Gradually, Sato began leaving his room less frequently, leading him to increasingly become estranged from both parents. Following one particularly heated argument between himself and one parent, he set fire to his home 
nearly destroying its inhabitants as well. Subsequently, Sato was ordered into compulsory treatment at a psychiatric clinic where they diagnosed him with manic depressive disorder, outbursts of uncontrolled aggression, and signs of misogyny, an intensity dislike or hatred towards Femalis. Nobuyuki spent approximately one month in the hospital before being released as a threat to others. For some time after his release from care, Nobuyuki appeared relatively calm, even starting to rebuild the partially burned house by adding additional rooms. But soon afterwards, he simply gave up this endeavor, abandoning construction altogether. Sato was increasingly unsociable and sullen, spending most of his time watching television in his room. Soon thereafter, he refused to permit either his mother or father into either his room or upstairs at all. Any violation would lead to violent attacks against their elderly parents, with fists, shouts of abuse, and threats of death from Sato. Nobuyuki started taking walks near one of the local schools, where he would observe girls closely. At first, he behaved appropriately by not approaching or making contact with anyone nearby, until one day, when he grabbed one of the girls from right outside her school gate, threw her over his shoulder, ran to his car parked nearby, grabbed another girl at random from among those already inside, and ran back out again before getting into his own vehicle, before shouting for help and retrieving both girls and the suspect within minutes. In response, a school security guard and some bystanders quickly intervened to rescue both girls, while also detaining the kidnapper before any further harm could come their way. Sato tried to kidnap a girl who was only nine years old and could offer no plausible excuse for why he attacked the schoolgirl. Therefore, police charged Sato with attempted unlawful acts of violence against minors. Nobuyuki faced an intense prison sentence at his trial held in August of that same year, yet was released with only a year's probationary period instead. Some reports state that Nobuyuki's father provided help by using connections and paying substantial sums in order to reduce Nobuyuki's sentence to only one year's probationary time. Nobuyuki suddenly disappeared from the database of criminals who were prosecuted, likely under his father's influence. Yet after spending hours cleaning up Nobuyuki's reputation in an effort to restore it, his elderly father suffered a heart attack and died. Sato felt profound shame and guilt over raising such an evil monster. Nobuyuki returned a year and a half later with another attempt, behaving more subtly this time to try to abduct nine-year-old Fusako Sano from school on November 13, 1990, yet again acting with ease and unnoticed by police or media alike. On that evening, as it began getting dark, he drove onto an otherwise deserted road, where soon he saw Fusako Sano from school returning home, unfortunately delayed at a sporting event earlier in the day, due to her being late and getting stuck behind traffic on her journey home. Fusako Sano was directly in front of Sato when he abruptly braked, swerved, and got out. He grabbed her tightly and warned her that if she tried to scream or run away, he would cut open her throat. After this confrontation was concluded, he shoved Fusako Sano back into the trunk before driving for some distance before turning onto an abandoned lot. Nobuyuki used his trunk again to tie Fusako's hands and feet together and tape her mouth shut before driving home and transporting her through an unfinished part of his dwelling to reach his room, entering through an unfinished part in order to remain undetected, as always through the front door. Once there, Nobuyuki ordered Fusako to remain quiet while brandishing a knife threateningly and tied her securely onto his bed before warning that any time she tried leaving, looking out the window screaming or crying, she would be killed and her body would end up somewhere far off somewhere that no one would ever find it again. The schoolgirl was terrified and did everything the kidnapper asked, hoping, against hope, he would feel sorry for her and let her go. Fusako Sano had not come home from school as expected, and her parents became worried. Knowing she would stay after class to watch a baseball game, but it had been getting dark outside, she should have arrived home long ago. At first, her parents tried searching on their own, following her route between home and school, However, their efforts proved futile. As darkness fell, her parents made an emergency appeal to the police, hoping their daughter would be quickly located. Given that only hours had passed since her disappearance, police squads quickly started the search operation, with local volunteers joining by morning. 
On the third day, over 200 individuals participated, combing through Aris, pesting flyers with photographs of the missing girl and questioning passers-by for witnesses who may know something about what had happened. Nobuyuki lived close to both the girls' school and police station, as well as having come under suspicion for trying to kidnap another female student in the past. Yet despite all this, Nobuyuki was not considered suspect due to the efforts of his late father to ensure his name would not appear on criminal databases. Similarly, this likely played into Nobuyuki's non-prosecution in this instance. Search efforts lasted many months and involved searching many vacant buildings, trailers, and railroad cars, searching suspicious vehicles, combing vacant lots, and inspecting interstate highways for clues to Fusako Sano's whereabouts. However, none could be found despite all efforts being put forth. Various theories were explored, such as North Korean special services abducting her. But this proved fruitless. Fusako Sano was still considered missing at that point in time. Fusako was captured by a psycho. Fusako later admitted that at first she was terrified and did everything her captor asked of her in hopes that Nobuyuki might take pity on her and free her. Unfortunately for Fusako, though, Nobuyuki never considered freeing his captive. For several months, he bound her hands and feet tightly, inhibiting blood flow to her extremities and leading to sensory losses in them. As soon as Fusako disobeyed or violated her silence, Nobuyuki used a stun gun as punishment. Otherwise, he beat her on both head and body with his fists or threatened her with a knife. Nobuyuki never once exploited Fusako sexually, instead treating her more like something between an innocent toy and a pet while imprisoning her. Nobuyuki fed Fusako once or twice daily with food prepared by his mother, who lived on the first floor. Due to this meager diet, the girl became weaker and malnourished. Nobuyuki forbade her from leaving bed. Instead, she would need to use plastic bags when going to the bathroom, and she was brought back inside plastic bags by Nobuyuki for transport back out into his unfinished part of the house after. Once every month, Nobuyuki bathed Fusako in his basin before cutting her hair and nails himself and dressing her in his own shabby clothes while practicing various fighting techniques with her. Even when acting quietly and not breaking his rules regularly for fun, Nobuyuki would beat her regularly for fun and would practice various fighting techniques on her. Over time, Fusako became psychologically broken. She began obeying all the demands of her tormentor and no longer attempted to run, look out of windows, or run away from him. When Sato went elsewhere, he stopped tying Fusako up. Instead, he simply made his bed with Fusako laying there, layering some blankets or towels on top so it would look as if nothing were there underneath at first glance. Nobuyuki gradually began turning Fuso's radio on periodically and allowed her to watch television with him. Though their viewing consisted only of scotchy or sports matches that interested Nobuyuki himself, the comic books he brought her were her sole source of reading material during her incarceration. For almost 10 years, Fusako had seen no one other than Nobuyuki alone. No one spoke to her. She never ventured beyond her room's confinement and barely moved. Instead, she remained still while Nobuyuki mistreated her. Eventually, she gave up resisting escape or making herself known, despite abuse by police indifference or her captors. She accepted her fate with grace and did not attempt escape or make herself known or resist despite abuse from Nobuyuki or anyone else. Ultimately, accepting her fate with resignation without resistance or effort on her part or making herself known or resist making herself known Accepting her fate without making herself known or resisting escape or making herself known even after experiencing abuse or police indifferent. Nobuyuki's mother lived on the first floor, and for years she had not entered his room due to threats from Nobuyuki of physical punishment if she intruded upon his personal space. Knowing Nobuyuki well, she followed his rules without question. Once Nobuyuki placed a prisoner in his room, however, even going up the stairs became forbidden and when she attempted it once, he simply shoved her back down again. Although she tried her hardest not to be at home too much when working, she retired at age 73 when her life became unbearably due to abuse from Nobuyuki,
who regularly beat her up while demanding she obey a set of rules made up by him alone. At last, Mrs. Sato could no longer take it. In the spring of 1996, she went to the police to file a statement alleging domestic violence by her son. Unfortunately, however, no action was taken, and Mrs. Sato was persuaded by officers not to withdraw her statement and deal with family problems on her own. Additionally, twice she applied for consultation at a public health center, complaining of her son's inadequate and aggressive behavior while seeking hospitalization at a psychiatric hospital. Both times this request was refused, considering that her plea was not serious enough. Instead, advice was given by staff that persuaded her son himself to seek help at said clinic, rather than trying to persuade his mother to seek treatment themselves. After another beating in January 2000, an exhausted elderly woman called the hospital and requested that a medical team and law enforcement officials visit her house, as her son Nobuyuki had tied her up and tasered her several times. These officials eventually responded to her requests and attended. When the ambulance and police car arrived at Nobuyuki's address, he immediately began acting aggressively toward them before resisting and trying to fight against them. Due to this inappropriate behavior, he had to be handcuffed by medics before receiving large doses of sedatives. The elderly woman admitted she was terrified of her son, whose behavior had grown increasingly aggressive and uncontrolled over the past several months. Additionally, he forbade her from visiting the second floor for years, with threats that he would kill her if she did so. Police officers decided to inspect Nobuyuki's room on the second floor. When they entered, they noticed a pile of blankets laid across Nobuyuki's bed, which suddenly moved slightly when touched. Police officers were stunned to see an extremely thin, pale, and exhausted girl lying underneath them. She reluctantly gave her name when they questioned her about who she was and how she ended up there and said she had been a hostage for a long time on her way home from school. After discovering Nayuki had been captured, her mother was brought into the room. But the woman seemed very surprised and said that no other people lived in their house other than herself and her son. Also, Nayuki confirmed she had never seen this woman before. Nuki was brought into the station the same day for questioning, and his responses shocked the police officers. He vividly recounted a day when he saw Fusako driving along the road and remembered everything about that day, as well as their conversation that day. Sato claimed he found the girl extremely cute and wanted to bring her home with him. Sato claimed he took excellent care in feeding, washing, and dressing her while reading comic books aloud to her, punishing her only for disobedience. He admitted he loved his captive as a friend, and she seemed to care about him too. He had no plans of ever parting ways and hoped she would remain his lifelong companion. He enjoyed spending time with Fusako and could talk for hours about soccer, music, and his favorite comic book characters while she silently listened in. Additionally, he never locked his bedroom door, yet she never tried escaping, which led him to believe she liked living with him. Consequences, trial, and sentence. Following an exhaustive medical examination, doctors determined that Sato was capable of understanding his actions despite his mental disorder and could stand trial. His mother may be considered an accomplice since she regularly purchased feminine hygiene products from supermarkets at her son's request, yet her attempts at reaching police or medical institutions went ignored, as did her request to visit family home. Before trial commenced, this case received widespread coverage in media and public forums, and the city police came under heavy criticism due to Nobuki having previously been prosecuted for attempted kidnapping of a schoolgirl and then failing to follow through with his plan as planned. Upon the conclusion of his plan, however, he remained free of suspicion, thus leading them to remove both the local police chief and the head of the regional police department, who both made numerous mistakes along the way from their positions. Nobuyuki Sato was brought before trial for kidnapping in May 2000, and all his actions and offenses were studied carefully as the prosecution attempted to secure maximum punishment for him. Sato was found guilty and given 14 years imprisonment as punishment this term being considered maximum at that time. Upon being released, he found his mother had long since passed away, leaving no living relatives for Nobuyuki. 
Eventually, Nobuyuki himself was found dead, one and a half years later, in an undisclosed rented room, with no apparent cause of his demise. How did Fusako fare? At the time of her discovery, Fusako was so weak that she could barely stand on her own. Doctors diagnosed her with exhaustion and dehydration. Her muscles had nearly atrophied. Additionally to stuttering, Fusako was afraid of sunlight and lost communication abilities completely. When her parents saw their daughter after nine years apart for the first time, they didn't recognize her at first glance. Physical recovery took about one year, while mental well-being took much longer to repair itself. Fusako Sano suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder and avoided interaction with others. Her intelligence remained at that of an eight- or nine-year-old child. Fusako's parents took their daughter away from town. Sachiko Yamada changed her name and flatly refused any contact from journalists. Over time, however, she made friends, took up photography, and eventually passed her GED exams. She eventually passed her driver's license test, but tragically, in 2007, her life was forever altered when her father drowned while on a family outing to a pond. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Denise Dragon's well-known case shows how naive idealism, morbid jealousy, and a strong desire for illegal drugs can combine to cause tragedy and destroy three young lives at the same time. At the time of the tragedy, the oldest person involved, and I'm not afraid to use this word, was only 22 years old. He really tried hard to keep playing with the feelings of the two girls, who were only 17 and 19 years old. They were in a love triangle for a short time, but it ended in two pregnancies, crazy stalking and murder. Mario Topanera was born in 1996 in a small town called Alcorcón in Spain, just outside of Madrid. The young man never put himself through the stress of school or looking for work. He lived with his parents when he was 22 years old and worked part-time jobs to pay the bills. Mario loved writing graffiti and was very good at drawing but he couldn't use his art skills anywhere. He was happy with his small part-time jobs painting buildings outside and inside walls. The main way Mario made money was by selling illegal goods. He didn't do it himself. Instead, he found people who were interested and took them to a remote part of the city where his friends could get them anything they needed. Topanera made a lot of money from these deals, so he was always looking for people who could help him. It's unclear if Mario's parents knew what he was doing but if they did, they clearly didn't care. Mario had a good looks and a strong personality. He was popular with both sexes. The young man was very good at using his charm to make friends and often dated several girls at the same time without meaning to. Denise Maria Dragon was born in Romania in 2001 to Emil and Daniela Dragon. Her parents were very young and having a hard time with money, so they had to go work in Spain and leave their little girl with her grandparents. After a few years, they were able to get married legally in another country, get a good job and pretty much set up their daily lives. They moved their little daughter to their home in sunny Spain. The girl quickly made friends where she lived and found it easy to learn the language. At school, she did well in almost all of her classes and got good grades. The little girl was also interested in dancing, happily spent several hours a day in the studio and regularly competed in a variety of events. When the girl was in middle school, her parents' marriage fell apart and they decided to split up. The child went to live with her mother after the parents got divorced, but her father continued to care for her in every way, even though he had a new family. He helped her communicate, gave her money, and tried to be a part of her life in every way. Soon after, her mother also got married again, and a year later, the girl had a younger brother whom she loved and spent a lot of time with. When Denise was 16, she decided she wanted to learn how to do hair and become a stylist. She quit her studies and dance classes to focus on her new hobby full time. Her parents didn't stop her or try to discourage her. They let their daughter make her own decisions to gain experience. Denise got a job at a beauty salon owned by family members. Rocio Martinez, a 19-year-old girl from the suburbs of Madrid, was the third main character in this dramatic story and the last link in the love triangle. 
Her father was a police officer who was transferred to Alcorcon, where he moved his whole family. Rocio was impulsive, scandalous, and sometimes even angry as a child. She was used to getting what she wanted and didn't put up with Rege. Martinez was never charged for what she did, though, because her father was a police officer and had a lot of connections. Rocio believed that no matter what she did, her father would get her out of trouble. Rocio was also very pretty, so she always had a lot of fans. When Denise stopped going to school and started working as a stylist, she had more time to hang out with her friends. Since high school, she had a best friend named Sylvia, to whom she confided all of her secrets and worries. One spring evening in 2018, Denise and her friend were walking around the city when they met Mario, a handsome and happy guy who immediately struck up a conversation with Denise. That same evening, they went on a date. A few days after meeting, Denise invited her chosen one to a family dinner to meet her mother, but Daniela did not agree with her daughter's choice. The woman did not like Denise's lover right away. Something about him scared her. Her mother quickly looked into him and was horrified to find out that Mario was involved in drug trafficking. Daniela had a serious talk with her daughter in the hopes that she would end their relationship. Denise quickly learned that Mario isn't as nice and kind as he acts. The young man tried to control every step of her passport, wanted to know where she went and who she talked to without her permission, took her phone, and checked her accounts and social networks for months. The girl in love hoped that her boyfriend would change so that they could have a strong, long-lasting relationship, but things only got worse as Mario started to treat her like his property. For another thing, she was only 17 years old and wasn't ready to be a mother or take care of a new child. Denise then decided to be honest with her mother and told her everything. She then asked her mother for advice on what to do next. The woman listened to her daughter and told her that she should end the pregnancy, but that was her choice. Denise gave it some more thought and then did what her mother told her to do. She had an abortion. When Panara found out, he was furious. He thought Denise had betrayed him by having the abortion, since she had no right to do so, and only he could decide what to do with the child. The couple's relationship ended, but the young man wouldn't let Denise go and leave her alone. He also promised to hurt her as much as she hurt him in return. He paid for his ex-wife and daughter a trip to one of the fashionable European resorts where they went together. The vacation really did Denise good. She calmed down, became a little relaxed, began to make plans for life again, and seemed to no longer think about Mario. But the vacation was over, and Denise returned home again. Mario did not ask Longpine for his former passport, and almost immediately began an affair with 19-year-old Rocio Martinez. This fiery, aggressive, and conflicted girl was the complete opposite of the quiet and calm Denise could make a scandal in the same place, go into a fight, or throw a tantrum. Rocio also experimented with illegal substances and could easily break the law, knowing that she would not be punished for it. With Mario, they quickly got together and had fun together because the guy could get any illegal drug she asked for, wanting to test its effect on himself. However, Mario couldn't forget and let go of his ex-girlfriend. He still wanted to control her to know where she was and what she was doing. Periodically, he wrote to her on social networks, called her, and even offered to resume the relationship. Denise, who had a very hard time with this breakup, met him from time to time and communicated with him, but was not going to reunite because of fear. When Martinez found out that her boyfriend was communicating with his ex, she made a terrible scandal and in a fit of rage, screamed that she would kill them both. By that time, Mario had already realized what his chosen one was capable of, so he promised her that it would not happen again. However, Rocio's such an answer did not calm down, and she decided to destroy her rival, if not physically. Then morally, Rocio began to call Denise, showering her with insults and wishing her a speedy death. But this was not enough, and she began to send messages to her rival with threats of violent reprisals. However, Dragon considered these threats to be empty words and did not consider it necessary to contact the police because of them during that period. Rocio became pregnant about which the first thing she wrote to her rival, saying that this child is desired and she will keep it for Denise. 
This news was a painful blow, but soon Martinez, due to poor health and addiction to illegal substances, lost the child and all her anger she again poured out in a new threatening message to Denise. Denise, wanting to start a new life and forget about Mario, began an affair with a young man named Evan. They got married a month after meeting and Evan moved in with her husband. Mario was hurt that his relationship with Denise ended so quickly. So quickly after his ex-girlfriend married someone else, he started calling and texting her again to set up dates with her. In November 2018, Mario and Rocio were having dinner at a small diner on the outskirts of the city. The guy left his phone on the table while he went out for a while, and Rocio decided to check it out. That's when she saw the calls and messages Mario had been sending to Dennis Martinez. She had a temper tantrum, screamed, cried, and tried to hit her young man. In response, Mario offered his girlfriend to personally clear things up with Denise. She thought it was her husband knocking on the door, so she opened it without looking through the peephole. Denise was still talking to her friend, so she could hear everything that happened next. When Denise saw her ex-lover's friend at the door, she only had time to say her name out loud and in shock before she was stabbed in the stomach. Rocio then left right away. The wounded Denise, losing consciousness, asked her friend to call an ambulance and told her who attacked her. Dragoni was taken to the hospital in critical condition. Doctors fought desperately for her life for several hours, but the wound was too deep. She lost a lot of blood and it was almost impossible to save her. After Rocio dealt the fatal blow to her rival, she ran back to the car, jumped into the cabin, and told Mario to get out of here. On the way, she confessed everything to him and together they disposed of the crime weapon and wash the traces of blood off her hands and clothes. Mario decided it would be best for them to hide for a while. He called his relatives who lived in another city and asked them to visit. When they arrived, the relatives noticed that Rocio looked strange and was very nervous, but she wrote it off as malaise. The couple stayed overnight at Mario's relative's house, thinking about what to do and how to proceed. When they learned the next morning that Denise had died from the wound, Rocio immediately called her father and told him everything. She was sure that her dad would use all of his connections to get her out of jail this time, but the policeman's father didn't help his daughter, who had killed another man. He followed her to another city and then turned her over to the police. Sylvia, who had been talking to the victim on the phone at the time of the crime, was one of the main witnesses in the case. The case file also had many threatening messages that Rocio had sent to her rival over the course of the case. Surprisingly, Toby Nera wasn't involved in the crime. He denied all guilt and said he only took Rocio to his ex-girlfriend's house so that they could finally get along again and stop fighting. He also said he didn't know Rocio had a knife and didn't see any blood on her hands or clothes when she got back to his car. At their next court date, the couple denied their guilt again, this time saying that they were not at the scene at all. They said they had spent the whole evening at the house of one of Mario's relatives and that someone else had stabbed Denise to death. Martinez said she didn't hate her rival and didn't have any reason to kill her, but Rocio was found guilty and sent to prison for 18 and a half years. Mario, on the other hand, got away with everything and started writing a new book right away, forgetting to be careful boast that the girls were ready to kill each other for him. He told them in great detail what happened that terrible night, and the parents of dead Denise quickly learned of it. The Dragon family went back to court and asked that the man who killed their daughter be punished. This time, Top and Air were arrested, but after a few days, the man was freed on his own recognizance. In the end, he was found not guilty and was freed again. The parents of Denise tried to appeal the court's decision more than once, asking for Rocio's sentence to be lengthened and Mario to be jailed as an accomplice. However, Mario has still not been brought to justice. <laughs> Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Sherry Miller, who used sex, lies and internet chat to plan a horrific crime, was arrested in February 2000. This crime is widely regarded as the first internet-related murder in the United States. On December 22, 2000, Sherry Miller, a typical American mother of three, was convicted of second-degree murder 
and conspiracy to commit first-degree premeditated murder. She maintained her innocence for nearly 17 years before pleading guilty. In 2016, she confessed, saying, I have ruined many lives. It's time to put an end to the lies and tell the truth. Bruce and Sherry were born and raised in Flint, Michigan, a poor town that once played an important role in the Midwest auto industry. Sherry Paulette Kitley Miller was born on October 13, 1971, and recalls a difficult childhood. The girl grew up without a father, and her mother lived a dissolute lifestyle, drank heavily, and frequently changed men. Sherry's childhood was spent in a trailer with her mother's men, who frequently offended her. Sherry claims to have been abused since she was three or four years old. At 16, the girl was abandoned. At 17, she married, became pregnant, and gave birth. The marriage ended some time later. Cherie got remarried and divorced again. Her second husband, Tribby, was found guilty of second-degree child abuse after hitting his child hard, causing multiple skull fractures. Cherie clearly chose the wrong men. Tribby was also tried for abusing his six-year-old stepdaughter, but he was found not guilty due to insufficient evidence. Cherie flitted from one man to the next, looking for someone who could care for her. By the age of 26, Cherie was a single mother with three children from different men, working in a nursing home and selling Mary Kay cosmetics to make ends meet. She wasn't a model-like beauty, but she was undeniably attractive and charming. In 1997, the 26-year-old woman began working as an accountant for Bruce Miller's company, B and Auto Salvage. At this point, Cherie realized that the 47-year-old successful business owner was the ideal man to provide her with stability and comfort. Bruce Leroy Miller was born on July 26, 1951. He, like many Flint residents, worked for General Motors for several years when he was younger. After leaving GM, Bruce continued in the auto scrapping business. In fact, he owned and operated an auto junkyard that took in old cars and resold their parts. Bruce was married three times, enjoyed racing, socializing with others, and was always generous and open. At first, he had no interest in his new employee, Sherry Kitley. Bruce only assisted a single mother in a difficult life situation, but Sherry managed to entice Bruce, and an office romance developed despite the 20-year age difference. The couple's relationship progressed rapidly. Bruce was flattered by a young woman's attention, and the couple quickly progressed from dating to living together. Four months later, on April 23, 1999, a wedding was held in one of Las Vegas' chapels. Cherie and her children moved in with Bruce, and she discovered the stability she had long sought. Bruce's brother, Chuck Miller, later told the television program Snapped. She always said Bruce was the best thing that ever happened to her. She finally had a normal life and a man who could afford to make her happy. Chuck's wife, Judy, said, Bruce was overwhelmed by the pretty young blonde whom he thought was the perfect wife. Only friends expressed concern about Cherie's need to spend money shopping beyond her means. She immediately maxed out her credit cards and spent all the money she could find. I was trying to fill a constant void, Cherie later explained. Despite her friend's concerns, her hardworking husband ignored his wife's spending habits. In any case, Cherie also worked. She was a Mary Kay cosmetic salesperson so she could sell products to customers at home or while traveling across the country. Her husband even bought her a computer to help her manage her finances. This purchase proved to be a game changer. Sherry Miller accidentally discovered adult chat rooms on the internet while searching for a vacation destination on her home computer. In 1999, social networking did not exist and text messaging was not widely used. Instead, people communicated through online chat rooms, some of which were adult in nature. These were places where you could flirt anonymously, share your fantasies, and experience virtual romance. According to friends, Bruce was aware of his wife's online flirtation, but thought it was harmless. He adored his wife, was happily married, intended to adopt her children, and preferred to trust rather than cloud his family life with suspicion. Sherry quickly adjusted to the virtual world and became accustomed to logging into chat rooms and sharing her most intimate sexual fantasies 
with complete strangers under various promising aliases. Detective Kevin Shanlian, who investigated the murder case, told the court that Cherie used at least 25 different aliases. It wasn't until 2016 that she confessed, I didn't get up from behind this computer. Bruce worked at the store, and he had his own business, so he was away a lot. I spent hours flirting online. I wanted to control everything, obsessively control people who trusted me. It was like a video game, and every man and every relationship was a new level for me, and every level was harder. Jerry Cassidy, also known as Rena Dudes, was born on October 6, 1960, in Kansas City, Missouri. He married, raised a son, enjoyed deer hunting with his brothers, and aspired to become an FBI agent while working as a homicide detective. Jerry reported corruption involving falsified records to one of his co-workers. As a result, he was demoted and eventually forced to resign after nine years of service. Jerry did the right thing, but the move ended his career. Jerry became depressed, started drinking, and abused substances. His marriage ended. He eventually recovered, moved to Reno, Nevada, and worked as a security guard at Haraz Casino. In his spare time, he frequented chat rooms where he met Shari Miller. Hot correspondence began, and in July 1999, they met in person in Reno, where Sherry attended the Mary Kay convention with her friend. When the online romance turned into a physical affair, Jerry Cassidy believed his life was about to improve. Cherie stated that she was a wealthy businesswoman, living with a disabled husband, and was looking for a sexual encounter on the side. Jerry believed her, and his friend and colleague Carol Slaughter would later recount. Cherie came into Jerry's life when he was at rock bottom. His marriage had broken up. He was in a new neighborhood with no friends. Jerry fell hard for Cherie, telling his friend. Carol Slaughter that Sherry does absolutely everything in the bedroom. Throughout the summer and fall, Sherry used her cosmetics business as a cover for trips to Reno. When Sherry and Jerry were not together in Reno, they exchanged instant messages and emails of a sexual nature, including videos. Soon, they even renamed their accounts, with Sherry calling herself Jerry's Fool and Jerry calling himself Sherry's Fool. It would seem that the ex-cop should have sensed something amiss, but the emails full of declarations of love apparently blinded him. Whether Jerry was simply gullible, flawed, or broken, he was an easy target for Cherie Miller. She wove a web of deception rather quickly and convinced him that he needed to kill her husband. The effect on Jerry was quite obvious to those who knew him. His acquaintances said that after this woman appeared, their friend became like a person with bipolar disorder overly excited and active before she arrived and painfully depressed after she left. As early as September, Cherie announced that she was pregnant with Cassidy's child. She sent him pictures of a positive pregnancy test in her belly. A short time later, Cherie revealed that her husband, Bruce Miller, found out about the pregnancy and beat her, causing her to lose the baby. In fact, in 1995, Cherie had undergone a fallopian tube ligation and could no longer have children. Jerry had no way of knowing this and believed his lover's lies. Very soon after losing the baby, Cherie announced that she was pregnant again. This time, however, she was pregnant with twins. Jerry begged his beloved to leave Bruce, take the children and come to live with him. Cherie explained that she couldn't do it because Bruce had connections in the mafia and he wouldn't let them leave for nothing. Supposedly, she was afraid for her life and Jerry's life. The young woman continued to drive to Reno. At one point, Jerry was arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct at the casino. There was a pause in online correspondence for the duration of the arrest. When Jerry got out, he decided not to put Cherie in any more danger of being exposed to her husband, Bruce, and returned to Missouri to try to reconnect with his family. The couple continued their relationship online, Shari sent photos of ultrasounds and her growing belly. I just bulged out my belly. Jerry wanted to believe it so badly that I had no doubt he would see the pregnancy even if it wasn't there, Miller would later say. Soon, on November 5, 1999, Jerry Cassidy received an email, presumably from Bruce Miller, in which he wrote that he knew about everything and would not let the bastards be born. A concerned Jerry tried to contact Cherie, 
Hours later, she texted him herself, informing him that she had to leave for a few days and that she would text him later. The next day, Jerry received a message from Bruce and learned that he had forced his wife to have an abortion. Attached to the letter were photos of a battered Cherie. I remember standing in front of the mirror trying to draw bruises on my stomach, Cherie would later recount. Jerry had reached a tipping point. His children, not one but two twins at once, had been killed by Bruce Miller. He was again devastated and full of anger. He blamed Bruce for the deaths of his three children and the abuse of the woman he loved. After reconnecting with Sherry the next day, November 8th, Jerry said he couldn't go on like this. He would kill her husband. The couple set about devising a plan to kill him. They worked out routes, parking spots, and even the best place and time to get to the dump. Jerry then made the long drive from his home to Michigan. That same evening, as Bruce planned to leave work, he received a call from Cherie and following the plan, asked if he could pick up a pizza on his way home. Distracted by the conversation, Bruce did not notice a man approaching him from behind, pointing his 20-gauge shotgun at him and pulling the trigger. After committing the crime, Jerry went home, and Cherie began the next part of the plan. She called Bruce's brother, Chuck, said she was very worried about her husband's long absence, and asked Chuck to drive to the junkyard and see if everything was okay. When Chuck got there, he found his brother dead on the floor in a pool of blood, he had been shot in the chest with a shotgun at close range, according to eyewitnesses. When Sherry learned of Bruce's death, she began screaming and crying. The crime scene was quickly discovered, but no trace or evidence of the suspect remained. Detectives learned that Bruce carried large amounts of cash, and they initially thought his death may have been the result of a botched robbery. As the dead man's wallet was missing, John Hutchinson, a friend and employee of Bruce's who had recently borrowed $2,000 from him, came under suspicion. Police questioned Hutchinson, searched his home, and confiscated weapons. John adamantly denied involvement. The search was inconclusive, and despite the fact that Hutchinson failed a polygraph test, he was eventually released. A theory of murder due to falsification of vehicle identification numbers was considered. However, none of the options gave any leads, and soon the case was closed. Meanwhile, according to Bruce's sister, Judy Miller, Cherie's behavior did not fit most people's idea of a grieving spouse. Two days after the death of her supposedly beloved husband, she was already dancing in a bar in Ottisville, Michigan, and looked happy. Two weeks later, she had a boyfriend, and it wasn't Jerry Cassidy, but a local delivery boy named Jeff Foster. The goal was accomplished, it was like Sherry had passed it a level in a video game, and the former lover was no longer interesting. Here's an improved version of your text with proper grammar and punctuation. Jerry thought he would be with the woman he loved after the murder. After all, he killed for her, but that did not happen. She began to distance herself. A month after the murder, she moved her new boyfriend, Jeff Foster, into the house she used to share with her husband and completely severed her relationship with Jerry leaving him devastated. It was probably at this point that Cassidy realized he had murdered an innocent man in cold blood, and guilt overtook him. Three months later, on February 11, 2000, Jerry shot himself in his Odessa, Missouri apartment with a 22 caliber rifle. His body was discovered in a chair with an open Bible in his lap, on murder. Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be liable to judgment. He judged himself, pleaded guilty, and committed suicide. In an interview a few days after the body was removed, Cassidy's mother said that family members were cleaning the apartment and found a briefcase under the bed with three suicide notes and an envelope taped to the outside. Jerry wanted revenge on the woman who had broken his heart. The former detective confessed to killing Bruce Miller because he believed Bruce had abused Cherie and caused the deaths of his three children. I went over there, killed him. I was such a fool, but now everyone will know the real reason I became depressed. I couldn't tell anyone the truth. She wanted to get the money and get rid of her husband. She got her way, but she soon realized she couldn't do that to others. I now realize it was all a lie. Jerry attached printed transcripts of instant messages with Cherie, in which, between intimate episodes, she gave him directions on how to find the dump, 
where to park to avoid being seen, and other important information. The Cassidy family's attorneys contacted the Jesse County Sheriff's Department and relayed the information. On February 22, 2000, police waited for Sherry Miller as she was getting off a plane with her boyfriend, Jeff Foster, and they were returning from a trip to Reno. She was charged with second-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Prosecutors believed Cherie was a skilled manipulator who convinced her lover to kill her husband under false pretenses. On December 12, 2000, the state of Michigan's trial against Sherry Miller began, and her case made national headlines due to the unusual nature of an internet-related crimey. The prosecution shared thousands of messages between Cherie and Jerry, demonstrating the woman's lies. She was never abused, and she was never pregnant with Jerry. According to the prosecution's version, Cherie wanted Bruce's death because a divorce would not have provided her with enough money. However, the defense argued that the young woman received only a small amount of money after her spouse's death, despite the fact that she would have lived a much more affluent life during her lifetime. The defense also claimed that Jerry Cassidy fabricated evidence in order to exact revenge as an abandoned lover. Shari denied writing the messages describing the crime, implying that Jerry had forged the messages using his experience as a homicide detective. However, police discovered evidence of the messages on Shari's computer. Shari told the jury that the sexual communication between her and her lover was just part of an online fantasy and that she lied about her pregnancy to help Jerry deal with depression and about the abuse to convince Jerry to leave her alone. On December 22nd, Miller was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison on the murder charge and 54 to 81 years on the conspiracy charge. In 2007, she was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and found to have other mental illnesses while in prison. Cherie began treatment and filed an appeal. She even managed to get married for the fourth time. Michael DeNoia saw the story on the news and couldn't resist the woman's charm. In 2009, a federal judge overturned Sherry Miller's conviction, stating that Jerry's suicide letter should not be used as evidence because Cassidy is no longer alive and the defense cannot cross-examine him. The judge ordered a new trial and set a bail amount. In 2016, Sherry Miller, in a four-page typewritten letter to a district judge, abruptly admitted her role in her husband's death. This came as a surprise because no one expected her to do so voluntarily. In 2012, the court reinterpreted the admissibility of the suicide letter, and Cherie was returned to jail to serve the remainder of her original sentence. Many saw the letter sent to the judge as just another attempt to gain sympathy or profit. Something happened inside me when I had to return to prison after three years of freedom. I had my daughter and granddaughter living with me. I begged my daughter not to join me. She refused to listen as I was led back to the prison. As I walked through the sliding doors, I noticed my daughter crying so hard. I recall hearing her scream, no mommy, don't go. At that point, the full consequences of what I had done to Bruce, his friends, his family, Jerry, his friends and his family hit me full force. They will not see them again. Bruce was an excellent man. Sherry Miller wrote about her husband. He never hurt me or my children. All he did was love us. He wanted to adopt my children. He simply wanted a family. The only man who loved me and I had him killed. In 2022, Sherry gave a public interview to a popular TV station. She admitted that Bruce was not involved in the mob and never abused her. She admitted that she used makeup to fake bruises and faked ultrasound scans to manipulate Jerry. Sheree admitted that she didn't do it for the money. She said that she was afraid Bruce would find out who she really was and felt that it would be easier for him to be killed than to learn the truth about her. Because of this, she declined a plea bargain that would have resulted in 15 years instead of a life sentence. According to Shari, it took a public story to help her reconcile with herself. It's still difficult for me to look in the mirror realizing what I did. I've been waiting to tell the truth and hopefully find peace with it. Sherry Miller is still incarcerated at the Huron Valley Women's Complex in Michigan. She is not eligible for parole. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more.
Subscribe to the channel for more. Subscribe to the channel for more.